Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we turn to day two. Uh, again, four panels, uh, uh, 20 uh, plus speakers, two keynotes. Um, a key issue we're going to open this morning on jurisdictional and liability issues. Uh, we spoke about this yesterday. Uh, a number of really important uh, issues and questions were raised from the floor by the uh, class of 2023. Uh, thereafter, we're going to turn to something that goes to the heart of the mission of the university, which is capacity building. Um, that's at the, the very life of the university. And uh, we're very honored to have uh, a distinguished alumni, uh, Mr. Frederick Hogg, who plays his own leadership role within the IMO. And uh, I'm looking up at the uh, class of 2023, and I'm sure um, later on in life, I will have the pleasure of seeing some of you working for the International Maritime Organization. So I hope you take inspiration from our alumni and our colleagues. Um, we turn to the issues of contemporary issues and future development. And there are so many contemporary issues. I think we set the stage yesterday. Uh, it's a very important one uh, in terms of, it's, it's not about uh, the progress in the past. It's about how uh, individuals who work within the international system, and indeed with those of you who work for states and for industry, how we uh, face those challenges. And uh, the world has come through a very traumatic time. And perhaps some of the unsung heroes of the pandemic are seafarers and those that kept the global trading system functioning. If you go back there to the first week of the, the pandemic, you can see uh, there was a perception that the global supply chain broke, would break down. It didn't. And that's a great testament uh, uh, to our colleagues that are at sea this morning, uh, to those in national administrations, and of course, in, the, uh, in regulatory bodies, uh, first and foremost, the International uh, Maritime Organization. Uh, today, we also have a keynote address from uh, Ambassador Rena Lee, a very important leader in global processes, including at the uh, president of the Intergovernmental Con Conference on the Conservation and Sustainable Use of Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction. And uh, that process is now coming towards a conclusion. Of course, all of us in this room supports that process. I think uh, we bear a special burden in relation to capacity building. And of course, we have a very distinguished panel, which is going to be moderated by Hidi Sagagushji, um, including Mr. Carl Granger and Food uh, Bate, uh, who are negotiators in that process. And of course, we will be listening uh, very carefully. We turn to uh, climate change, and I'm delighted to see uh, Jen Schroeder, my colleague here, Vice President of Academic Affairs and Professor at the World Maritime University. And later in the afternoon, we'll have future developments, and uh, we'll come back to the issue of gender empowerment. And I thought, uh, uh, certainly for those of us um, uh, that attended the, the, the gala dinner last night, is we had uh, two representatives of this university, uh, both the, the president and, of course, uh, PhD candidate a Ambrose Crystal, who are the, the very personification of gender empowerment. And uh, we will highlight uh, this afternoon um, the progress that we're making on gender empowerment issues in the context of a project which is funded by DFO Canada. And uh, lastly, we will have takeaways from the conference. Uh, Dr. Rain Derrick, uh, Professor Clive Schofield have been uh, working on the uh, Stockholm Declaration strand to the program. And uh, my dear friend and colleague, Professor Eikut, uh, is working on the, the uh, maritime strands. Uh, but today and yesterday, uh, we have reporters for each session. And uh, if you can stand up if you're in the room, anybody that was a reporter yesterday or indeed today, uh, we'd like to give you some uh, Rebecca here. And uh, Luciana, uh, we're missing five or six of our reporters, but look, it's early. It's early in the morning. And uh, um, they contribute very importantly uh, to the, the, uh, the record of the conference. And this is obviously a giant academic conference. It will have academic proceedings in, in due course. Uh, 
what we say here is said under the Chatham House rule, uh, which means uh, what is said in Malmo stays in Malmo. And uh, the official record will be uh, published in due course. And uh, before turning over the floor uh, to our moderator for the uh, first session, of course, it behoves me uh, to thank uh, very dearly uh, the key sponsors for this uh, programme and indeed uh, this conference, uh, uh, the Nippon Foundation. And uh, we're very honoured, Dr. Hide Sagaguchi and Professor Kanahara, uh, leaders within uh, not only the uh, Nippon Foundation, but also the Sasakawa Peace Foundation, uh, for the manner not only that you uh, support uh, the university, uh, you not only talk the talk, you walk the walk. And uh, uh, you've been here uh, to the university and you've tra traveled across the world to our various a capacity uh, development initiatives. Uh, certainly in the Institute, we'd like to acknowledge the government of Germany, uh, government of Sweden, uh, city of Malmo, and of course the European uh, Commission, uh, uh, amongst others that support the, the research programs underway. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have a prize uh, for today for speakers. It's, I borrowed this from the Center of International Law in Singapore. It's called the the Nobel Prize. So uh, if you run to the end of your time, you get a bell. And uh, if you finish before your allotted time, you get the, the Nobel Prize. So let's see who wins the, the Nobel Prizes uh, with us today. So we're on a, a very uh, tight schedule and uh, I very much uh, um, look forward to this uh, opening panel. Uh, Dorota, um, would you like to take to the uh, floor, uh, Deputy Director and Head of the Legal Affairs uh, Office uh, at Legal Affairs and External uh, Relations Division at the International Maritime Organization, and perhaps uh, bring your panel, convene your panel on the floor. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Long, and uh, very good morning to everyone uh, here in uh, attending in, in person and uh, uh, also very warm welcome to the uh, online uh, participants. Um, let me start with a big thank to the uh, WMU and Madam President and Professor Long and uh, the ELNAS and the whole uh, WMU team for organizing this fantastic, uh, um, excellent uh, conference. And I also thank my wonderful colleagues from the Marine Environment Division and the LCLP office with whom I have a great pleasure of working on a, a daily uh, basis. Um, you have my biography in, in the booklet, but what is uh, not in there is that, uh, and I have to say it, uh, I was born across uh, the pond on the other side of the uh, Baltic Sea in the beautiful city of Gdańsk, uh, which is a, a, a port city and a shipyard city. And uh, so I was uh, born in the same year as the convention was adopted. So this is something that will not be on the exam, but... <laughs> Uh, so it's a, it's a year of celebrations, uh, and uh, uh, what I also would like uh, to mention is that uh, in 1972 it was still a, a dark communism in that part of Europe, uh, and it was a year, uh, early 70s, when the, uh, the whole movement against the regime and against communism started led by Lech Wałęsa, who uh, later on won the uh, Peace Nobel Prize. Uh, and uh, it all started in the shipyard. So it's also, uh, it is also a, a, an evidence how a big role the shipping industry and the shipyards uh, play in the, in the global history and what was the, uh, the input and the impact of the shipping and the shipping industry on, on the uh, collapse of communism as it all started in in the shipyard in, in Gdańsk and then ended in 1988, 89 uh, and, and with the collapse of the Berlin uh, Wall. So this is a very important part of the history for, for me privately, personally, and I also wanted the, the wider audience to, to, to know about that and uh, to uh, acknowledge that. Uh, 
so as Professor Long said already, today's panel, the first panel is on uh, jurisdiction and liability. And some aspects uh, of the panel were of the uh, some some aspects of this uh, subject were already highlighted yesterday, uh, and today we will be trying to answer questions about uh, who has jurisdiction at sea, which areas uh, at sea are under whose jurisdiction, who is liable, and do we need more regulations on that? Is everything regulated, or are there any gaps that are still uh, to be uh, filled? And uh, I am very pleased uh, and thankful to uh, the speakers and the panelists today who are all in person uh, with us and uh, may I please invite Professor Richard Barnes and Professor uh, uh, Ala Poznakova uh, as well as uh, our commentators of today Dr. Carolina Romero Lares and Dr. Beatrice Martinez uh, Romera to, to the scene. Thank you. It's really wonderful that, that we can be uh, in person and that we can have a very interactive, I hope, discussion uh, today. And I very much encourage also the audience to, uh, to be interactive and to ask questions and, and to be uh, part of this important uh, discussion. So we will start today with the presentation by Professor Richard Barnes uh, on uh, um, jurisdiction and uh, liability. Uh, Richard Barnes is a professor of international law at the University of Lincoln. He is also adjunct professor at the law of the Norwegian Center for Law of the Sea at the University of Tromsø. Uh, widely published in the field of international law and the law of the sea, uh, as well as international environmental law, including uh, climate change. Professor Barnes acted as a consultant for WWF, the government of the United Kingdom, appeared before parliamentary committees related to the law of the sea, the fisheries, and the Brexit, and this is very important and <laughs> interesting part, and, uh, and the, earlier this year, um, we had the pleasure of, of uh, having a professor's input to the uh, inquiry, the, par the British Parliament inquiry into UNCLOS and whether it is still relevant. So that was also very interesting. Um, so thank you, um, Richard, for being with us today and uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. It's a, a pleasure to be here and to participate in this, this wonderful conference. Uh, let me begin by thanking Ronan for inviting me here and to the WMU and the team for, for putting on a fabulous show, and particularly to the Nippon Foundation for their wonderful support, without which these kinds of initiatives can't take place. Um, I have a confession to begin with, like Dorota. I'm also 50, and so this is my birthday. So thank you for the late birthday present, Rowan. I invite me here. So it gives me the opportunity to say, which of us is aging better? Myself or the London Convention? I have to say I'm feeling a bit grey around the gills, and um, I suspect the London Convention and the protocol are ageing a little bit better than me. Um, but we shall see. Um, anyway, I'm not here to talk about how old I am. I'm here to talk about jurisdiction um, and liability. So my, my presentation is in, in three main parts. Firstly, I'll say something about jurisdiction, the basis for action under the convention and protocol. I'll then move to say something about um, current challenges. Now, I've provided a selection of themes or issues which perhaps are shaping the way in which the, the convention and its mechanisms move forward. And then, because I was asked to say something about liability, which seems to be a a controversial topic, I will, I will say something about that as well. Um, and in case I run the risk of not winning the Nobel Prize, I'll preempt my conclusions. And I think broadly speaking, um, uncontroversially, the 
London regime, I think, is, is resilient, it's robust, it's adapted well to change, but it needs to keep doing that. And in particular, I think the interface between the, the London regime and other regimes for the protection of the marine environment need to be strengthened. So that's where I'll end up, hopefully. Okay, so let me bring um, my conversation, my talk round to the topic of, of jurisdiction. I think under international law, the general consensus is that jurisdiction has at least a territorial basis, is associated with the sovereign equality of states, and so most authority to regulate comes from the state itself. And so for activities which are confined to the state, um, these are matters which are largely left to the state, and that might be uncontroversial if it weren't for the inconvenient fact that actually things can't be kept within the state. Nationals move, states conduct transnational activities, and even activities taking place within the state can have extraterritorial effects. And so fundamentally, this means that international law has a role to play in controlling the exercise of jurisdiction. And this, I think, is, is important in terms of how the IMO and its various instruments and other international agreements frame the exercise of jurisdiction. The key point I'd probably stress here is that particularly with regards to dumping, we are concerned with activities which have a potential or an extraterritorial effect. And when dumping takes place, it affects not just proximate states, but it affects the oceans, which are of common concern to all states. And so all states have a concern in ensuring that these activities are properly controlled and regulated. Now, for the most part um, of human history, dumping was out of sight, out of mind, and not regulated until the London Convention was negotiated. A growing realisation on the basis of science that there was a need to control this hazardous activity. And this coincided with a wider awareness in the development of international environmental law, which we can associate with the Stockholm Convention. Um, I won't say much specifically about the, the London Convention at the moment, other than to say that it provides um, a regime for controlling, prohibiting the dumping of waste, and that has progressed in response to growing awareness of the need to try and take preemptive measures. Um, What's perhaps important to note is that the London regime itself predated the Law of the Sea Convention and so was concerned largely with sectoral activities. However, with the negotiation of the Law of the Sea Convention, the London regime became part of a wider umbrella of obligations to protect and preserve the marine environment. And so it's important to stress that at that point in time, we're looking at how it's situated within a broader set of responsibilities to protect and preserve the marine environment. Dumping is not something which can be viewed apart from other obligations to protect the marine environment. So Article 210 of the Law of the Sea Convention requires states parties to adopt laws um, to control dumping that are no less effective uh, at presenting and reducing and controlling pollution from um, dumping. And that's to be done in accordance with global rules and standards. And the London regime is, in effect, the global standards which we have to apply. Now, that's important from, a, I guess, a kind of prescriptive point of view, because it means that all states, not just states, parties to the London instruments, have obligations which are at least equivalent to those under these global rules. Although there may be some complications, I suppose, because, as you're aware, the London Convention and the London Protocol differ slightly. And we have two sets of global rules which aren't identical. So one might ask questions, which one of those prevails as the global rules? And that might be important when, for example, we consider things like um, the, 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 the movement of uh, export of, of, of waste to states which are not parties to the Convention regime. Anyway, the, the key point, I guess, to make here is that the London Convention and the London Protocol establish jurisdiction and a framework for the prescription of rules in terms of the protection of the marine environment from dumping activities. 
we should also think about jurisdiction a little bit more widely. So when we think about jurisdiction under international law, we think about prescription, adjudication and enforcement. And largely that's located within the remit or the gift of states and it's coordinated by international law. But I think there's also something to be said about jurisdiction in a wider sense. Jurisdiction is the ability to speak and to um, speak and define relationships within a given domain. And when we look at the London Convention, we think about it as framing that wider set of, of responsibilities. And so part of what I will say will touch upon the, the ability of the convention regime to speak and to prescribe that framework for activities. We could call this competence, but I, I think it, it very much touches upon jurisdiction because it controls what states can and can't do. So just in terms of the framework, sorry, I should have skipped ahead to this slide sooner here. I think one of the things which is quite clear here is that international law does prescribe the framework for dumping. And within this international law framework, the basis of jurisdiction under the London regime, I think, is relatively straightforward. The prescriptive measures here are set out under Article 7 and Articles 10 of the London Protocol. And in short form, this requires states to take action in respect of vessels flying their flag, it requires states to take action um, for vessels which are loading um, materials which could be dumped within their territory and then to exercise jurisdiction more generally over vessels, aircraft and platforms um, under their jurisdiction which may be engaged in dumping activities. This is, I think, relatively straightforward and the kind of enforcement and compliance mechanisms follow suit from that. The one thing I would note here, though, um, is that jurisdiction, at least under this last provision here, is defined quite open-endedly. So to the extent that jurisdiction changes under general international law, then there is the potential for um, jurisdiction to change under the, the convention and the protocol regimes. So if there are shifts in, for example, maritime jurisdiction, extensions of competence to regulate matters in areas beyond national jurisdiction, then potentially the regime within the London Convention would follow suit in that respect. The other area of jurisdiction, which I think is, is perhaps important um, to just mention briefly here, is that states are increasingly using other jurisdictional devices to try and control activities beyond their jurisdiction. Now, this hasn't happened with regards to dumping yet, but we see this in areas of IU fishing, for example, with the European Union exercising control over access to its markets, a form of jurisdictional control, in order to influence actors in other states to comply with standards which the EU maintains. Now that hasn't been done yet in respect of dumping activities, but with an increasing concern within, for example, the EU, with the non-disposal of waste and the circular economies, one might imagine in the future that there may be opportunities for states to take action against states, companies engaged in dumping activities or states not party to these agreements to bring their standards up to compliance with those which the EU sees fit. So an area for that expanded control, if not through this jurisdictional regime. So moving then on to, I'm looking for the timer. So where is the, ah, 10 minutes? Ah, okay, so thank you. Um, I'll speed up here. So quickly, what I wanted to do is just to point to a number of different areas where I think there are potential challenges to the London regime, which might, if not influence how it exercises jurisdiction, how it influences the way it approaches matters, and then that then trickles down into how states conduct themselves. And I think these are quite important in terms of sort of issues to consider going forward. So the first of these is the right to the healthy environment. Recently, we had the UN um, General Assembly recognize a, a general right of humans to a healthy environment. Now, this doesn't challenge jurisdiction per se, but what it tends to do is to put other opportunities onto the, the table for states to be challenged as to how well they comply with their international obligations. So states will become under increased scrutiny to address these human concerns. And again, this is something which perhaps maybe has to be considered under the convention regime with increased concern for the social and human impacts of dumping activities. The second is cumulative environmental impacts. There's nothing, strictly speaking, within the text of the London Instruments, which requires cumulative assessments to be taken into account. These are factored into the WAG. 
And what's interesting to note, I think, here is that there's increased sensitivity to cumulative impacts and assessments within the kind of practices of the London regime. And this is quite important, I think, because it will start to then bridge the gaps between London and the other types of regime dealing with other activities which are putting pollution into the marine environment. Increased intensity of use in marine spaces. There is limited space for activities to take place. And so again, states are being forced to consider through mechanisms of marine spatial planning, how best to accommodate these competing and conflicting uses. And this shows again that dumping activities, which have traditionally often been a sectoral concern, perhaps have to be better integrated into other processes. And so this again, influences how states may prescribe and take action against um, activities around dumping. Recent concerns about dredge material, as you're aware that the disposal of dredge material is perhaps one of the most significant um, types of material which is, is disposed of at sea. Largely this is very well regulated, but what we're starting to see are incidents where this is being challenged. So recently in the northeast of the United Kingdom, um, there was concern about a mass die off of, of marine species um, as a result of um, what was a, believed to be an algal bloom, but then a subsequent scientific survey conducted by some universities indicated was due to increased levels of peridium, which is kind of contaminants which are embedded in dredge material, but which are then being disseminated at sea. Now, this is important in terms of having clarity as to the scientific basis for decisions, but also thinking again about the connection between dumping and the regulation of fishing activities or the other activities for the, the immunity and use of the environment. So we have to think in a more integrated fashion. Um, so there are some other areas, but I'll, I'll skip forward because I'm probably going to be short on time here. There are a couple of other areas where I think there are significant concerns. Just briefly to say something about carbon capture and sequestration. Now, one thing that's clearly important and which practice has demonstrated is that the, the London regime is quite flexible and it has adapted to new types of challenge. So whilst not originally a concern for disposal at sea, certainly the amendment and the protocols have allowed for new activities to be brought within the scope of the London regime. So it's not fixed, its jurisdictional basis is not static. It can adapt to new challenges if states are willing. The second area, um, which um, I think has been discussed previously, is the relationship between dumping and disposal at sea from land-based sources. And this has recently come into to focus because of the Fukushima accident, a terrible tragedy where almost 20,000 people died as a result of the tsunami, which then destroyed the reactors. In response to the, the physical damage to the reactors, Japan instituted a number of, of contingency measures, which included trying to keep them cool with water. This has then generated concerns about what to do with the contaminated water. A number of actions have been taken place to purify this water, um, and this has largely been successful, but it hasn't been able to remove all the radioactive trace elements. And Japan is now considering what needs to be done with this, this material here. Now, the challenge is that under general international law, um, there is no specific regime dealing with the discharge of um, materials from land-based sources. There are obligations on states to protect and preserve the marine environment, which are important. However, um, the issue has come before the London Convention and Protocol. And the challenge here is whether or not this is an appropriate regime for dealing with this potentially novel type of activity. And this has generated a divergence of views. Um, some states, Japan obviously, take the view that this is not a matter which falls within the jurisdiction or the competence of the convention because it's not discharged from ships, platforms or aircrafts. Now, formally speaking, I, I think that's probably the right position um, and that's supported by other states. However, informally, it does beg the question, in the absence of another fora, given the wider objectives of the London regime to ensure the protection of the marine environment, is it necessarily inappropriate for these matters to be considered by the, the London system? Given there is a kind of close connection between these issues and given there is a need to ensure that there's a dissemination of information, arguably the increased interdependence of agencies requires at least some consideration of these matters. One for questions later on. Um, 
Briefly, monitoring and reporting. Um, I think everybody here is aware that more could be done to improve the rules and the processes for monitoring and reporting. And the reason why I stress this here is because in the absence of good scientific information, in the absence of a deficit of knowledge about what is being dumped and the implications of this, then we're not going to be in a good position to advance rules, prescription of rules, which are better suited to protecting the marine environment. So knowledge comes before action, and if we don't have that, then that action could be misplaced. Now, briefly, liability issues here. Um, I think in, in many respects, this has been a challenging issue. Whilst Article 10 and Article 15 of the London Instruments creates on states an obligation to generate regimes for liability. This is something which has struggled to be progressed under the, the London system here. There are a number of reasons for this, and um, potentially is because we don't have agreement between states as to exactly what the specific measure should be taken, kind of speaks for itself there a little bit. Arguably, we have a lack of potential data, and if we don't have the data, then we don't know the risks involved in establishing a liability regime. Um, but also, um, I, I think there are kind of concerns here about, how shall I describe this, coming back onto the, the last point here, what is the most appropriate regime for advancing uh, liability? Now, a lot of work has been conducted by the Secretariat, taking advice from an ad hoc working group of legal experts to explore what the potential options for legal liability ought to be. Now, the kind of general direction of travel here would seem to be a regime which is favouring liability regimes within state and focusing on civil liability. Now, I think potentially that is a good avenue to explore here because it complements an existing regime under state responsibility. So at the moment, in the absence of a kind of clear cut liability regime under the London Convention, the basic backstop here is the international law on state responsibility. This imposes obligations on states to comply with their primary obligations and in default of that, then they can be held um, accountable for um, internationally wrongful act. Now, the point I'd probably stress here is whilst that's a useful backstop, it's one which is seldom used. Secondly, it's one which is incredi incredibly burdensome. Initiating action under state responsibility is challenging. Thirdly, it's unpredictable. And if states actually want to comply with the um, international obligations, then arguably putting in place through the exercise of due diligence, measures to ensure that activities taking place within their jurisdiction and control do not cause harm to other states' interests, then arguably there is a strong incentive for them to do that because it can preempt their potential state responsibility. So there's quite a strong driver for this. The last point I probably want to make on, on this one here is that it provides a high degree of um, certainty and stability. If states can, and the kind of regime for state liability or civil liability is that states generally are free to negotiate the terms and conditions of that as they see fit. If they can do so, then arguably there's a strong incentive for them to do so because it provides a sound basis for the conduct of industry activities, but it also provides a more certain basis for knowing what the potential risks are. So I, I think there are a number of strong drivers there, but it would be perhaps interesting to see what questions might come out about what the kind of particular models might be, whether we follow the uh, civil liability regime in shipping or something closer to the Nagoya Protocol. Um, there are lots of kind of models out there, um, but we'll see where this comes to. So just to, to kind of bring things to a conclusion, flexible regime, one which is adapting and which is responsive, one which is advancing a kind of prescriptive agenda for states, and so is, is very much a kind of dynamic competence-based regime, but one which has a bit more work to do, particularly around the use of science and evidence. A key challenge is monitoring and reporting, and the lack of kind of data and sharing on that might undermine efforts to advance legal regimes. And then finally, I said that the, the absence of a liability regime is kind of surprising because there seem to be a lot of benefits for this, but perhaps some of the insiders here, I'm looking at Frederick perhaps, can maybe tell us a little bit more about why that is, is lacking. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Professor Barnes. So we've learned about yet another reason why 1972 was so remarkable. And uh, 
thank you for your uh, wonderful presentation and uh, and the conclusions. And we have learned that uh, the LCLP uh, regime established a, a jurisdiction, in particular flag state uh, jurisdiction, and that there are still many questions to be uh, answered, uh, that there is no global regime for disposal of waste from land-based sources, and also <clears throat> that there are still questions about the what liability regime would be the most appropriate for the uh, LCLP. Uh, and uh, I think that those questions have to be answered by, by states, by um, IMO member states, but also by uh, um, not, not only uh, IMO member states, but also outside the organization uh, as well. Um, let me now uh, introduce our uh, next uh, speaker. Uh, professor Ala Pozdlakova is a professor at the Scandinavian Institute of Maritime Law, University of Oslo, uh, Faculty of Law. And uh, her, uh, in, she's very interested uh, in um, international environmental law and uh, also uh, space law. Uh, today, uh, Professor Poznakova uh, will be talking about the ship recycling and the right to the healthy environment. And we already heard a little bit about the right to healthy environment earlier this morning. So uh, I welcome Professor Poznakova. Please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lostominska, for introducing me, Professor Long uh, and organizers for inviting me here, and my fellow panelists for interesting uh, talk so far. Um, it's very lovely to be in Malmo in person. I think it's a wonderful place, uh, and um, I'm looking forward to uh, discussing with you uh, the ship recycling uh, in the context of jurisdictional and liability uh, issues that it arises. Uh, I will not speak about space law at all, but uh, but speaking about you know dynamic nature of international agreements, uh, it's not unlikely that the dumping convention maybe at some at some point in time will be applicable to these activities. Uh, but uh, let's get back to uh, to the ship recycling. Um, uh, I work uh, quite a lot with jurisdiction over living ships at sea and flag state and the liability for pollution and these kind of things. Uh, but uh, some years ago, um, attention of myself, my institute and the society in Norway uh, was turned to uh, ship recycling, uh, what happens to the end of life ships. Of course, it was not uh, at all a, a novel problem, uh, but uh, we got... Uh, uh, we we um, experienced a case when a Norwegian ship owner uh, was trying uh, to send uh, his ship uh, to uh, beaching uh, in Pakistan uh, and uh, by selling it to an intermediary. Uh, and uh, he almost succeeded. The problem was that the ship could not leave uh, the waters uh, of Norway because it got engine stop. Uh, and then uh, our environmental uh, agency was tipped off that something is wrong. And it turned out that it was. There were many wrong things about the ship, uh, including false insurance uh, certificate on board. Uh, and uh, this case uh, was sent to criminal investigation and ended up with the, uh, recently with a sentence of six months uh, for the ship owner. And the cash buyer uh, settled for actually quite a lot of money. So the, the cash buyer was never actually uh, in the tr uh, trial unfortunately for academics that would be really interesting to see but uh, i'm not going i'm going to speak about liability as one of the topics but not really about criminal liability today uh, but i think this case uh, uh, illustrates uh, uh, several important points uh, about ship recycling well firstly norway uh, managed to act as a proactive states uh, state in enforcing uh, rules on uh, transboundary waste shipment uh, against uh, the company that was uh, uh, responsible for uh, dealing with the ship properly. So uh, it applied uh, its obligations under Basel Convention and EU uh, waste shipment law. Uh, secondly, uh, this case uh, showed a point that I will come back to uh, soon, is that it's quite difficult to uh, ensure that uh, uh, 
the, the responsible state uh, exercises uh, its jurisdiction uh, effectively uh, over uh, this end of life ship and it is in a way a problem inherent uh, in the shipping international shipping in general uh, related to uh, flag hopping and the possibility for ship owners to actually get rid of ships they know that will be disposed quite soon so there are different techniques to avoid uh, the regulations that is a problem uh, that is difficult to solve just by just one convention um, uh, thirdly there is also uh, another aspect uh, of this case uh, uh, the public attention actually was drawn to the fact of uh, the human and environmental impact uh, of uh, unsustainable ship recycling and to the fact that most of it goes on uh, far away from Norway uh, in uh, South Asia, uh, beaches there, uh, in the conditions that would never be acceptable in Scandinavian or European countries. So it was a bit of a, like, yeah, what, what are we talking about? That is normal practice uh, to send ships there. Uh, would you actually like to have this just outside your window, for example? The answer would be no. So it was a lot about environmental justice uh, and the fact that uh, European-owned ships, not necessarily European flagged ships, but European-owned ships are actually uh, recycled elsewhere. And I will come back to some of the, these aspects uh, later on. So um, in my presentation, then, I will address this... Uh, I will focus on Hong Kong Convention. I think it's uh, it's not a convention that is in force uh, for a number of reasons, but it is an important contribution by uh, IMO uh, to uh, deal with the unsustainable ship, ship recycling to improve it. Uh, and uh, I think I will do some professor, as a Professor Barnes did, I will just summarize quickly my main points. Um, so I will speak, uh, I, I think that Hong Kong Convention, although it is not in force, uh, it shows, uh, a promise uh, and it is a reasonable solution uh, because it is so comprehensive and if applied and implemented properly it, it is enters into force to begin with and if it is applied uh, in a way that is compatible with environmental obligations it is a, a good instrument uh, in the long run uh, considering the greening of the ship industry uh, we need uh, to have a solution that is from cradle to grave that conventions convention opens for. Of course, there are uh, significant issues when it comes to allocation of responsibilities and uh, other uh, due diligence standards on the convention and these kind of things. Uh, but it is a good solution in the in the long run. Um, my second point about liability uh, could be summarized very quickly as that it is not sufficient uh, international liability uh, law when it comes to ship recycling. Hong Kong Convention does not contain any rules on liability. It was probably not designed to, uh, but uh, uh, so we have to look for uh, liability provisions elsewhere in international law. Uh, and uh, perhaps EU will do something about this, uh, but this is an area that should be improved. And my third point uh, is that uh, the right, the human right to healthy environment uh, could be something important uh, to realize also for the international shipping industry. Now, IMO is not a human rights body, uh, but uh, we cannot ignore uh, the development that is going on in the area of international human rights that will have effect on international shipping and on ship recycling industry, uh, and also national developments on at cons constitutional law developments, human rights uh, at the national level developments that will also have importance in addition to national tort law. Now, um, let me move on <laughs> Not a bit. Let's see. There. Uh, just to remind uh, now, uh, Madam President, yesterday reminded that there are 26 uh, or so principles in Stockholm Declaration. I just want to highlight uh, the, the most important ones to my presentation. And firstly, of course, this is the fundamental right to good environment. Uh, we it's not just about uh, being not being exposed to toxic substances it is also about living a life of dignity uh, as, a, as a as a right as a part of the right to healthy environment and then to ensure that this right works states need to exercise jurisdiction effectively with all the issues that uh, arise that already professor barnes barnes point out and then uh, uh, we also need and the declaration actually calls for it there should be 
liability and compensation mechanisms in place uh, to address uh, environmental harm, damage that was caused by, uh, uh, by pollution. But recently, uh, we have, well, not just recently, but over time, since 1972, the development that has taken place is that uh, this right to healthy environment is less state-centric. Uh, it is more about the communities, international community, local communities, individuals, rights. So it's the right to healthy environment uh, that is being uh, shaped right now. And one of the important, but not only instruments is the United Nations uh, General Assembly resolution on the human rights to healthy environment. So this is, there is a, quite a significant difference between just international right to healthy environment and the human right to healthy environment. And um, um, so that, that we have to uh, take into account. And I think ship recycling is a wonderful uh, industry to use as a case study uh, on how this uh, human rights to healthy environment can be um, uh, implemented. Mm. Unfortunately, not all states uh, back up uh, this resolution, and Norway, for example, is not uh, uh, backing it up. Uh, doesn't think it, that this is a legal right. It's more like a declaration, you know, like something like this. Uh, something that we should, uh, a mission that we have, not a right that we uh, acknowledge. Uh, that is a pity because the, uh, Norway was one of the countries, perhaps the first country it claims, uh, behind the Hong Kong Convention, which actually is about the right to healthy environment. Now, I don't want to point fingers here, so I will just uh, uh, continue. Uh, thank you. And uh, now, um, of course, it's not just all black uh, about ship recycling industry, and there are incentives in place that improve the conditions uh, there. Uh, but uh, I will focus on the problems and not uh, uh, the good sides uh, of that. Now, um, uh, as, uh, as was pointed out earlier, uh, this is an international sector, global sector. So obviously, just national solutions won't do. Uh, we need uh, to have international law. Uh, solutions uh, to these issues, preferably at the global level uh, rather than regional level or EU level. And we do have uh, actually quite uh, uh, many, uh, maybe all too many le international legal provisions that may be applicable to parts uh, of, of the ship recycling se sector. I will just uh, point out two that I think are most important and Basel Convention, of course, on the control of transboundary movement movements of uh, uh, hazardous waste is, uh, uh, is uh, perhaps in, in, in reality the most important uh, instrument in force. Um, although I will not speak that much about the Basel Convention, is that what it what governs uh, ship recycling, or at least in international ship recycling. Uh, and um, it's not a convention that was designed to deal with ships uh, as waste. Uh, but uh, it provides uh, rules uh, which partly work uh, quite well and partly don't work all that well. Um, now, uh, I will, as I mentioned, I will focus more on the IMO's contribution uh, in, in the shape of Hong Kong Convention and the guidelines that, that came um, uh, before that. Uh, but just uh, the, the, the bit about uh, ship recycling issues. Um, one of the arguments for using uh, for using ship uh, beaches uh, and recycling sites in South Asia is, of course, economic incentives. Uh, you can uh, and capacity uh, arguments that allegedly uh, there is not enough capacity uh, in European yards in Turkey uh, with China with a bit better environmental standards. Uh, and another reason is that uh, basically you can sell a ship at a profit uh, because of steel prices. Um, to, to those uh, sites, uh, but if you want to recycle your ship in, in Europe or Turkey or, Ch or China, uh, you may end up with perhaps even paying something for this. So that, that's very simple, uh, simple business. Uh, and it raises a lot of issues because, okay, European ship owners, they can uh, make some money uh, on, on selling those ships, uh, but uh, uh, they're the ones that actually benefit from using the ships in commercial service. 
Um, so they, they're kind of benefiting twice. And the communities living in, in near these recycling yards and work is there, they don't actually benefit uh, from the profit you, ship owners make. Uh, so there, is, uh, there are many problems with uh, how polluter-based principle applies uh, in, in, uh, in, in the ship recycling industry, uh, in addition, of course, to all this environmental injustice and, and right to healthy environment uh, problems. That um, uh, actual Stockholm Declaration is trying to, uh, uh, to um, uh, combat. Now, um, let me just go further a little bit. And uh, now, um, as I mentioned, the Hong Kong Convention is not in force. Uh, many reasons for that. Uh, for now, it's not, uh, uh, it has about 16 states that ratified it, but not enough uh, tonnage and not enough recycling uh, states that have, have joined this convention. So we have to wait a little bit longer. India has joined so that some time ago, so that is, uh, that is good news, uh, but it's, uh, it's not enough yet. Now this uh, uh, from cradle to grave approach uh, means that uh, uh, the ship owners and flag states have also uh, responsibilities to make sure that uh, uh, the ships are uh, environmentally sound not, and do not contain hazardous uh, materials. Uh, and um, uh, the uh, convention allocates responsibilities and jurisdiction among two main states, flag states, and uh, the state of the uh, ship recycling facility. And uh, there we have, of course, this uh, obvious uh, issue, or actually maybe two issues to begin with. The first one is that uh, uh, flag states and uh, ship owners uh, may not be particularly happy about having actually quite uh, uh, general responsibilities under this convention. Uh, they, the due diligence standards are not that strict, it's quite whack. Uh, and also they can uh, evade their uh, or avoid to exercise their, uh, or the flag states can struggle with exercising effective jurisdiction over ships if they are sold elsewhere, re reflect and uh, get out of this uh, uh, flag state's uh, competence. Um, and uh, some of the sh shipping companies, they actually said that they're going to reflect their ships, sell them elsewhere. Uh, they don't want to be uh, under the scope of well, EU rules implementing this, this uh, convention. Uh, another uh, problem is that too much or responsibilities are arguably placed on a uh, state of the ship recycling site uh, because the, uh, they actually have to make sure they have to be authorized. Convention requires to send ship only to authorized ship recycling sites and they have to meet uh, environmental standards uh, and worker safety standards. Uh, that are arguably quite burdensome. And so here we, we have this uh, issue with the uh, with uh, polluter base uh, principle not working as it as it should. Um, one thing that uh, this convention does uh, is uh, to impose the duty to impose effective and uh, dissuasive sanctions in, in form of administrative sanctions or criminal liability. Uh, but um, let me uh, and move a bit further from this. Um, now, um, state liability under international law uh, for environmental pollution is a very complex topic. Uh, and uh, for an individual uh, that is affected uh, by environmental harm, it is a very difficult way to go. It's between the states. So uh, individuals are not... Uh, uh, well protected uh, under international state liability rules. Now, UNCLOS calls for states to, or imposes the duty for states to develop compensation mechanisms under uh, national law to, uh, to provide fair compensation to those that suffer environmental harm. And here you have a lot of questions about what is environmental damage? Uh, what kind of uh, harm is environmental harm? Uh, is work uh, uh, fatalities related to unsafe working conditions, is that environmental harm? Prob probably not, uh, or, or most likely not. Uh, and um, uh, what kind of liability standards does the relevant national system uh, imposes? Is it strict liability? It's probably fault-based liability as a, as a main rule. Uh, so we do need uh, some uh, international harmonization of liability 
uh, provisions in, in the ship recycling uh, that Hong Kong Convention doesn't have, uh, probably based uh, or inspired by the Basel Convention approach. Uh, well, that protocol is also not in force, so it's, it's, uh, you can see that it is quite uh, a complicated issue and um, uh, individuals seeking compensation for, uh, for damages sustained or communities seeking compensation for damages sustained, uh, they may have a hard time uh, fighting for this right. Uh, but there is there is a need for for to get compensation. It's quite obvious, and also some court practice recently has illustrated that. Now, um, see. yeah, uh, this is my last slide. So I will uh, just uh, uh, finalize with the sort of open question uh, about human rights uh, and uh, liability. Now. Um, uh, can human rights uh, mechanisms uh, at the international level uh, or national level provide uh, workers and local communities with uh, compensation for the damage that have, they have sustained? And I think the answer is yes, uh, but this is an area that is uh, in actually quite uh, rapid uh, development and uh, uh, where uh, we are seeing increased number of cases uh, uh, confirming that uh, there is the human right to health environment and the violation of this right may uh, result in uh, reparation for the damage uh, uh, cost. Uh, but of course, you have to have a case if uh, international human rights bodies will uh, review admissibility of the case, they will uh, discuss whether the harm sustained is indeed environmental harm or it's some kind of other harm. Obviously, the right to life uh, could be one also uh, endangered by uh, pollution uh, produced by ship recycling. Uh, and, um, uh, and this is a, an area that is kind of outside IMO competence, but IMO has not been completely ignorant of human rights issues in, in shipping generally. So uh, I think it is important that, uh, uh, that IMO is, is following uh, the developments that are taking place uh, uh, in the national international law uh, on human rights also in 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 this area uh, and uh, I also think that uh, we will see uh, see some uh, sheep recycling uh, cases uh, of, of human rights uh, uh, in the time to come yes I think that uh, that is uh, uh, all I wanted to say, and uh, obviously many issues to discuss and to be developed uh, in the future international law. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Poznakova, for this uh, very interesting presentation. Indeed, the Ship Recycling Convention is one of the three treaties adopted under the auspices of IMO, uh, which is not yet in force. The two others are the HNS Convention and the uh, Cape Town uh, Agreement. Uh, and we are working very hard on uh, encouraging the member states to uh, bring those treaties uh, into force. And uh, we are working uh, on it. So this is, uh, I think that my conclusion out of this presentation would be that there is still a lot of work uh, for the IMO and its member states uh, to be done uh, with regards to the to ship recycling. Uh, and maybe who knows, uh, after the convention enters into force, we will develop a liability regime as well. So uh, this, this is a still work to be done for the next uh, 20 years. We will not be redundant. Uh, we still have uh, work. Uh, so now uh, we have uh, two uh, commentators. Uh, Dr. Carolina Romero-Lares, who is the Associate Professor at the World Maritime University. Welcome, Carolina. And Dr. Beatrice martinez Romera, uh, who is Associate Professor on Environmental and Climate Change Law at the University of uh, Copenhagen. And I, I wonder whether uh, you have any comments or reflections on the um, presentations of, of this morning. Uh, Carolina, maybe you would like to provide your comments. Yes, yes. Thank you. Well, uh, first, I would like to, to thank you, uh, 
uh, Ronald Long for including me in this uh, panel in a topic that I, I like very much. Uh, and, and I would like to, to come back what uh, uh, our presenters uh, said about uh, the most appropriate uh, regime, uh, liability uh, regime regarding uh, uh, these activities. Uh, I think there is a, a clear obligation to develop these rules uh, of liability and compensation. If we look at, uh, and we go back to, to the, the, the presentations yesterday, uh, the principle uh, 22 of the Stockholm Declaration already included a provision that says that the state should cooperate further to develop the international law regarding liability and compensation. And, um, uh, for the victims of pollution and environmental damage caused by these activities. Uh, you see a provision regarding the development of uh, uh, procedures for assessment of liability in the first version of the Convention, in the London Convention. And then you see that the London Protocol, in a way, broader uh, uh, that provision uh, saying that the states should develop a uh, rule procedure regarding uh, liability arising from dumping or incineration at sea. So the, the obligation was broader uh, to, to also incineration activities at sea. And when you see uh, the, the documents of the, the delegations, you see also delegations asking for a liability uh, for the carbon dioxide sequestration activities. Uh, uh, so there is a, a, a clear obligation. You see it in the convention. You also see it in UNCLOS, Article 235, uh, to ensure that resource uh, state have the obligation to ensure that resources is available in accordance with the legal system for the prompt and adequate compensation in, the, in respect of damage caused by pollution. So also an obligation on the UNCLOS regime. When you look at the, at the regional conventions, you also see a duplication of these provisions in several of the regional uh, conventions. Uh, you see it in the Barcelona Convention, and this is where uh, a non guidelines have been developed for the development of uh, liability and compensation rules. It's an instrument, it's a soft law instrument, but we can see there how the, the regional uh, agreements uh, have gone a little bit uh, a step further uh, in the development of uh, a soft law instrument for uh, rules of compensation and liability. I think now, uh, I think my, my second thought here is that it's not an easy task. How you uh, uh, to develop a, a, a compensation regime? Uh, I think it was uh, not easy, but let's say a, a little bit more straightforward in the, uh, after the Torricanium incident to develop the CLC 69 and 72 uh, CLC and phone convention regime, uh, liability, strict liability of the ship owner, uh, a compensation fund, uh, and the contribution of the oil importers. I don't think it was a, a very uh, the similar, we don't see the similar experience developing the HNS instrument. Uh, which was more complicated. It's a more complicated contributory uh, regime and, and a task for the states. Um, uh, so a, a little bit, uh, I would like to, to recall the, uh, some of the advantages that uh, were mentioned yesterday by Mr. Jacobson about these liability regimes. Uh, responsibility, you place re responsibility in someone, you create a, a uh, fund mechanism, uh, so the polluters will pay and not the, the taxpayers. Uh, so it, it brings a little bit of clarity. And of course, uh, there is the question of somehow residual uh, responsibility of the state in the case of uh, 
uh, uh, dumping. So uh, not a, an easy task. Uh, so the question is here whether the development of those rules will discourage states to join uh, the protocol or uh, uh, could attract uh, developing countries to, to join. And, and my first thought is about uh, well, uh, is, uh, the seabed mining uh, activities uh, that, uh, in my opinion, will continue, will develop further. Uh, and, um, well, I, I think that uh, here we have two things to, to think about it. One is uh, the political will uh, to develop this kind of, of systems. Uh, and the other uh, thought that comes to my mind when I see the the VVNG negotiations, I had not had the opportunity to attend any of these negotiations. But when I see the the picture of the delegates, I see a, a lot of young people uh, in these negotiations. So it's a, it is a, a task for the for the new generations uh, to develop this kind of uh, not an easy task and very perhaps challenging uh, compensation regimes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carolina, and I pass the microphone to Patrice. Thanks, Dorota. So, um, first of all, Thanks, Ardiu. So um, thank you so much to the organizers, to the World Maritime uh, University, um, uh, uh, to the donors that have made possible the conference, especially to Professor Ronald Lon for inviting me uh, to be here. And congratulations on a huge and fantastic uh, event once again. So um, and very well done. Thank you so much to the panel, to uh, the presenters, uh, Professor Barnes uh, and Professor Potnakova, and to my colleague commentator, and to Dorota, because she actually convened us in advance to the conference to have a brief discussion uh, on what can we do and what, how we can contribute uh, to the theme of the conference in this panel. And um, from the discussion we had there, and also from uh, what we have heard today, I came up with uh, two main comments, um, maybe to highlight some of the things uh, that have said, and then two questions uh, for the presenters on two specific things. Um, so the comments have to do, first of all, with implementation. So uh, we've heard issues with uh, monitoring, reporting, uh, issues also with uh, ship recycling, but uh, of, of the London, sorry, uh, Richard uh, raised that. Um, uh, so my question is whether furthering commitments under the dumping regime through a liability uh, regime or system within that is where effort should be devoted if there are problems, not only with violations, maybe so much of the convention, but maybe with implementation uh, of the existing provisions. So whether it's not related, maybe, or whether uh, going deeper will uh, avoid going wider in terms of also parties uh, to the convention. So that's maybe a question to, to think where efforts should be uh, put in uh, at this point of time. And, um, and, and it's maybe not even a question, it's a, it's a comment that I don't know, maybe the audience have ideas about that as well. Uh, because of course, uh, if there's not enough participation in the regime, especially in the light of uh, countries that are newly developed uh, or developing countries, uh, and they need to do something with uh, with their waste uh, problems. So what, what happened in that way? Where, where the effectiveness of the regime, uh, the efforts for that would be better placed. Then the second point of reflection for me is the right of a healthy for a healthy environment, which um, both of the presenters have also mentioned. And uh, human rights regime is a neutral regime on the face of it, but uh, we can argue that more and more connections with uh, the environment uh, developments are moving on that way. So that will affect uh, all environmental regimes and, and all environmental problems, and, and this one as well. So it's uh, indeed a point to to take back home uh, for the regulators. Uh, and it would be nice to see that in, in the standard setting phase rather than uh, in court, maybe. And then the two questions that I have for the presenters, the first one is for uh, Ala. And that has to do with something that you briefly mentioned, uh, which is the EU regulation uh, on ship recycling. And I would like to, uh, to get your thoughts on whether you feel this type of um, 
unilateral or autonomous interaction with the international system, this uh, way of, of an extraterritorial standard setting, whether uh, this is a pushing really a standards higher for ship recycling, whether it's pushing the problem somewhere else, or how do you see that? It affects the third uh, countries, no? but uh, how do you see that interplay uh, since it links with the jurisdiction theme and what loopholes do you see there? And then for Richard, and maybe if you could elaborate a little Thank bit more you. on this, uh, in this issue of fora. You said that maybe this is a, a nice fora uh, to develop further certain, certain uh, items that are problematic, like the land-based pollution. How can that be done? Of course, uh, from a pure legal technocratic point of view is difficult, but maybe what do you think that makes, makes this regime good at, as, as you said, incorporating new responsiveness? Um, and because I, I mind that's, that's what you, that's why you said that is, it will be a, a good for to move forward. That was it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you both for interesting comments and questions. Uh, well, uh, I think uh, this is an excellent question about EU. And I mean, it raises so many uh, interesting conceptual issues related to fragmentation of international law and regional and unilateralism in, in uh, environmental law, perhaps also. Uh, but I will try to kind of angle it towards uh, the jurisdiction aspects here and perhaps also say a bit about the uh, responsibility uh, in sense of due diligence standards and uh, because indeed uh, uh, what EU is trying to do, well it says uh, that it's trying to do that through its uh, uh, regulation, uh, ship recycling regulation uh, that implements Hong Kong Convention and that uh, uh, adds uh, standards of uh, own standards and that kind of makes them stricter uh, perhaps more in detail uh, is uh, basically EU is trying to, uh, as I see, trace uh, uh, the the level of obligations for for states when it comes to uh, sheep recycling. What kind of measures are enough to meet the due diligence uh, standards uh, standard in uh, in international law? Uh, it's a bit difficult to say whether it is successful, but I think uh, when it comes to jurisdiction, uh, it's it's quite interesting to see how uh, regulation. Uh, requires uh, recycling facilities to be uh, authorized to be on the European list, right? Uh, uh, in order for European flagged ships to be able to use them uh, lawfully. Uh, and that is the interesting example of, I don't know, uh, you could say long arm jurisdiction as a colloquial of mindset, extraterritorial uh, jurisdiction uh, assumed by EU. Uh, saying that, look, we can actually come and visit your ship recycling facility uh, located uh, far away from EU to see how you're doing, um, uh, whether you are meeting our uh, standards, and then we'll authorize you. And I think in, in practice, it's classification societies that, that do that, uh, not uh, EU bureaucrats. But that is, that is an, uh, quite interesting example of uh, you know, uh, jurisdiction in, in practice. Uh, so, yeah, and uh, um, I think that other measures that are uh, in pipeline or ideas in pipeline to provide financial incentives for shipping sector uh, to create perhaps some funds uh, to help the recycling facilities that you, EU is considering. I think that they are perhaps most useful to, uh, to raise the recycling standards um, uh, there rather than uh, just introducing stricter uh, regulation provisions. Um, but uh, yeah, and um, so we'll see how, how it's uh, going to develop, but um, European ship owners say that they don't really like this regulation at all and that they will just reflect uh, elsewhere and, uh, and move out of the scope of ship recycling regulation. So I guess there are also many voices against, uh, against that development. But but uh, she recycling arts in Turkey and uh, in uh, uh, India and uh, other countries. I think that if they want to come on the list, they have to raise their standards to be so that that is generally a good thing. Yes. Um, but, uh, your turn now. Yeah. Thanks for some excellent observations. I don't have the answers. Let's just be clear about that. So, um, I, just coming back to um, Carolina's point there, I, I think you make some really important um, remarks about 
the, the, the kind of potential regimes there. But one thing I'd kind of pick up on here is is the kind of who pays. I always think liability regimes are kind of odd because they can create the impression that it's the, for example, in shipping, it's you know the, the ship owners, the tank owners, the operators who pay. Well, actually, at the end of the day, that's then kind of recuperated through you know uh, markets and you know somebody pays, but it's not necessarily them at the the end of the day. But it's it's more about a mechanism for the proper organising of of liability and so it provides clear cut and quick and responsive mechanisms for establishing wrongdoing and then providing a mechanism to address that and i think that's the kind of critical point there we we need these kind of mechanisms in place which help us respond to those crises the other point you made which is is completely valid is that the reason we have those regimes is because tankers have got into difficulties and they've caused harm we don't yet have the situation, I think, where dumping at sea has caused that significant degree of harm and generated uh, a political impetus for response. It's unlikely perhaps to happen internationally, but what I think we will see because of congested use and kind of increasing interference between different uses of the sea are conflicts between private users. So we gave the example of the T's um, dredging issue you know, that potentially could lead to litigation and so then the question is how is that going to be responded to for example within a united kingdom context and it will have to develop its approaches there now for the most part that that framework might be unsatisfactory um and so that then kind of drives i think kind of pressure to try and coordinate these things internationally so that there's a kind of consistency of, of approach there um so so yeah i i, I think there is that. Um, anyway, there's more points to discuss, but coming back to, to Beatrice's point, what makes the, the London um, Convention and Protocol a suitable forum? Um, well, I, I guess in some ways it may be the only forum. Um, I mean, there are other regional fora. So, for example, you know, in OSPA, it can advance these things quite nicely. But for the areas of the world where this might be critical, South Asia, East Asia, um, where we don't have these regional seas fora, there maybe aren't the kind of mechanisms. And interestingly, one of the observations made by Vanuatu, I think, was that one of the benefits of Japan coming to the London um, consultative meeting of the parties and, and telling states what it's doing and how it plans to respond is that shares information with states who aren't necessarily part of these other arrangements, but who have an interest in the potential impact. So I, I think it is potentially useful there. Obviously the challenge is that there are only 83 or 50, 87, 53 states parties. So not all states are involved in these. And so there are limitations with it as, as a fora there. And I think the risk is, and I think the way the conventions have been drafted formally, is they do maintain a kind of at least a formal adherence to their material jurisdiction. So when the London Convention was being developed, it was intentionally designed not to interfere with MARPOL. And, and so there's a care has to be taken not to exceed mandates, I think. But that doesn't dis dissuade states from perhaps at least cooperating informally through these these mechanisms great thank you very much thank you to the speakers and to the commentators and for a i think uh the the best conclusion that states should cooperate to find solutions yes so um we spoke today about uh, jurisdiction and uh, liability I think that we are quite clear about the jurisdictional matters and that we know that the LCLP established quite clear uh, jurisdiction in terms of uh, dumping at sea. Uh, and also in this context, I wanted to mention that uh, some of you may follow the discussion on the development of the agreement on biological diversity in the areas beyond national jurisdiction, BBNGA. And you may hear very often that uh, there is no jurisdiction uh, in the areas beyond national jurisdiction, yeah? that there is no jurisdiction on the high seas, this is unregulated. Uh, so um, my question to you is, is it real the case? Is it really the case that there is no jurisdiction on the high seas? And if there is any, uh, who has this jurisdiction? 
Bravo, flag states, of course. Of course, flag states have jurisdiction over their ships on the high seas. And this is an element that I think we should always bear in mind when also talking about the, the who is uh, responsible, who has the, the, the obligation uh, on the high seas. And uh, these are the, the, the flag states, obligations, but also rights as well. Uh, so these are the, the the flag states and in terms of the liability regime i think that this is also a, a, a nice nice conclusion of, of of the panel that uh it is up to you uh you next generation you will be working with your administ uh, maritime administrations you will be the delegates to various un meetings to the imo meetings and it's in your hands to develop uh, new regimes and to uh, move things uh, forward. So now we have uh, time for questions and answers. And yes, I can see the first question. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for a really informative and interesting panel for me. Uh, my name is Rebecca Piskowski, and I'm a PhD student here at WMU studying maritime governance and the IMO. And I'm also a civilian attorney with the United States Coast Guard. And my question is for Professor Pods Podnoka Podnokova. <laughs> and um, I'm very interested in ship recycling. I've published a couple of articles on it, including discussions of the Harrier case that you were referencing at the beginning of your remarks. And I have not considered the application of the Stockholm Declaration to ship recycling and listening to your remarks and comparing them to my knowledge of the really thorny legal problems of ship recycling, both from a labor and environmental standard. My question is, in terms of if we're applying the Stockholm Declaration or the recent United Nations General Assembly statement to similar effect to the ship recycling context, who does that burden, which sovereign does that burden lie to? Is it the recycling state? Because unlike the dumping context, there is a very clear territorial jurisdiction. There's no ambiguity about where these harms are taking place and under which sovereign's jurisdiction geographically they're taking place. And so if we're applying a general statement of a right to a healthy environment and a right to life in the ship recycling context, what makes it different? Is it India, Pakistan, Bangladesh? Is it the country of the beneficial owner? Is it the flag state? Whose responsibility is it? And what really distinguishes, in either case, whether you say it's the territorial jurisdiction or some other, I would say, more really responsible party, what distinguishes the ship recycling context from a manufacturing context where we say there are horrible labor or environmental practices in other industries? And in my mind, that would sort of kick it back to IMO and the Hong Kong Convention because the international law nexus is the flag state and the fact that these are unlike the manufacturing context but i'd yeah i'd yeah. be interested to hear well thank you very much it's a very interesting question and observation and of course you're right uh, uh it's that well territorial jurisdiction and it means a uh, state of ship recycling facility uh, that has uh, effective jurisdiction and possibility to control uh and so basically the main responsibility for uh, sustainable ship recycling and, uh, uh, in, in principle, uh, uh, liability under international law for transboundary pollution and under human rights law and uh, yeah, perhaps also under national tort law, whatever. Uh, the problem that, uh, so that is clear, and in a way it's not unlike manufacturing industry, ship recycling has also been put in the context of uh, circular economy it is one of the aspects that is important there uh, and i acknowledge that uh, and uh, when it comes to uh, uh, a broader picture uh you relevant perhaps not much unlike manufacturing as well but i'll stick to ship recycling uh well we do have uh ship owners shipping companies uh who have ships under uh, a flag uh, of a state uh, ship owners uh, may have nationality elsewhere, 
uh, of course, so there, there could be a state of beneficial owner, uh, but uh, uh, it's the flag state then uh, that would have uh, jurisdiction over uh, over the ship during its service life. And, and you can have a discussion for like weeks, I think, whether waste uh, ships, end of life ships are ships or already not ships or whatever. Uh, but uh, the point here is that uh, we have an issue uh, with uh, placing too much focus on uh, recycling state jurisdiction. Uh, because the, I mean, uh, who pollutes uh, during the ship's life? It's well, who benefits from uh, the ships in service? It's the uh, ship owner and uh, who has the responsibility for the ship. Uh, it's uh, the flag state. Uh, so, of course, there have to be uh, mechanisms in place to uh, allocate some of the burden uh, from the recycling state uh, to this other, uh, well, the, basically the flag state uh, and to ship owners in a way that is, uh, uh, that is just and that also reflects uh, the uh, polluter prey based principle and other principles of international law more properly. And I think that there are many, many gaps there and uh, perhaps not just legal gaps, but also uh, ways to evade uh, for ship owners that I mentioned uh, that is, is quite uh, problematic. Yes, uh, so we need uh, uh, yeah, perhaps uh, non-liability related like financial mechanisms to, uh, to, uh, to make ship owners uh, pay more for, for the uh, you know, for the end of life ships that, uh, but uh, that is, I guess, a, a new topic for PhD. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, I think there is a question uh, from Professor uh, Atsuko Kanahara. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And thank you very much. Very interesting uh, presentations and also comments. My question is very simple and addressed to Professor Barnes. My question is regarding the terminology because liability is the key word for this session. And Professor Barnes used both responsibility and liability, particularly maybe in slide 17, both words appeared. And I think principle 21 of the Stockholm Declaration, which reads responsibility to ensure. It is the very unique usage of the world's responsibility, which means both obligation to ensure, and if states violate this obligation, states should take responsibility. And also liability has its own history in international law, not to mention the work of IRC on this issue. And so I would like to ask you your clarification of your terminology of responsibility and liability. It is very important in general, under general international law, because you mentioned several times general international law, and in particular, under London Convention regime. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I think we've discussed that yesterday, so. <laughs> I wasn't here, so I can't defer to the answer yesterday. So um, thank you, uh, Professor Kanhara, for a, a very um, insightful, important question. Um, terminology is always very important to, to lawyers, I think. I, I think responsibility and liability are challenging because linguistically, in, in some languages, they actually are synonyms for each other. Um, I'd, I'd probably take the view here that the state responsibility is the regime which is set out under the ILC articles on the responsibility of states for internationally wrongful acts, and it's a second order norm. I think it's probably quite important to keep that clear and distinct. So it's a general regime which governs things when states do things wrong. Um, then we've got liability, which is the more problematic term. I would probably take the view that there are kind of two potential ways in which we can understand um, liability. We've got state liability and, and then civil liability regimes. Um, state liability, I, I think, is um, consonant with the work of the ILC, which is dealing with states um, liability for acts which are um, hazardous but not prohibited by international law. And, and that has its kind of roots as a, as a kind of uh, primary rule of international law and its heritage is traced back to the, the state uh, trail smelter case there. So the, the idea is that, that states through their conduct as they cause harm to other states have certain obligations to, to make compensation and to, to rectify that as, as a primary rule. And then with um, 
civil liability regimes, we're dealing largely here with states implementing mechanisms which hold private actors responsible, but is done in a way which, at least in part, is designed to ensure that matters for which states have, I suppose, kind of general responsibility are, are conducted appropriately. So if states allow hazardous activities to take place on the states, then they have to ensure that there are proper regimes for ensuring that those private actors do so consistent with um, more general restrictions on what can or can't be, be done there. So I, I guess terminologically, that's how I would I'd probably approach that. So maybe there's a rejoinder. Thank you very much. Um, I know that uh, Professor Jacobson. Yeah, yeah, but there is also a question here. So, <laughs> and there are also questions in the chat, and questions there. So, and I have only three minutes. <laughs> so, um, yes, yes, absolutely. But uh, I, I will give you microphone. Don't worry. But before that, there is a question in the chat that I hope you will be able to answer. Since there is no clear liability provision uh, in the discussed uh, convention, the London Convention, can member states make their own procedure regarding liability and compensation? So maybe together with your comment and your question, you could also answer the question from the chat. <laughs> uh, thank you. What I was intending to say has partly been replied by the two previous speakers. Uh, one problem is this distinction between liability and responsibility, I think is very important in the English language, but it doesn't work in French and Spanish because there's only one word. But uh, apart from that, I think it's important to distinguish between state liability or responsibility, whatever you want to call it, which is normally, uh, and there are clear precedents now in the International Court of Justice, in the ITLOS, the Tribunal in Hamburg, and in the articles of the International Law Commission. Uh, and I think the advisory opinion in Hamburg is that the states have been very careful in order to avoid liability. They don't even have, that it's not enough that they have structures for supervising activities under their jurisdiction, but it also has to be effectively exercised. Otherwise they are stuck. And normally, if you have a state responsibility, it's unlimited. Maybe not politically, but maybe not financially. Whereas if you go to strict to liability on the private law sense, you are talking about individual companies or individuals that are liable. They may not be li liable with limits, but they must be able to insure. So, and no insurance company insures unlimited. So some practical limit might, will have to be established. Now, of course, this system, the, the polluter pay, has been somewhat obfuscated by mixed systems now with funding systems, where especially in the transport of oil and soon in the HNS, we have a fund set up, financed not by the individual tort visa, but by the industry as such. So we are spreading the risk. The idea is, of course, that the industry, by knowing that they get stuck, should press their members to be more careful. Whether that works or not, I don't know. But then there is, we, we, even a further, there are actually examples where states put up money to uh, top up the compensation, and that's in the nuclear field. Already in 1963, the Brussels Supplementary Convention, states pledged to go in together on top of the civil liability to provide money. Now, that system has never been used, fortunately. There is even a tribunal to settle disputes, that tribunal has never met. You also have a system in Vienna after the Chernobyl incident, where they set up an international supplementary compensation convention, financed in some way which I have never understood, and nobody, I don't think, has ever seen it to function. But at least the, the theory is there that states are willing, in certain areas which are politically vulnerable, to put up money. But I don't think one can expect in today's political climate that states are willing to do that in other areas. But that is, of course, a sort of mixture. It's at least a conceivable system. But political, I doubt it. Thank you very much. Uh, one more question. Yes. 
Well, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the two presenters for their very terse presentations. You put a lot of the lot of issues on the table. Before that, I'd like to make a comment because we also have our students here. Uh, that statement is probably to be qualified. Flag states do not have jurisdiction on the high seas. They have jurisdiction on the objects that are registered in the registries. Because if they had jurisdiction on the high seas, they would be able also to have jurisdiction on the vessels that fly other flags as well. So the jurisdiction that they have is limited to the objects which have been registered under the flag in the, on the high seas. Um, now, um, as regards the uh, extraterritorial effect, the unilateral rule, the regime that uh, EU is trying to, to put in place uh, for, for ship recycling, um, I'm afraid because it, it, it aspires to have extraterritorial effect, it doesn't work. It's wishful thinking. We were three years ago in uh, St. Kitts and Nevis, um, which is one of the countries that uh, has received a lot of uh, criticism about uh, their flag being used as the last flag before they go for, for beaching uh, in, in the Far East. And uh, the, the, the response was, was uh, no surprise to us. They said, sorry, we cannot really know once they, they fly our flag, where they go, which, which is really the purpose. By the time they ask for the certificate of deletion, the, uh, the vessel has been, uh, you know, the, the work has been done. So it doesn't work. And uh, the EU uh, law, once you change flag, it's very easy to, to evade. Uh, my, my question now goes to, to Professor Barnes, very quick one. Uh, I heard very carefully what you said about the various, um, let's say, regimes that we may um, use in order to tackle that problem. Uh, for me, one of the hardest uh, issues is to agree what kind of damage, to what extent that damage uh, will be recovered. And also uh, as regards uh, reparation measures uh, for the environment. In your opinion, uh, as we speak, of course, which is the system that you would be more more favorable? I mean, would you go for a one that is a, maybe a hybrid one, the CLC or, or thank you. 30 seconds. Uh, no. I think, um, quickly, the London Convention regime would be well advised to approach things on a, a kind of guidelines basis. And I think they ought to follow broadly the, the, the structure of the um, ILC's principles. Um, there's nothing controversial about them. They provide a framework. In terms of the model to follow, I, I suspect it might be closer to the kind of mechanism under the, the Nagoya Protocol regime rather than the CLC. Simply, and I think that it's important because oil is largely a private commercial activity conducted by private actors. Dumping at sea is, in a sense, a partnership between states and the actors who wish to dispose of materials at sea. If things go wrong, it's partially the responsibility of both. Um, and, and so that kind of complicates the, the, the regime there, strict liability, uh, it may be challenging there. Um, I also think as, as well that the CLC regime is, is predicated on the idea of limited liability in return for strict liability. And I'm not entirely sure that strict liability would be the favorable regime for dumping because of the kind of uncertainties involved. So I, I think there is a kind of challenge there. So somewhere in the middle and in the short term guidelines. Thank you very much. Thank you to, to the speakers and the commentators. Thank you to the audience uh, for your patience and uh, to the organizers. And um, I think it's time for a coffee break. Thank you. Um, good morning. Welcome back after the uh, break. And uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce the opening uh, keynote uh, address of day two. Uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Rena Lee, uh, a great friend of the World Maritime University, Ambassador for Oceans and Law of the Sea Issues, and Special Envoy uh, of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, Singapore, and uh, President of the Intergovernmental Conference on Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction. Uh, she is Singapore's Ambassador 
uh, for oceans and the law of the sea and special envoy of the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Uh, she practices in a public international law, environmental and climate change law. Uh, she has uh, been elected president of the Intergovernmental Conference on Marine Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction in 2018. And I, I know looking at some of the negotiators, uh, participants and observers that shared the auditorium with us today, uh, she has shown great leadership and skill in that process. And uh, uh, she would be here with us uh, in person this morning and has indeed uh, been here at the university uh, for a previous conference on uh, biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, she has sent her apologies in that context and has prepared uh, a special uh, remote uh, a video in relation to where we're at in the process. Uh, I should also add that she is a member of the Legal and Technical Commission of the International Seabed Authority, and of course has acted in a, a very distinguished capacity uh, for the government of uh, Singapore and her Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, in a number of roles. Uh, it is with great pleasure uh, that I introduce her Excellency Ambassador Irina Lee, and uh, then we will have a, a session, uh, panel six in capacity building and technology transfer, which goes to the the very mission of the university. Uh, so first and foremost, maybe a round of applause uh, for Ambassador Rena Lee. Um, good afternoon, um, good morning, um, good evening to um, everyone um, at the conference. Uh, my name is Rena. Um, I'm from Singapore. First of all, please allow me to thank the organizers of this conference, uh, the International Maritime Organization and the World Maritime uh, University um, for their kind invitation to me to join in this um, conference. I'm really sorry that I cannot be um, there in Malmo with um, all of you. I would have loved to be there. Um, I guess this is the next best alternative and really want to thank the organizers for nonetheless agreeing to give me an opportunity to share with you um, about um, the work we're doing in the PBNJ IGC. I think um, many of you would probably have in some way, shape or fashion, have heard of um, BBNJ, but perhaps not many are um, familiar with um, uh, uh, you know, the background and some of the details. So what I'll do for the benefit of those in the audience who may not be as familiar with this process um, is to share a bit more about what BBNJ is about, where we are in the process, some, um, some details of the issues um, that we are facing um, as well. So what BBNJ, the BBNJ IGC is about, um, the full title is that it is the Intergovernmental Conference to elaborate the text of an international legally binding instrument under UNCLOS on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction. It's a very long title. It's why we just refer to it as BBNJ. Um, when concluded, um, it will form the third implementing agreement um, under UNCLOS. The first two, of course, being the 1994 Part 11 Agreement and the 1995 uh, Fish Stocks Agreement. Um, the contents of the agreement, it's meant to be the elements of the package agreed to in 2011. We're supposed to develop the package together and as a whole. Um, and the four elements are marine genetic resources, including the sharing of benefits, uh, area-based management tools, including marine protected areas, environmental impact assessments, capacity building and transfer of marine technology. Now, of course, these four elements alone cannot complete the agreement. So we do um, have a work stream that oper uh, works on what we term cross-cutting issues. And these cross-cutting issues are what maybe um, add um, uh, the dressing to the agreement. Um, and it covers issues such as scope, um, objective, 
um, general principles and approaches, uh, institutional arrangements, implementation, um, dispute settlement, and final clauses. So I thought I'd share a bit about where we are in the process. As some of you may be aware, we have just completed, well, I say just, but it happened in August. We completed the first part of the fifth session of the IGC in August in New York. Um, and I say first part because we, at the end of the fifth session, we suspended, at the end of the two weeks, we suspended the fifth session and we will reconvene for the second part of the fifth session, um, I hope very soon. Um, and on the last day of the fifth session, I had um, shared with delegates in New York um, that I felt that we were closer to the finish line um, than we had ever been uh, in the process. Um, and this is a process that if we start counting from when the first ad hoc working group meeting started, has taken us about 18 years to get to this point. Um, and I think that there are a few delegations there are a few delegations that would disagree with me. I think many were of the view that we made considerable progress um, in the first session um, and that we are close to the finish line. In the two weeks in August, Um, few delegations, there are few delegations that would disagree with me. I think many were of the view that we made considerable progress um, in the first session um, and that we are close to the finish line. In the two weeks in August um, in New York, um, I think my view is that delegations brought a lot of flexibility, um, came up with many ingenious um, um, solutions to try to resolve the various issues that are facing us in the process in order to be able to finalize the agreement. Um, and looking at, in the course of the two weeks, we issued first a refresh text and then a further refresh text text. And looking at these two texts that were issued in the course of the two weeks, um, there has been a lot of progress made to advance the text. Um, and we, many of the options were there have been cleaned up. Um, we do need a little bit more time to just finish up finish up um, the cleaning up of the, um, of the text um, and to finalize it. But I'm confident that if we proceed um, with that same uh, commitment and spirit that we saw in the fifth session, that we will get to the finish line. So maybe at this point in time, what I'll do is to share a little bit more about where we are in terms of each of the elements um, of the package um, uh, um, so that you have a sense of um, uh, the discussions that are going on uh, in relation to the IGC. First of all, excuse me, first of all, um, on the marine genetic resources, including the sharing of benefits, I think the central question of the sharing of benefits um, remains uh, an open issue. But um, from my own perspective, I think we have made progress in terms of coming closer on some of the core elements of what a package on the sharing of benefits may entail. Certainly, many delegations um, showed a willingness to work further um, um, on the basis of a pathway that I had suggested um, to delegations in order to be able to further develop the package. Um, in terms of activities um, in relation to marine genetic resources of areas beyond national jurisdiction, um, I think there has been broad agreement on working on the basis of a notification um, system. And um, there also seems to be agreement in terms of the inclusion of um, traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples and local communities with respect to marine genetic resources of areas beyond national jurisdiction. 
Um, and uh, we, I think we will continue our work on the access and benefit sharing mechanism, and as well as the issues of transparency and traceability um, of the um, of marine genetic activities in relation to marine genetic resources. Um, for area-based management tools, including marine protected areas, uh, I think the key question um, that has to be answered is the question on decision making. Specifically, what a conference of parties may do in relation to complementary measures where there are other competent, um, and here I'm going to use a short form, we call them RFIBs, relevant frameworks, instruments, um, and bodies. Um, the delegations have um, shown a willingness to explore the possibility of uh, deploying an opt-out mechanism to help overcome um, concerns over how the manner in which decisions around um, the establishment of, uh, of um, area-based management tools and um, uh, management measures will be um, taken. Uh, in terms of environmental impact assessments, um, I think uh, the core issues of um, threshold, what is the applicable threshold, um, and um, who is the relevant or appropriate um, body to make decisions in relation to um, uh, activities that warrant environmental impact assessment uh, still remain. But uh, I think at the fifth session, there were um, uh, certainly delegations were exploring or floating ideas on how they think these issues uh, may be uh, closed. Um, in terms of uh, capacity building and transfer of marine technology, I think across the board, what we've seen is a broad recognition um, of the importance of capacity building and transfer of marine technology in order for this agreement to be successful, um, to be effective, um, to be implemented. There is also um, actually strong support for the establishment of a um, capacity building and transfer of marine technology uh, committee. Um, in terms of uh, institutional arrangements, apart from uh, the uh, implementation and compliance committee, uh, sorry, apart from the capacity building and transfer of marine technology uh, committee, which I mentioned um, earlier, um, there also seems to be um, broad agreement that we will, the agreement will establish a conference of parties, a scientific and technical body, a, a secretariat, a clearinghouse mechanism, as well as a funding mechanism. Um, there, was, there are a, a variety of other bodies uh, under consideration, including, as I mentioned earlier, an access and benefit um, sharing mechanism, um, and these remain under um, consideration. Uh, there will also um, be, I think, um, ultimately an implementation and compliance committee, because there was a, a fairly strong support for this predicated on the understanding that um, any uh, form of committee on uh, implementation and compliance would operate in a facilitative, non-adversarial and non-punitive uh, uh, manner. Um, and I think uh, there are discussions underway in terms of how the committee will operate including how the committee can take into consideration the circumstances of individual parties in viewing or assessing um, uh, implementation and convenience. Uh, there will, of course, be provisions on dispute settlement. Um, uh, there seems to be broad um, agreement uh, in terms of wanting to advocate peaceful settlement of disputes, maybe a provision on um, a provision on the resolution of technical disputes of a technical nature, um, as well as the possibility um, for seeking advisory opinion. Those options are on the table. But I think um, really, uh, I think the um, actual modalities of um, how dispute settlement provisions will operate 
remains an open question. That's certainly something that we need to take a closer look at um, when we resume our fifth uh, session uh, in the near future. Um, that gives you a very sort of broad brush of what the issues in relation to um, the draft agreement on BBNJ is. Um, but I guess there must be some of you in the audience who, who are wondering um, why I am speaking about uh, BBNJ in a conference to celebrate 50 years of the Stockholm Convention and the London, as uh, the Stockholm Declaration and the London Convention. Um, the aim of the, the objective of the BBNG agreement is the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction. There is a realization um, that one of the key ways that we can promote um, and achieve our objective is to um, facilitate, encourage, enhance closer cooperation and coordination with relevant instruments, frameworks, and bodies. And the principles that are enshrined in the Stockholm Conve uh, Declaration, um, uh, which is the subject of your discussions in the conference, as well as the London Convention, have a role to play in conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. And while we're not, um, we're not there yet, uh, the draft BBNJ agreement, I think, gives us a glimpse into the future, one where the mechanisms, the processes that are set out in the, in the draft agreement can, working through the institutions that we will establish under the agreement, set us on a path towards a more coordinated towards more coordinated, more cohesive, coherent, uh, positive action uh, in our oceans in order to fulfill our obligations um, and our um, objectives in terms of conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction. So I think it's really crucial um, for all of us to renew, redouble our efforts um, and work together to bring this agreement across the finish line um, and put our resources towards implementing this agreement to, uh, in order that we can achieve our objective. Uh, once again, let me thank everyone for your attention, um, to thank the organizers for allowing me this opportunity to share with you, and I wish everyone a very um, fruitful um, conference to celebrate the, um, the, the Stockholm Declaration and the London Convention. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. And of course, we have uh, negotiators and observers and indeed uh, uh, who will be well able to answer some questions you may have on where we're at uh, in this very important process. Uh, we turn next to panel six, uh, Capacity Building and Technology Transfer. Uh, Dr. Hide Sagaguchi is going to moderate this uh, particular panel. Uh, he's a close friend of mine. A uh, wonderful colleague, president of the Ocean Policy Research Institute of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation, formerly executive director of Gemtech, uh, a very large uh, um, science organization which has a global impact. Uh, I think of, there is no better person in the world to moderate this session, uh, given what the uh, Nippon Foundation and the Sasakawa Peace Foundation do for capacity building. I think many of us in this uh, room, uh, the auditorium this, morn this morning, have benefited uh, from your support. So, uh, Dr. Sagaguchi, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Well, good morning, uh, everyone. I hope uh, you have al already en enjoyed the, you know, this meeting and also the, the dinner. Uh, last night it was wonderful and it's my great honor to be invited uh, in this uh, such a you know important conference 
and not just you know commemorate uh, the 50th anniversary of the London Convention and the Stockholm um, uh, Declaration, but we are you know uh, aiming to, to make you know to, toward for the for the future you know better you know uh, executing, and that's why uh, I'm here, and uh, I'm very happy to report you know the all the details of this uh, conference and together with uh, dinner last night to the, uh, my uh, colleagues at Nippon Foundation and the Saskia Peace Foundation. But uh, before getting into the main uh, topics, I should uh, explain the relationship between Nippon Foundation and the Saskia Peace Foundation because I joined Saskia Peace Foundation last year and I still have my bit confusion what's the relationship be be between them. Uh, simply speaking, the relationship uh, between Nippon Foundation and Saskia Peace Foundation is a relationship like uh, IMO and uh, WMU. It's, it's, it's simple, but uh, the confusing issue is uh, Sasakawa Global uh, uh, Ocean I Institute is not run by Saskia Peace Foundation, but by Nippon Foundation. It's a, it, it makes a bit you know confusing. I myself a bit confusing, but. Uh, but the, the spirit from Nippon Foundation through Saskia Peace Foundation is to support IMO. That's a, the, the true you know, uh, spirit uh, we have. And the Saskia Peace Foundation I belong to, I am uh, the executive director, is to execute, to support student at WMU. So uh, we, Saskia Peace Foundation, uh, give some uh, uh, scholarship, uh, nearly uh, 30 students uh, per year. But the aim of this uh, scholarship is to include the students uh, from a developing country, mainly. Not, not only developing country, but uh, the mind of uh, IMO is to execute maritime issues all over the world with you know fairness right so uh in that sense if we have some uh, bipolar dipolar mode for the uh rich country and uh, not rich country it's not fair enough so in that sense uh, we saska peace foundation try to accommodate the student who, who is uh, wishing to do with uh, uh, maritime issues but not you know uh uh, enough to come to uh, WMU, so we're going to, you know, support. So if you have any, you know, information about uh, uh, the student or potential student in this uh, kind of a situation, please let us know any any time, you know, uh, uh, and then we we are starting to negotiate, and uh, and uh, we are ha very happy to, you know, start uh, supporting uh, them. So that's the uh, issues, uh, the the spirit among Nippon Foundation and the Saskia Peace Foundation. I think uh, uh, you don't understand what I meant, but uh, because I myself still a bit confusing. <laughs> but any, anyway, uh, but anyway, uh, it is said uh, the any great ideas without good plans will turn out to be a, a pie in the sky. That's that's uh, in English words. And uh, in, in Japanese words, uh, very, you know, uh, sweety, uh, uh, yummy um, food in, the, in, the, in the, the picture frame. It cannot be eaten. So that's, I, I think it's exactly the same. But uh, I think only with good plan cannot enough to, uh, to let us eat the pie. But, uh, Together with the plan, we need people, good people, and also not only good people, but also, you know, investment and time. This is good, you know, uh, we, we, we really, you know, need to execute good plan. So the topic title of this uh, uh, panel is a capacity building and technology transfer but uh, we should think about what kind of a capacity you know we should uh, build so the 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 answer is a capacity to have well planned and also well good people and uh, well investment and enough time to execute that's the capacity we we really need to you know uh, 
uh, uh, established to execute the the plan we we should do. So that uh, that's a main you know uh, topic in this uh, panel. Then uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, three speakers, uh, Suzanne and also uh, Carl and also Ford. Uh, could you please uh, take a take a seat? And also we have uh, two uh, commentators, Kahir and also uh, Basco. Where, where, where? Okay, okay. So could you please uh, take a seat? Why well, ask you to take a seat uh, before starting? Because I would like to demonstrate this panel is the most densely populated, in, including me, so because there is no online uh, speakers, online commentators. Unfortunately, the rapporteur, rapporteur uh, is uh, is online, but uh, you know, all together, uh, six of us are, are going to make this uh, session. Okay. So, uh, at first, uh, I would like to ask uh, Suzanne Ajis. Uh, head of uh, policy uh, permitting uh, environment and climate. Uh, Change uh, Canada. Uh, she's uh, uh, she's going to give a presentation as a standpoint of a uh, uh, civil service. And yesterday, uh, Suzanne and I myself, you know, had a little chat. And uh, what uh, she really wants to uh, what to need is uh, time to execute. You know, all the plan and the capacity building and also uh, technology transfer. It's easy to say, but uh, it always, you know, uh, takes time. So uh, I think uh, she, she's going to, you know, uh, give some uh, uh, presentation, you know, based on the on her material, you know, what what I mentioned. So, uh, Suzanne, could you please uh, take the floor? Before you start, I should give. I intentionally did it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as I mentioned, uh, she is working for the, uh, the, as a civil uh, service for the, uh, the, the Canada, and uh, she had studied uh, marine ecotoxicology and law. This is very uh, unique, you know, double major she made, and uh, she now has uh, nearly. 20 years uh, of experience with disposal at sea permitting and monitoring. And uh, she has added uh, London Protocol and Convention uh, meetings as a Canadian delegate for several years and has uh, served as a member of the London Protocol uh, Compliance Group since 2016. So, Suzanne, could you please start? Thank you. Kide for the, the introduction and, and thank you for the fairly last minute invitation to, to speak at this at this conference. Um, we are of course here celebrating 50 years of the London Convention together and we've heard this morning from some other speakers about what a remarkable, resilient and flexible and adaptive convention it is. I would argue that the development and entry into force of the London Protocol is, is perhaps one of the most adaptive things the Convention has done. So we, we now have this family of treaties that is, because of the Protocol, more modern uh, and uh, intended to ultimately replace the, 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 the original vision of the Convention, uh, move us even further towards marine poll pollution prevention than the, the, the 1972 vision, and I, I think that's a remarkable achievement. This family of treaties has a strategic plan that, uh, in fact, urges all of our contracting parties to transition towards the protocol and to implement the protocol, regardless of which of the two treaties they belong to. And of course, that takes know-how and it takes capacity building. And uh, even those of us, those those of us contracting parties that have been doing this since 1972, uh, we, we still face challenges and and. Um, because of that, there is a capacity building strategy that the, the IMO and contracting parties deliver, and I'm very happy to run you through what that strategy entails today. So we are actually obligated in the convention and protocol 
to promote support for the prevention of pollution caused by dumping to parties who request such report such support and i i think we said yesterday uh in in one of the panels that you know we don't have resources to answer every single question and provide a workshop and and a bespoke uh program of capacity building to every single country but i i from what i've observed i think we do a a, a pretty remarkable job and we <laughs> make quite an effort um i would the the strategy that the contracting parties and our secretariat together have have put together to build capacity involves six aspects starting at the top of this diagram here we have partnerships and technical cooperation we have a barriers barriers to compliance group we have uh, ways of providing access to technical information we have the london protocol compliance group we have a number of guidance documents and we have technical workshops I'm going to speak very quickly to these four. I'm not going to address barriers to compliance, and I'm going to spend most of this talk talking about technical workshops, um, and you'll see why. So in terms of partnerships and cooperation uh, with, with other organizations, I think the ones that stand out for me anyway are the partnerships with regional seas programs that are mostly led by our secretariat. Uh, we heard a little bit yesterday about what these programs do, and there, there's a lot of synergies that we're taking advantage of in terms of building capacity through those programs. In terms of access to technical information and providing this access to both contracting parties and prospective parties, there's two main ways that we do this. The first is the London Protocol and Convention Scientific Groups. Of course, we have several former chairs and our current scientific group chair in the room that we heard from yesterday um, and through through that the, the session and the, the formal agenda but also through the science day uh, the whole goal of that is to disseminate information that that can be used uh, to build capacity and in fact the the agenda is sometimes driven by uh, gaps in, in that countries raise for example um, fiberglass vessels and guidance and thought that has been uh, put towards that was raised at a meeting by a contracting party that said we don't have any information about how to deal with this and we're not sure it should be put in the marine environment and, and you know it was through that at the scientific group forum that the governing bodies and contracting parties then decided to take action so it's a it's a very uh, I, I think it's a very interesting way to find out what capacity is needed and then eventually provide information in response there's also GASAMP, the Joint Group of Experts on the Scientific Aspects of Marine Pollution, and we're going to be hearing more about this uh, later today. This is another, uh, it's another body that provides independent scientific advice to the scientific groups and to the contracting parties. Sometimes the scientific groups ask GASAMP for information. Uh, sometimes we get it unsolicited as its issues emerge, but it's it's certainly one of the major ways that um, we build capacity. <clears throat> then we have, um, among the two treaties, only the London Protocol has a compliance group, which was a, a, a body that was negotiated by the contracting parties to assess and promote compliance with the London Protocol with a view to allowing the full and open exchange of information in a constructive manner. As Hide said, I've served on the compliance group since 2016. We're a group of 15 elected members, three from each UN region. I think our maximum membership has been 11. So uh, in your future careers, something to consider, getting yourselves nominated for the compliance group. Um, we're all chosen based on our legal, scientific, or technical expertise. Um, I did study law, but I'm not a lawyer, not a practicing lawyer, never practiced law. And when I'm at the compliance group, I am surrounded by lawyers, but it's still fun. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, there are many guidance documents to support the London Protocol uh, implementation by, by parties and prospective parties. Uh, many of the speakers yesterday uh, talked about these in, in various forms. Um, I've I've, I've tried over the next three slides to include as many of them as I can if you go looking afterwards to see kind of the, the catalog of, of what's available. It, it's, it's quite extensive. There is, of course, uh, a set of guidance documents 
um, specifically aimed at waste assessment. We all we have one for nearly all of the wastes that are allowed to be disposed of under the London Protocol. Uh, sewage sludge, which we removed off the list, we have no guidance for, and it's already removed from this slide. So <laughs> we don't have that one. Um, and I, I believe the, the waste assessment guidances are available individually for each waste or compiled as a, as a package of all of them, depending on what you're interested in. We've also got a series of what I call how to do it guidelines. Um, there's, there's one kind of in the middle of this slide, what it is and how to implement it, which, which describes the nuts and bolts of implementation at a high level. And a second document from 2018 called the Revised Guidance on the National Implementation of the London Protocol, which, which is actually a more legal, uh, takes a more legal angle that goes article by article through the protocol and, and, and advise, provides guidance about what domestic legal implementation would have to look like or what, what it could look like. And then we heard yesterday about low cost and low technology guidelines, which aim to, to provide tools that are still, they, they're still robust science, still provide solid evidence, but they take into account that resources and capacity access to labs and, and high tech analyses and instrumentation are not always available in every situation and that we still want countries to implement the London Protocol and, and achieve this high level of environmental protection. And these, this series of, we now have four uh, guides are, are aimed to do that. So we have the, the low cost, low tech waste assessment guidance for dredge material, low cost, low tech field monitoring and low cost, low tech compliance monitoring. And finally, a step-by-step -step guidance for, on simple approaches for for creating action lists and action levels. So those are kind of chemical benchmarks for deciding when dredge material is and isn't suitable for disposal at sea. And again, I, this was one I, I believe that uh, our the chair of our scientific groups, uh, Commander Vargas, uh, mentioned yesterday. And this was another one that a, a contracting party brought to the scientific groups and said, we need this, and now here it is, we have it. And I believe um, we heard yesterday that it's now actually being used by a contracting party to, to in their domestic imp implementation, which is, I think, just a fantastic example of, of how our capacity building works. Takes years, as, as Hide was, was saying at the beginning, takes a lot of time, but uh, we do see results every now and then, and I think they're worth celebrating. And lastly, technical workshops, which I'm, I think I have about five minutes left. So perfect. Uh, that's where we'll spend about half my time talking about this. So uh, we have heard, um, usually led by our, by our secretariat, um, we have these technical workshops that are delivered based on the needs identified in a, in a country or region that requests uh, help with various aspects of protocol implementation. It could, can be more on the legal side, can be very introductory, you know, what is the protocol and, and what, what's in it for you. Um, it can get down into the nuts and bolts of how you actually assess various types of wastes. So range of subjects. Um, they Pre-pandemic, they were always delivered in person, but re recently um, uh, virtual options for workshop delivery uh, have also been developed uh, and, and appear, uh, from what I've heard, they've gone well. Um, and in 2018, uh, most recently for me, we had the, a fir the first of its kind hands-on technical implementation workshop. Um, this was held in North Vancouver on the traditional terry of the Slay with Tooth Nation in, in Canada. And here you see a picture of the, the venue and, and we had a, a member of, the, of our First Nation welcome us to the territory. Um, this, the format of this workshop departed from the usual format in that it, it wasn't just a series of lectures imparting information for uh, participants to take home. There was also quite a comprehensive case study. Uh, basically, we were asking the participants to pretend to be permit and monitoring officers for three days. So interspersed with the lectures about you know how you do it in theory, we had these hands-on exercises where, where they were actually assessing wastes and determining if they were low risk or high risk, 
uh, making decisions about whether a permit should be issued, designing a monitoring program, post permit, you know, just the kind of work that I've been doing for 20 years on and learned on the job, how you implement the protocol. We try to have them have our participants do that for three days. Um, our, our objectives were to have our, our participants ask a lot of questions, leave knowing where to get help if they need it, um, and to have fun, uh, which I, I, I hope made it memorable and made some of those lessons sink in. So he, this was uh, the, the classroom setting where our lectures were delivered. The lectures covered in, in quite a lot of detail all eight steps of the London Protocol waste assessment process, starting with characterizing waste, considering alternatives to disposal, applying an, an action list to, to see if the material is or is not suitable, if it's going to be high risk or low risk in terms of pollution, to identify and characterize a suitable disposal site. Um, we have impact hypotheses, which ideally when you give a permit, you, you, you conclude that there will not be any effects on the marine environment. Uh, and then you design a monitoring study. That's the last step. If you back, if you issue a permit to go back and check your hypothesis. So make sure you, you didn't in fact cause harm. And if you did, you're supposed to go back, you know, sometimes these permits come year after year, you're supposed to go back and adapt. Uh, and change your permit conditions. And we had we had all this theory, and then we had them run through this whole process in a case study, uh, where, as I said, they considered alternatives to disposal, decided whether to issue permits, ultimately designed a monitoring study. Um, and it was all through uh, hands-on activities that in particular put those low cost, low tech, guidance techniques into account. So we didn't just share the Canadian way that we do this. We really, we tried to put some of those um, low cost, low tech methods to the test in, in the in the workshop. So just briefly, our case study involved, this, this is a picture of, of a, a harbor to be dredged. Hypothetically, the green area is a navigation channel. So that's the kind of thing that would come back every year because they would dredge it every year. And the, the brown down at the, the bottom right, is a, a hypothetical port expansion. So they're they're dredging, they're gonna expand the port. And so this is new, we've never seen this material before. So that usually means it's higher risk and it's more involved in terms of characterization. So we had our participants look at both of these kinds of dredge, dredging projects. All of the hands-on case study work was done in small groups and each group had its own facilitator that was an experienced disposal at sea officer. <laughs> to lead the discussions. We asked participants for their own uh, coastal mapping uh, data and existing disposal sites and interesting features on their coasts. And we used that to, to uh, manufacture uh, a site selection um, element of the, of the case study. So the goal here was to identify a disposal site that wasn't going to interfere with navigation or coral reefs or beaches or fishing or all the other uses of the sea. Um, that can be challenging. We had uh, the field work that included grab sampling. Uh, here, our participants are deploying and then recovering a grab sampler full of sediment. We also had uh, core sampling, which is an, another way that we look at sediment to see uh, if, it's, if it's suitable or not more core sampling. Uh, we took the, the mud back to the lab and sieved it uh, to do basic demonstration of physical characterization techniques. Uh, this is a group opening uh, a, a kind of toxicity test kit identified in our low-tech guidance that, that can be kept out of a fridge. Uh, you order it through the mail, just leave it on the shelf until you need it. Um, we'd never actually tried this. We'd kind of researched it when we did the guidance. So we actually got it out and, and saw how it worked. Um, here the participants are looking at the little organisms swimming around or killed after they'd been exposed to our sediment. That, that was the, the goal. Uh, as I said, the goal is to have fun. Uh, we certainly did that. Uh, built some great uh, interpersonal relationships that have led to follow-up questions. For example, I think Thailand announced some significant pro progress last week towards 
domestic implementation and getting towards ratification of the protocol and, and Canada and Thailand have been keeping in touch just, just because of the relationships we built at this workshop. So that, that was fantastic. At the start of the week, we asked participants kind of what they were thinking and what they were feeling about implementing the protocol and what the challenges were. And, and I think we heard yesterday, there's a perception that this is hard and it takes, you know, lots of intense science and know-how. By the end of the week, we heard people had greater confidence. They saw that it wasn't that hard and that in particular toxicity testing isn't scary, which, which as a toxicologist, that, that one, you know, went straight to my heart. And yeah, that, that's all I wanted to share with you today. Uh, the contact information for the Secretariat, for those of you in your future careers that are, are going to lead your countries to ratifying and implementing the protocol, when you need help to do it, start with the Secretariat. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Susan. Uh, I think, uh, she showed, you know, a huge portfolio of her, you know, work in last 20 years. And also I realized uh, in this uh, auditorium, we have a quite a wide, large uh, spectrum to realize uh, London Convention and also Stockholm Declaration in reality. So uh, none of the, you know, the, the spike or none of the, the peak or none of the, uh, the light should not be forgotten, but also, you know, we should, you know, include from high tech to low tech and everything. But at the end, what uh, Susan uh, mentioned, the goal is must be fun, right? To attract as many uh, people as uh, possible to, to understand. Because uh, for example, uh, in the human beings history, uh, for example, the, the long time ago, Earthquake uh, is, was not thought to be the fault motion, but some, uh, you know, God angry or, or some monster was moving, you know, underneath the ground. So it, it was 400 years ago, 500 years ago theory, but now we, we got to know. So uh, in that sense, you know, let people understand with any effort is, is a very, you know, important uh, procedure to execute the goal, you know which we are thinking in this auditorium uh, in that sense. Susan, thank you very much. And uh, we are going to move to the next speaker uh, from uh, a legal uh, point of view, uh, Mr. C uh, Carl Granger, uh, legal counselor, uh, Department of Foreign Affairs, Ireland. Uh, Carl uh, is a, a legal counselor uh, at the Department of Foreign Affairs, Ireland. And he advises on a wide range of matters uh, involving public international law, EU law, and uh, Irish law. And he regularly represents Ireland uh, at EU and uh, UN level, in particular in law of the sea forum, uh, for forums. He's a member of the EU team uh, in the uh, ongoing BBNJ negotiations uh, focusing on the area of capacity building and the transfer of uh, marine technology. So, uh, Carl, could you please uh, take uh, this floor? Um, thank you, Hida, for that kind introduction. And um, Thank you very much to the organizers, the World Maritime University and the IMO for hosting us today. It's great to be back in Malmo and um, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to speak at this very timely and topical uh, conference. So I'm going to be speaking today about uh, the current state of play on capacity building uh, and technology transfer. Um, in the ongoing BBNJ negotiations, um, coming at it probably more from a perspective of the uh, of the EU and its member states, as uh, as as he just said, I am a I am a member of the EU negotiation team. The EU and its member states are negotiating in the BBNJ process as a single bloc, uh, for complicated legal reasons that I won't get into. Um, uh, so. Um, uh, just starting off with, um, uh, 
Ah, there we go. A little bit of background, and I, I, I'm conscious that Rina has already kindly uh, explained a lot of this, so I, I'll, only, I'll only touch on it, but I'll, I appreciate that many of you are not overly familiar with, with BBNJ, and some of it uh, is a little bit uh, dense, uh, so we'll try to make it as, as accessible and comprehensible as, as possible. Uh, but um, essentially, this implementing agreement that we are negotiating under UNCLOS, BBNJ, uh, is is aimed at, at addressing what has been recognized as a gap uh, in international ocean governance, uh, somewhere that UNCLOS has fallen short over the years, uh, and it, pert it pertains to the, the protection of the, of the marine environment, the sustainable use of marine biodiversity. Um, and um, there's been work since 2004 when an ad hoc working group was established, uh, and uh, you know, that has led through a preparatory committee, which was established in 2016, uh, uh, and, the, and the first session of an intergovernmental conference to negotiate a treaty, which began its work in 2018. Uh, this is, has been a shamefully slow process, and I think we have to accept that. Uh, the original mandate of the ad hoc working group was to look at these urgent issues, and um, uh, we are hopeful that um, the IGC can resume in, in early next year and, and we can finally uh, conclude a treaty and, and get to work in, in enhancing the protection for, for the marine environment. So uh, Reno already mentioned this, but there's essentially four elements to the BBNJ so-called package. Uh, and this has been the basis for negotiations for, for some time. Uh, concerns area-based management tools, including MPAs, and in particular, the aim here is to create a global mechanism for the creation of marine protected areas in, uh, in the high seas and deep seabed. Scientists tell us we should be protecting 30% of these areas. At present, only approximately 1% are protected. So this is a, a huge... A uh, huge failure in, in, in ocean governance, as I've said, and it's something that we hope we can, it's a gap that we hope we can close with this new instrument. On environmental impact assessments, the, uh, the, the idea is to, is to, is to enhance um, practices and procedures for, the, for conducting EIAs for proposed activities in, in, in areas beyond national jurisdiction. On marine genetic resources, um, the, the the idea is to uh, is is to create um, a, a benefit sharing regime, so that developing countries in particular can can benefit from these resources, which are increasingly utilised in pharmaceutical and uh, cosmetics processes in particular. And the fourth part of the package is capacity building in the transfer of marine technology, and this is seen. As, uh, as a crucial a crucial part of the package. And why is that? I suppose it's because there, it is recognized that there is a clear lack of capacity on the part of many states uh, in order to fully participate in the substantive parts of this new agreement without, uh, uh, without a strong capacity building regime. So, for instance, the capacity to be able to conduct EIAs for proposed activities in ABNJ, the capacity to monitor and ensure respect for MPAs by, uh, by a country's flag vessels, um, and the capacity to sample, research, and utilize MGRs. So those are the kinds of things that uh, a capacity building regime will aim to, uh, to, to address. So uh, I'm going to be giving an overview of the, the current state of play of the, the text as it is in, in, in the most recent uh, draft of the, of the president's text, which, which is dated the 26th of August, 2022. It's freely available on, online. Um, this is obviously not the agreed text. And as we know, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. So it's, it's really just a, an update on the state of play and, and the sort of maybe the direction of travel. Um, so the, the capacity building um, provisions are set out uh, mostly in part five of the draft. They are quite extensive comparatively when you look at other multilateral environmental agreements. 
Uh, there are seven articles in part five. There's also an annex on uh, types of capacity building, which is annex two. Um, and then there are other articles which are highly relevant, such as institutional provisions and those relating to funding. It's also notable that article, draft article one defines marine technology, uh, which is an innovation in uh, treaties of these kind, as far as we're aware. It closely follows the language of the UNESCO IOC guidelines. So article 42 sets out the objectives of, of capacity building the transfer of marine technology. Um, and as I outlined before, the, the general objective is to assist parties and particularly developing states parties uh, in, in implementing the agreement and uh, to develop relevant marine scientific and technological capacity of parties, in particular developing states parties. Article 43 sets out a general um, duty of cooperation in achieving the agreement's objectives through capacity building and technology transfer at all levels and in all forms. And it's, it's, it's envisaged that this would be uh, not only just uh, within the uh, forum of the, of the future BBNJ agreements, but also in the context of other uh, legal frameworks and at a bilateral level and an inclusive regime encompassing um, uh, not just state actors, but, uh, but, but also uh, the civil society and the, the, the private sector. Uh, importantly, there is a, a the, the draft agreement sets out a clear obligation to give full recognition to the special requirements of developing states, and um, this includes in particular uh, uh, small island uh, developing states. The draft agreement in articles 44 and 45 sets out the uh, modalities for, for capacity building and the transfer of technology. Um, these uh, there's 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 a there's a provision to the effect that parties will provide resources within their capabilities. Um, the whole model is based on what would be described as a needs-based approach. So, uh, a regime that is um, responsive to the needs and priorities of of developing states parties, that uh, recognises the special circumstances of developing countries, in particular SIDS, uh, that's gender responsive and that aims to build on and insofar as possible not duplicate existing existing um, programs so a, a focus on added value article 46 sets out um, an indicative non-exhaustive list on types of capacity building and, and tech transfer it refers among other things to the provision of technology and equipment the sharing of information data and knowledge uh, developing human resources and institutional capacity uh, and assistance in the development, implementation and enforcement of national uh, legislative, administrative or policy measures. So essentially assisting uh, developing countries to implement the treaty at the, at the national level. Article 47 and 47 beasts provide for a monitoring and review mechanism. Um, and uh, it creates a dedicated uh, capacity building uh, committee with a monitoring and review role. So here, uh, very much sort of influenced by um, the likes of the, the committee, which uh, Suzanne was talking about under the, under the London Convention and Protocol, uh, the LTC under the International Seabed Authority, um, the Port State Measures Agreement, which has, has a dedicated uh, capacity building working body. Um, and so the idea is that this body would have a role in uh, assessing and reviewing uh, needs and priorities, measuring performance, um, identifying and mobilizing funds under the financial mechanism, and uh, making recommendations and reports uh, to the Conference of Parties, which is the fundamental uh, decision-making body under the, un, under the agreement. Article 51 uh, provides for the establishment of a clearinghouse mechanism, which will consist, it is envisaged, envisaged primarily of an open access platform uh, to be managed by the Secretariat, who may also make use of uh, existing uh, bodies, uh, such as the likes of um, UNESCO IOC, 
um, in, in, performing, in performing this function. And we'd envisage the clearinghouse mechanism as having a, an important role to play in terms of information sharing uh, on, on the substantive parts of the package. So uh, on uh, information around ABMTs, EIAs and MGRs, um, providing information on opportunities for capacity building and technology transfer and, and playing this matchmaking role in terms of, uh, you know, donors and those who are seeking um, uh, capacity building uh, to meet a, a, an identified need. Finally, the issue of funding. Uh, and this is... Um, this is without question the, the biggest outstanding issue on, on the issue of capacity building and technology transfer in these negotiations. And it's something that we're going to have to work hard on in the build up to our resumed IGC-5 uh, and um, in, in order to, to find a, a landing zone on this. Um, so the present Article 52 envisages uh, institutional uh, so the, the, the in institutions under the treaty, that's the secretary, the clearinghouse mechanism, et cetera, being funded by assessed contributions. I think everyone agrees on that, uncontroversial. There will also be a voluntary trust fund for, to, to facilitate the um, uh, participation by um, representatives of developing countries at meetings uh, taking place under the, under the new agreement. Again, uncontroversial. I think everyone agrees with that. Um, it also provides for the establishment of a global environment facility, the GEF Trust Fund. And as many of you will know, the GEF has similar trust funds for a number of other multilateral environmental uh, agreements. So this would allow BBNJ to draw on, on, on some of that funding, in particular, the International Waters Program that the, that the GEF has. Uh, the, the, the outstanding issues mainly pertain to the, uh, the special fund, which is established under Article 52. And the special fund will uh, fund capacity building and technology transfer activities. And um, the question is, how do we, how do we finance that? Um, there are, uh, most developing countries are pushing for a scheme of assessed contributions. Um, Others have initially sought a voluntary model. Um, uh, now there are there, there are models in in other uh, treaties for capacity building funded by um, assessed contributions, in particular the World Heritage Convention and the Montreal Protocol, and um, those are models we perhaps have to look at. Um, and of course, it's all tied up at the same time with monetary benefit sharing for marine genetic resources. And I think uh, if we come to uh, an adequate financial package uh, at the final session of the IGC, once we resume, that will, that will I think, create the pathway to agreement. So um, uh, I know that Fuad is going to speak about this a little bit more. Um, certainly from uh, Ireland's perspective and the perspective of the EU and member states, we're going to be coming to this with, uh, in a spirit of compromise and, uh, and openness, and uh, we hope to uh, have a successful outcome uh, early next year when we resume in these negotiations. Thank you. Well, uh... Thank you very much. And also at the end of uh, his uh, talk, he pointed out the most important and the crucial part, uh, how to manage the fund, you know, to, to realize. And also the, uh, geographically speaking, uh, uh, the gut uh, gave us a bit unfair uh, situation because small island state uh, country has a larger you know uh, area of uh, of the ocean and but instead the less population and then you know the capacity for the for the you know the number of, of people to be involved in, uh, is very small so we really you know uh, need to think globally and globally uh, and also uh, i really you know felt something because uh, we, Saska Peace Foundation is not a donor, but, uh, you know, we have to be the, uh, the, the, the main part, you know, to, to, to give, you know, fund to solve the problem as peaceful as possible. So that's, uh, you know, the, 
I got the homework, you know, uh, thank you very much. And then I need to some answer to you later. <laughs> okay. All right. So we are going to uh, move the third uh, speaker. Uh, he's uh, uh, Wad uh, Beite. Uh, uh, he's uh, uh, the you know, wide variety of uh, organizations and institutions working in development law and uh, its main task is a negotiator, right? And uh, uh, throughout uh, 2019, uh, he led negotiation on behalf of the chair of the Group G77 at the United Nations on the Intergovernmental uh, Conference to elaborate the international uh, legally binding instrument under the United Nations uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea. And this support has continued to do to this until this year. And the chairman of the group of uh, 77 uh, previously, he served as a water governance and infrastructure advisor to the office of the uh, quartet, quartet. Advisor on environmental of the water to the secretariat of the Union of the Mem uh, Mediterranean and also advisor to the Palestinian Minister of uh, Water Working on Multilateral Negotiations and Water Sector Reform. So, uh, what? Uh, please uh, take uh, this floor. Thank you. Thank you. Just pull up something quick here. I left my water, and I think I'm doing it. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for welcoming me here at this important conference um, that has been brought together by the IMO and the WMU. I'm so grateful for this opportunity to speak, especially in this house of capacity building, where capacity building is basically built into your mandate. And so it's fascinating for me to be here to learn from the students. Um, I am not a natural or confident speaker. Um, so before I take the floor every time to speak, I always say a little quiet prayer. And I don't mind calling attention to this because last night we had a lovely dinner and uh, we had a brilliant, brilliant speech by one of the students, uh, Crystal Ambrose. And the very first thing she did was thank the man upstairs. And, and to her, I give credit because that's where we start. Um, and I've heard Madam President Cleo in several of their introductions, interventions, talk about um, this is an opportunity to reframe things and call for actions. And she's also highlighted the issue of gender. So believe me when I say I'm more nervous today than normal because I have actually completely reworked my presentation while I was here to respond to things I've heard and that call to action. So I know the time is ticking, but I'm going to start initially with a little story, a vignette, and hopefully it'll It'll come true at the end. This is actually a story of my mom. Um, very recently, and I come from a, quite a religious family, we're Greek Orthodox Palestinians. Uh, my mom was uh, asked to speak at the nursing school at the University of Alabama, where my uh, niece is actually a nurse, and to speak at the Christian Women's Society and gathering. And true to my mom's form, um, she basically took the, the floor for this Christian women's group for nurses, and the first thing she did was um, say, okay, who here has accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Please raise your hands, and half the audience did, and then she turned to the rest and go, for the, those who haven't raised your hands, bow your head and repeat after me. And that is what we call in the southern United States or a Bible Belt, an altar call. Uh, I mention that because you're going to hear an altar call later today, but it's going to be on the topic of capacity building and uh, financing because the two are inextricably linked. 
So let me begin. Actually, in the presentation, uh, the, the title, I actually asked them to call it the Paris Agreement of the Ocean. Actually, I first heard that from one of the EU delegates when talking about the BB&J instrument, because obviously they wanted to frame it as a highly ambitious instrument. instrument. And I think that's right. And it also therefore ties us to the link with other critical instruments like the UNFCCC, because sometimes we negotiators work in silos and are so busy, we actually don't see what's happening in Convention on Biodiversity, on CITES, on UNFCCC. But this is all interconnected when we talk about global health and ecosystems. So I called it the Paris Agreement of the oceans in my title, because that's the kind of ambition I think we would should have, but I don't think we're there yet at all. So let me begin. Now, there are a lot of slides here that I have put in, which I'm gonna just spin past because of the time, it's already at 10 minutes. Um, and the first one is this title. You've heard it remark before. Well, this is a cumbersome title for an agreement. So, we're going to revisit this before the end of my presentation. Now, these early slides here, um, I'm basically putting up so that the students could go back to if they want when it's made available. But this map is important because it just gives you an idea of how much spatial area, areas beyond national jurisdiction in the high sea is. Once again, let's think about the whole global ecosystem and how relevant that space is to all the other big issues that they like climate change. So we need to get this right. Now, I won't go into these de definitions, but I think you should go back and look at them. And everywhere I've seen these definitions coming from conventional biodiversity or dualis or whatever, I'm highlighting the ecosystems because that's what we need to be thinking about, global health and our future. and. Now I start to talk about this policy and legal framework and this process with both Carl and Madam President have spoken to already. And let me say this at the outset, um, Madam President is one of the nicest people on earth, but you're gonna hear me disagree with her a lot today. Carl is a great guy, but you're gonna hear me disagree with him a little today. Um, and that's okay. I also should say, this is very important. I am here speaking my personal capacity. It is not possible for one person to speak on behalf of the G77 and China, which is 134 countries. So when I frame things, it is my personal opinion, um, sometimes with a Palestinian perspective, or sometimes with a generic developing country perspective, but never from the G77 and China as a whole. I don't want to get too much in trouble. So we've talked about the 2011 package deal, which BB&J is, um, the package deal is underlines everything happening in BB&J. And what's interesting is, is capacity building transfer of marine technology is not only one of the four core pillars, but you have to understand it is in fact an enabler of every other core element, whether it's MGR, EIA, ABMT. So when I say we need to get capacity building and transfer marine technology right, I'm not kidding, because the rest of it won't work if we don't. I don't think developing countries, by the way, should sign up to a legal obligation and commitment on this agreement unless we get capacity building right. And that's also means getting the funding right. So now, this will be there for you guys. This is run through the sessions. Where I wanna really start this presentation is here. And that is CBTMT is inseparable from BBNJ success. I've just said it, it is an enabler across all the other core issues. And there's been some good early work done by uh, a consortium of actors and institutions in the capacity building space. Uh, I'm gonna mention specifically the Global Oceans Forum, and they did several policy briefs uh, in lead up to IGC-1 and IGC-2. But at IGC-5, interestingly enough, CBTMT was the least discussed issue. Um, and this comes from a recent study from Maripol Data. And it, they wrote, 
in their recent report, no significant disagreement was observed in the CBTMT part, and thus very little time was devoted to discussing CBTMT. I couldn't disagree with that statement more, um, but I'll come to that later. Um, one thing that's really important is, is we really don't have a good understanding of the ocean relevant CBTMT landscape uh, at this point in time. We've been so focused on CBTMT implementation in the EEZ that this sometimes gets lumped together and no one's actually done a stock taking and an inventory of that. So when we're talking about what we need in future, we have no idea. So how much money do we need if we don't even know what the activities forthcoming are? I have to say that in negotiations, Switzerland and us basically disagree on every point, but the lead negotiator from Switzerland and I have agreed on this one point, and we've said it repeatedly from the four in multiple sessions, we need an inventory of what activities will need to be funded for CBTMT across all topics in the high seas. We don't have it yet. And so we're basically flying a little bit blind, as I can say. Um, and I also, this is critical. Experts like Dr. Marjo Vieros and others say really important is early CBTM funding. And I'm going to come to that more later. So these are those briefs that came from uh, uh, Sorsham, the Global Oceans Forum. Um, and actually, during the Palestinians' uh, chairmanship of the G77, we had our own site event on CBTMT, and we participated in a Friends of bb and Capacity Building with the Global Oceans Forum and others. Uh, that's where I actually first met Frederick, I believe, and we were on that same panel. Um, so here is call to action number one. Um, basically, I've asked the Global Oceans Forum to draft a terms of reference for a comprehensive inventory of the BB&J relevant to CBTMT, where possible disaggregating from CBTN in the EEZ, and ask them to deliver that before BB&J IGC5, second part, BIS, some are calling it. So the first call to action is that's going to be delivered but we're going to need to mobilize the funds to fund that inventory to know where we're going. Some people want to put that off until this instrument comes into force and the first COP happens and the first committees are formed. We're talking three, four years away at the earliest. We can't wait. And this is where I love the recent uh, article by Greta Thunderberg uh, that came out this weekend in The Guardian. It says, our politicians do not need to wait for anyone else in order to start taking action, nor do they need conferences, treaties, international agreements, or outside pressure. They could start right away. And that's what I'm saying. We need to start on this inventory right away, and we need to mobilize the funding for this inventory so we know where we're going. Part two, CBTMT is inseparable from funding. So... Um, I go back to that Mara poll data uh, report where they said CBT is largely dependent on the outcome discussions on MGR section as regards to how much funding will be available for capacity building efforts. Carl alluded to that. That's somewhat true, but we're talking about a lot of other funds out there, GEF, other sources of resources we're going to need to look to because actually we, if we look at some recent reports, there was one that came out by the Blue Nature Alliance with Pew Trust and others, and they just looked at the MPA space needed for 30% of the high seas. They talk about needing $7 billion to establish for the established costs of those MPAs and slightly over $1 billion per year in annual operating costs. That's a tremendous amount of money. And basically, when we look at the Duallis report that they did in advance of IGC-5, uh, it was requested by delegates, and we talk about what funding has been available for the Sustainable Development Goal 14. Well, it's approximately $25 billion spent annually, but they identified a funding gap of $149 billion per year uh, to achieve SDG 14. So when I say we're flying a little bit blind, we're also flying blind on CBT in the areas of beyond national jurisdiction, high seas, of what the costs are, but we know the deficit is there. The money's not there. So this 
is the crucial issue, which Carl alluded to. Um, and we've heard from foundations, we've heard from international institutions, we've heard from NGOs, but what's amazing in this process is we have not heard a single word from the private sector. Their interests are well guarded and safeguarded in these negotiations, and no one needs to look further than Article 12 on intellectual property rights, but there's nothing coming from them. And that's a strange to me because we need to engage them as partners in this process problem if we're going to solve it. So engaging private sector to fund CBTMT, is public funding sufficient? Well, I've already shown you the funding is not sufficient for SDG 14 needs. And definitely um, BB&J will be the weaker of that because those money funds will be first mobilized to EEZs to be sure. So I love this recent article just came out last month from colleagues at CBD who talked about we need to business uh, to engage with business. Business is increasingly willing, if not obliged, to invest in sustain sustaining social environmental systems, impact investment, governance, and ensure shareholders face lower risk for biodiversity use. That same thing could be said of the BB&J space. And there are people out there working on comparisons. Oh my God, I'm so far behind. So uh, uh, some actors have talked about uh, looking to UNCCD and uh, uh, climate change to look at examples where we can engage more in funders. Um, I say, why are we not regulating the private sectors in BB&J space? If we're worried about biodiversity for the space, why is this off the table? Why can't these actors be charged? An example is once it comes into territorial waters, an example, the UK Crown Estate responsible for revenues from the UK seabed generate 115 million pounds in 2020, 2021, just for cables and pipelines coming in. And every country has that. This is just one subsector. But when it comes to areas beyond national jurisdiction, oh, Private sector, you're using it for free? I mean, let's ask them to help contribute to the marine protected areas that we want. Um, I think I better keep moving forward because I've already run out of time. So call to action two, and I'll speed up here, is giving the emerging estimates of the implementing aspects of a BBNG and the identified gap in funding. Um, well, let's do something Sec businesses are happy with. Let's call them and offer an auction off this terrible title for our instrument. I think Saudi Aramco might be willing to give us a billion dollars for early capacity building money. I think maybe Reliance Industry from India, uh, biggest company in India, might be willing to give us a billion dollars to name it. These guys name football stadiums. They name uh, fund football conferences. They fund tennis matches. They'll put their name on anything for the right price. Uh, I say, uh, Secretary General Gutierrez, we need a basically a, a UN foundation type deal with business for BB&J because we need that early money. That's call to action too. Mobilizing resources critical to BB&J implementation. Well, there's some examples of funds. And here I say, you know, we need to go beyond the reference to the GF in the draft BNBNJ agreement. There are environmental conventions out there that have multiple operating mechanisms. UNFC, C has the GEF and the Green Climate Fund with multiple special funds. So call to action three, developing countries need to articulate a clearer vision of funding structures. We need early implementation assistance as found in some other instruments. And we need to very much think through what fund options we want. Do we want it? specific funds for each of the core elements? Do we want funds maybe for least developing states? We need to articulate that vision, create more op options that will therefore generate more resource mobilization. Um, and we need to put BB&J on the agendas of these groups like least developing countries, landlocked developing states, because they need to come together in the group and demand these things, because these are going to be the most disenfranchised countries when it comes to what little funds are available. Now, if we look back to BB&J, I'm way over time. Yep. I lose the Nobel Award. But once you have the mic, 
they're going to have to pry it from my cold, dead hands. So BB&J needs to look to UNF C to stimulate financial innovation and resource mobilization. Um, there's a big debate in Article 52 on financial mechanisms. Should we have a working group of diplomats show up? Should we have a committee of finance of dedicated experts? Carl actually put this function under the Capacity Building and Transfer Marine Technology Committee. We've argued that it shouldn't be there. It's a different skill set, capacity building and remote resource mobilization completely. And we look to what the UNFCCC did, where they created a standing committee on finance of dedicated experts recognizing the gap and saying, we need these experts working around the clock every year on a work plan to show us where these funds are going to come from. And nowhere is that more true than BB&J because the BB&J constituency is a lot quieter than you think. So this language is up there. And I thought, What's interesting is the arguments, oh, you know, this can wait till once this instrument is enabled. All right, but two minutes and I'm done. Um, right. Call to action four, there's an opportunity here. Developed and developing countries at state parties to UNF C at the next COP should propose to expand the mandate of the SCF to include BB and J. That would get experts working on this issue right away, not four years from now. They did it in 2018 when they expanded that mandate to forests, and we should do it to BB and J so we can start working on it right away. And then call to action five. This is it. The Mother's Fund is what I call it. I pledge right here and now to donate $2,500 for BB&J capacity building to the WMU Sasakawa Global Ocean Institute. Um, and I'm doing it, actually, it's actually gonna be 2,700 because I'm gonna put 200 for my mother and then 100 in the names of each of these people. And so this is my prayer call, uh, altar call. I invite these uh, children, famous children of 25 mothers, to match this CBTM funding earmark for implementing BB&J. Once again, the message is we need early funding to get countries to sign up to this and join it. I'll, there's more to say, but I ran out of time. What? What? Thank you very much for stopping your talk. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we had uh, such a very strong, you know, messages uh, from what, and uh, there is no need to add any comment from from me. But to think about, uh, is it you know worth paying for? global health so we, we 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 need you know to more and more you know deeply so so that's a discussion i think i i'm you know expecting from now uh by the commentators uh we have two commentators uh here in this panel uh, uh the one is uh, kahil uh Hassani, uh, he's a, a PhD uh, student, but he already, you know, finished and just uh, enjoying his time, you know, to... <laughs> so, uh, Congratulations. Uh, actually, uh, uh, he's uh, uh, the PhD candidate now. It's a candidate. What, what does it mean anymore? But uh, uh, he was <laughs> supported by uh, a Swedish agency for marine and water management and uh, uh, German uh, Federal Ministry of uh, uh, Transport and uh, Digital uh, Infrastructure and hosted at the World Maritime University here, Saska Global Ocean Institute. I, I say congratulations for finishing your, your PhD. And uh, he's uh, uh, nine years, he has a nine years experience as a research officer in marine policy and uh, governance at the Institute of Marine Affairs in uh, Trinidad, Tobacco. And he holds a bachelor's in uh, environmental science from university at uh, East Anglia and on a master uh, in environmental and development from the University of uh, Reading, uh, United Kingdom. 
Okay, uh, so uh, Khalil, could you please uh, give your, your comment? Yeah, it's, it's up to you. You, you, are you. If you're comfortable, you, you can sit there or not just like flow. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Dr. Sagaguchi and uh, Fusi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd just like to start by thanking the organizers for uh, WMU, IMO, the sponsors for inviting me to participate um, in, this, in this conference. Um, I also want to thank the presenters, Susan, Carla, and, and Fuad for very illuminating and, and particularly in the case of Fuad, a very passionate presentation. Um, I am I am a negotiator on the BBNG agreement uh, for the Caribbean community on environmental impact assessment. Um, I think, but I'm not sure. I'm, I'm I think I'm one of the young people that Professor Romero was referring to earlier, but uh, negotiating the agreement. Uh, but I, I I negotiate on environmental impact assessment, but I. I I think I can offer a few remarks on capacity building and, and tech transfer. Um, now, we all know that UNCLOS has provisions relating to capacity building, um, but the provisions are still poorly implemented overall. I think we can all agree on this. And, and as Carl alluded to, uh, the BBNJ is really a, a critical opportunity to improve CBTMT um, for conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. And it's, and it's an opportunity that we really have to seize upon. Um, and as stated by FUA, uh, CBTMT is very uh, important across all the elements of the, of the BBNJ package. Um, CBTMT provisions are really a, 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 a recognition and, and acknowledgement that in order for less developed state parties to fulfill their, their obligations and exercise their rights under the, the um, UNCLOS and indeed in the future BBNJ agreement, um, sustained efforts on CBTMT are, are required. Uh, I think it's, it's also very, it's often understated that, that CBTMT is very, also very key in, in efforts to attain equity in oceans uh, management. Uh, equity, both intergenerational and intragenerational, um, is really a cornerstone of, of sustainable development and, and indeed the blue economy concept. And as it relates to BBNJ, for example, um, equity in accessing MGRs from ABMJ from areas beyond national jurisdiction, distributional equity in terms of sharing the benefits arising from utilization of MGRs, uh, recognitional and procedural e equity uh, in terms of giving agency to stakeholders to participate in and influence decision making um, as it relates to management of areas beyond national jurisdiction can all be realized through strong capacity building and tech transfer. Um, I am speaking from a developing country's perspective, but in particular, a, a small island developing state perspective. Um, and as mentioned by Carl, um, CBTMT is, is particularly relevant for developing countries, um, but particularly small island developing countries because of the internet connections with the oceans. Um, and it's related to, to SIDS being custodians of the oceans, um, the special circumstances and unique vulnerability of SIDS and the disproportionate, disproportionate impacts that, that uh, negative impacts on, on the oceans have on SIDS. And of course the central, the centrality of oceans to the cultural identity of SIDS. Um, that being said, SIDS have diverse and persisting capacity gaps um, at the regional, sub-regional, uh, institutional levels, country levels, uh, in a number of different aspects. And uh, at the UN 
Ocean Conference in 20, it, this earlier this year, in June 2022, um, the Alliance of Small Island Development States really launched a, a declaration for enhancement of marine scientific knowledge, research capacity, and transfer of marine technology for SIDS. And I would really urge all uh, BBNG negotiators, all partners and potential future partners in, in capacity building efforts to really have a look at this declaration and, and, and commit to this declaration. Um, I won't go into, I've run out of time, so I won't go into what this declaration entails. But in closing, I, I just want to say that I think we have made progress in IGC-5 um, as it relates to capacity building. But as Fuad rightly highlighted, there is still a lot of work to do. Um, the proposed institutional arrangements, such as the, the capacity building committee, um, are, are very important improvements that the BBNG agreement will make. Um, especially in regards to incentivizing and monitoring capacity building outcomes. Um, I agree with Fua that a standing committee on finance should be separate from, from the, the capacity building committee. Um, and of course, I also agree that funding, getting funding in early is essential and creating a special fund for capacity building um, resource from assessed contributions would also be very essential. And uh, who well, prevent presented some some unique and interesting ideas uh, that I think we should give consideration to. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, one more, you know, very important uh, comment from uh, from uh, Professor Basker Becker uh, Weinberg. Uh, you want to talk on your seat? Yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> the, we are going behind. My CV is available in the booklet. You can, um, if you're losing sleep, just read it. Um, thank you all. Um, in cartoons, there's usually a trap door or a cane that pulls the speaker. And But I have to say, Ronan, you have to cast your bell keeper because every time she rings the bell, she apologizes. That's not... <laughs> That doesn't induce compliance. Um, so thank you very much, Noblesse uh, Oblige. Thank you, Ron and my dear friend, for inviting me and, of course, to Madam President and to WMU and to all the sponsors for putting uh, for being making this happen. And it's really lovely to be in person with so many friends and colleagues and so many students. And congratulations to you all for your hard work. Um, this capacity building and transforming of marine technology is embedded in ocean governance. We find it, and it's always good to go back to the title of the, our conference on in the declaration of the UN Conference on Human Environment in Article Nine, in our in Principle Nine, in the London Convention in Article Nine, in the London Protocol in Article Thirteen, Part Fourteen of UNCLOS, and many other international, uh, regional, and global instruments. Uh, in the recent BBNJ process, well, recent, uh, I've been involved in it. I don't know how many. It, it has passed over a decade. That's, I've been involved with it. Not like Richard. It almost feels like I'm turning fifty in the BBNJ process, but for most of us, at least. And um, but we see it, and Carl very well uh, explained, as well as did Ambassador Rina Lee. And we do see that there's, there is a clear connection, not only in BBNJ, but in all international uh, norms relating to the ocean, a intimate connection between benefit sharing and capacity building and transfer in marine technology. For example, CBD and the Nagoya Protocol do that as well. But there are disparities and we cannot uh, ignore them. And Khalid uh, also mentioned them um, when it comes to having access to technology. And this hinders the decision-making process in many countries and hinders policy development and glo at global level. So we find ourselves really at the crossroads when it comes to the BBNJ process. Um, 
I do thank all the three speakers for their uh, interventions. I do apologize for Susan. I do not have the expertise to comment <laughs> on your uh, very important and technical aspects, but lawyers do not need experts because we are general uh, experts in every science. So we can, <laughs> so we can move forward. It's all very interesting what you said, but uh, uh, we can, we, we live in a separate reality. Um, the, um, my comments are really for uh, uh, Carl and Fuad. The, I, I would start with Carl. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you yourself see arriving in New York for the resuming the fifth uh, uh, IGC with open access. Will that come with open pockets as well? In the sense that, um, as Fuad also mentioned, it is very difficult at this point to determine exactly how much funding we need. These amounts uh, surpass many uh, developed, develop, developed countries' uh, GDP, it's important to say. So it's, it's, it's also important to understand what is the benchmark, what are we talking about, how will that assessment be made? Because this comes to my general remark, and I will, I will end here. The BBNJ process, uh, and I'm talking to an audience where there are many legal scholars, but for those that are not so familiar, it is a normative process. We are creating international norms, but it's quite unique, the process in itself, because the input of civil society is staggering. And you can see here in Fuad's presentation, Fuad asks, where is the private sector? Norm creation is a state monopoly. It is not a non-state actor uh, uh, realm. Well, it, used, it didn't used to be. BBNJ process is proving that we are perhaps in a changing world when it comes to creating international norms, the contribution of non-state actors to codification of new norms. So we find ourselves very much in this difficulty because the input of civil society and private sector is relevant, but how can we actually incorporate uh, them into a norm creation? And my last comment, because I only have one minute, is this is why I believe it's the future proofing of the agreement. Some of the text will be difficult to interpret and to apply by states or by international tribunals or any other or institution at international level. So future proofing the agreement is also creating norms that are legally sound and coherent, not only aspirational, but can actually be implemented to protect those same interests we are all concerned about. And that will be my uh, comment, but I will not make you forget that I did ask a question, Carl, on financing and Fuad as well, if you would like to pitch in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very comprehensive and also constructive uh, comment by Khalil and uh, Basco. Uh, just now, uh, Enas gave me a bit early uh, Christmas present, uh, and she gave me three minutes extension. <laughs> and uh, then uh, I'll ask her uh, to give you back uh, your, your comment either to uh, Flaud and also Basco and Karir. Thank you, Hide, and I'll try to be brief. Um, uh, yes, thank you, uh, Vasco, for that provocative question. Um, uh, look, the, the 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 needs of of countries um, are, you know, potentially very very open ended, very difficult to put an exact figure on it. Um, and uh, Fuad very helpfully went through some of the sort of indicative numbers and uh, attempts that have been made to put on a, put a figure on these things. I think firstly, it's important to remember what we are going to be funding here for, under this special fund. It's capacity building and technology transfer activities to meet the objectives of the agreements. So this is not an open-ended um, it's quite a broad scope um, regime, but it's not open-ended. This is not an SDG 14 um, funding mechanism, even though it will very much assist in the, in the achievement of, of SG, SDG 14 objectives. Um, it is not a part 14 of UNCLOS. Um, capacity building funds, even though there is significant overlap. So firstly, let's just remember the scope of what we're doing. Um, because some of those figures that were quoted were obviously much, uh, pertain to much broader um, objectives. 
Um, so yes, we have to, and as some kind of itinerary uh, or some kind of um, study would certainly be useful, but I am also mindful that we are quite a late stage here. And what we are doing here is, is putting together the legal framework. So uh, do we have to set down exact figures in, in, in the primary legal instruments or do we develop a future-proof legal instrument which will uh, allow for flexibility over time and can be responsive and adaptive? So uh, yes, we agree with all of those things. We need to try and ascertain the precise needs. Uh, but there's also... A, it's not only a question of what the needs are, but what is available realistically and what uh, developed countries are willing to put on the table. And um, I don't think Ireland or the EU will be the lowest common denominator in that regard, to speak very frankly. So, you know, um, there needs to, there need to be candid discussions in advance of, of, of the resumed IGC-5 around expectations on and and the reality of what's possibly available on on the other side uh because otherwise um if the gap is too large i fear we won't um we won't reach an agreement to, in new york i don't know if Fuad wants to add anything to that sure no 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 no, no, no. You, you 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 spoke enough and and uh, please please continue you know that discussion at the lunch time one, one minute one minute. Ask Elnaz. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. What you see here is an example of actually what's happening in BB and J, where process actually ends up dictating what the substance ends up being. Sorry to say that. And I think developing countries would like to flip that uh, scenario, to be honest with you. But what I would say, and I think is critical to be heard beyond these doors is that the capacity building transferring tra technology articles put in unclose basically did not fulfill the aspirations developing countries and the whole world should have had. And that's why it's come back in here. This is a once in a generational opportunity to go back and address that. And we've made some steps through some institutional development, but we haven't gone far enough. And what we're seeing is they're protecting their pocketbook, limiting their financial exposure. And I'm not trying to pick their pocket because in the G77 family, you've got countries like Saudi Arabia and Qatar, et cetera. And we've got to look beyond that developed, developing framework. We've got to go talk to private sector. We've got to create new partnerships and modalities. Developing countries, if it is left an unfunded mandate, do not sign up to this legal obligation. Don't do it. Make sure that we get good rules, not just rules, because we can't afford to miss this opportunity to address those capacity building, transfer marine technology needs in the scope he said in the BBNJ. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, to to wrap up this uh, 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 panel, uh, the the most uh, rational uh, person, uh, Susan, uh, is, is making a conclusion. Oh dear, I'm really not sure I have anything with very much gravitas to say that justifies you know the delay in our proceedings. But I will confirm, lawyers definitely live in another reality. I'm glad I studied enough to at least translate between their reality and mine. Um, I, I'm just going to say, um, you know, my my very tangible experience with capacity building is that it 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 when it works, it's amazing. And so I encourage all of you who are perhaps getting gray hair and those of you who are just starting to keep at it because it's important. And I, I, I'm sure you'll get there. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Actually, you know, since we have behaved very well, Elnas uh, gave us extra two two minutes to uh, draw attention from the audience. Any anyone have a quick question or a quick comment uh, from from the floor? I can go into the lunch period if you want. <laughs> Who? Anyone? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. No, no, from from the floor, from the floor. Sorry, Bosco. Okay, yeah, please go ahead. 
Okay, basing to your experience, first my name is Danny, Danny Richunga from Tanzania, East Africa. So basing to your experience, I uh, would like to know the implication of political decision to the environmental impact assessment, especially during the implementation of the national strategic project. So who would you like to answer? I just put it to the panel. Okay. Okay. So any other quick comment, quick question? Otherwise, uh, Bosco will make a final comment. I'm not going to answer this question because I don't know which national plan he's referring to. <laughs> okay. But I, I just I just want to highlight for the for the reference because this is a one key aspect that both of them think differently and it's important, which is should capacity building be a state led uh, 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 motion or is it one for experts? Something to think about. But uh, and I'm not picking Susan <laughs> directly, but I'm just highlight that this there was this contradiction. But anyway. Uh, I, I'll try to answer your question quickly. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, I think some negotiators have been trying to make the EIA part under the, the agreement um, have decisions really based on science, um, have criteria with respect to how decisions are made and when decisions can be made, um, trying to remove as much as possible the political aspect. Um, of the decision-making process. And uh, we're still working on, on how best to do this under the agreement. Um, but we are, I can say some countries, are, some delegations are, are working at it. Um, we can discuss further at the break if you want. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I thank you all for your patience. Uh, although my bad management of uh, uh, moderator, but uh, we had a very, you know, exciting uh, panel uh, just before lunch and uh, give you an extra uh, appetite to have a good lunch. So please keep continue discussion uh, at the lunchtime because this is a spirit of, uh, you know, in-person meeting. In that sense, I thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Long and also uh, all the IMU pe uh, people to have this uh, panel. Thank you. I will uh, introduce uh, the moderator for the next panel, which is uh, panel seven on contemporary issues, climate change. And Professor Schroeder Hinrich, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elnas, for um, this wonderful start. Um, I have to remind myself that next time I'm giving a class, you have to come and do this uh, so that the students already are in a good mood when we start with the discussions. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a special privilege of chairing this afternoon sessions, which is uh, dedicated to contemporary issues, climate change. And um, as far as the uh, London Convention is concerned, I believe that in more recent time, we had um, a couple of discussions to which extent issues related to climate change can actually be integrated. And there are a couple of keywords that uh, are also, I guess, included in the uh, documentation that we all received prior to the start of this conference. And this is carbon capture and sequestration in the subseabed, as well as uh, marine geoengineering and ocean fertilization. And I'm very glad that in this session this afternoon, we have uh, an opportunity of having good discussions from a uh, technical as well as from a legal perspective to address uh, these issues. And um, I'm very glad that in order to uh, have these discussions, we were able to invite uh, Dr. Chris Vivian, Dr. Sarah Seck, Professor Dr. Christina Vogt, as well as Mr. Sebastian Unger. Uh, the challenge, I guess, in this session is that, unfortunately, three of the four panelists um, are only available online. But um, I'm, I'm sure that uh, with all the technical experience and finesse that we have in this building, uh, we should be able also to have a very lively discussion 
with all these panelists. So without further delay, I would like to introduce the first speaker this afternoon, which is Mr. Chris Vivian. He's the co-chair of the GESAM Working Group 41 on Ocean Interventions for Climate Change Mitigation, formerly the Working Group on Marine Geoengineering. Um, he retired from CEFAS, the Center for Environment, Fisheries and Aquaculture, in uh, October 2016, where he had worked for 30 years uh, in an advisory capaci capacity uh, to the UK government on national and international issues relating to environmental impact on various activities in the marine environment. He was also a UK delegate in international meetings under the Oslo, now the OSPA, and London conventions dealing with waste disposal at sea in the Northeast Atlantic and the whole, the whole world respectively. He was the chairman of the scientific groups of the London Convention and the London Protocol from 2008 to 2011 and was the chairman of the OSPA Convention's Biodiversity Committee that dealt with species habitat protection issues as well as the impacts of human activities from 2006 to 2010. At the London Convention protocol meetings, Chris was heavily involved in the discussions on ocean fertilization and the marine geoengineering from 2007 and chaired the working group that finalized the amendments to the London Protocol on Marine Geoengineering in 2013. He received a BSc in Geology and Oceanography in 1971 and a PhD in Marine Geochemistry in 1975, both from the University College of Swansea in Wales. Chris. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction and uh, thank you to IMO and WMO for inviting me to this uh, give this presentation. So I hope uh, we will build on a little bit of what we've heard already on these subjects um, from a couple of other speakers. So straight away adapting to address ocean climate crisis. What's the London Protocol been up to? Okay, so this is uh, what I'm going to cover. A very brief bit about the protocol, its relationship to the convention. You've heard some of this already, so I won't dwell on it. CO2 sequestration in seabed, subseabed geological structures, you've heard a little bit about. Um, I'll probably focus mainly on the mean geoengineering, or it's now, uh, in terms of the GAZAMP working group, we call it Ocean Interventions for Climate Change Mitigation. And those two terms still have to be used because the marine geoengineering is a term under the protocol. Um, so we'll get back to that. And then a little bit about GAZAMP's working group and how that relates to the London Convention and Protocol. It's an important uh, connection between those two bodies. And then finally, a little bit of what the London Protocol did only last week on this subject. So it's hot off the press. Okay. So the London Protocol and so on. Um, this the London Protocol came along after the uh, Rio uh, Convention, the Rio meeting in '92, um, uh, to update the convention, as you've heard already, um, and it was agreed finally in '96, and it'll eventually replace the convention, as you've heard already. Uh, under the protocol, the important difference is that under the protocol, all dumping is prohibited unless it's on the reverse list, and as you've heard, one subject has just dropped off the reverse list literally last week, so we are still evolving very much. Um, the key thing under the uh, London Protocol is the last bullet there, uh, the, how we have this overall overarching uh, objective and that allows us to adapt the convention to not just, just deal with dumping of waste or other matter in, uh, as it, in the past. And the other thing you do need to remember, people have mentioned dumping of waste. The terminology is actually a dumping of waste or other matter. That means everything. It's not just waste important factor you need to bear in mind. Uh, and so under that uh, Article 2 of the protocol, that's how we've been able to address, first of all, the CO2 sequestration, I'll come on to in a moment, and then the marine geoengineering. So first of all, why CO2 sequestration? Well, it may be obvious, but obviously we've got high levels of CO2 in the atmosphere from the combustion of fossil fuels, which contributes to climate change and ocean acidification. And the use of CO2 sequestration is just one option amongst many of ways to tackle that challenge. And the aim is to sequester it in subseabed uh, geological formations permanently. 
not just short term. This is not like a hundred year target like you have under the UNFCCC. This is permanently. So we're talking of millennia to millions of years. So what does the LC do? This started in 2004. The footnote tells you this started two years before the actual protocol came into force. In actual fact, of course, in 2004, we didn't know the protocol was going to come into force in 2006. It happened rather quicker than we expected because we had a number of ratifications that came through quite quickly. So we were rather surprised that it came through in 2006. So this was really forward looking, trying to put in place think, measures uh, for CO2 sequestration before the things were even in force. Um, they, anyway, to get this process done, we had an interstitial correspondence group on CO2 sequestration to look at the legal issues, the scientific issues, scientific group considered the scientific issues, the risks and benefits essentially to carrying out sequestration. And those, that process went on, I'm not going into great detail of those because it went on for several years through many meetings, but the scientific groups made an assessment of the risk and benefits, decided there wasn't any really overarching reason why we shouldn't go ahead with this. The legal groups came up eventually with uh, some proposals or some uh, thoughts about it. And in the end, proposals were made, in fact, by the UK, Australia and Korea, I think, if I remember rightly, or maybe I can't remember, and three countries anyway, put forward the amendment, which was passed in 2006, which was literally about six months after the, the uh, protocol came into force. So it was a very rapid process there from that perspective. Um, so, and we then uh, adopted uh, some guidelines I haven't mentioned here, but Suzanne showed earlier, the CO2 sequestration guidelines on the screen, which we adopted after the amendments had been agreed. Uh, but then the one important thing, the last bullet here, the LP parties adopted amendments to Article 6 to allow the export of waste to other countries to dumping. Because at the moment, without that, Article 6 will prevent any movement. And particularly from the European countries perspective, you have the North Sea and many countries around it. Some people may have capacity to store CO2 in their geological formations, some may not. And so enabling the export was an important factor to, uh, for many countries. So that's something that uh, was agreed in October 2009. However, at the time of the 2019 meeting, we only had six parties that ratified the amendment. It's nine now. But uh, Netherlands and uh, Norway put forward a proposal to provisionally apply the amendment to LP Article 6 under Article 25 of the Vienna Convention of Treaties, which is the first time we come across this in the London Convention and Protocol. Uh, but it was agreed eventually. Um, it uh, requires the parties, obviously, to, to agree, the, the put in place the relevant um, mechanisms between the parties, and you've got to, the parties, both ends of the process have got to be signed up to it, obviously. You can't just have one party doing it and a non-party the other side. It's got to be parties to the protocol and the amendment agreed in order for it to work. And that's something that, uh, how whether it's actually happened in practice at the moment, I don't know. I'm not sure whether there's any export happening as yet. It may be, but it's probably in progress, I suspect. Anyway, that's where we are with carbon capture and storage. So, ocean interventions for climate change mitigation. Um, why use the marine environment? It's a question what some people might say, but the huge scale of the marine environment, as we've seen on the maps earlier, 71% or so of the global surface, the, the ocean is a, an important component of the, of the carbon cycle on the globe. It's uh, absolutely key. And about 25% of the CO2 is taken up by the ocean, the stuff that we put out into the atmosphere every year. And just a point there, the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development has identified unlock ocean-based solutions to climate change as one of its key challenges. So that's why then ocean fertilization. This all kicked off in 2007 when Planktos, as some of you may remember, were going to go and dump some stuff around the Galapagos Islands. They chose a really good place, didn't they? Um, that raised a lot of hackles, as you can imagine. Uh, they then moved on to try and do it around the Canaries, but the Spanish government uh, didn't like that either, and so they eventually went away. But it raised a lot of level of concern, and in the scientific group, we produced a, a statement of concern, and that uh, went forward to the governing bodies meeting that year, and they endorsed that and agreed that they were a competent body to address this issue. 
we all moved through a set of processes. So in 2008, the governing bodies agreed um, a non-binding resolution. And then 2010, they agreed an ocean fertilization assessment framework. So risk assessment framework, essentially. So then the key, the big issue, 2013, uh, a number of countries put forward an amendment to the protocol to uh, deal with marine geoengineering as defined. The definition is interesting. If you know anything about uh, some of the legal reasons behind it, we've pinched some of the words uh, from other conventions uh, there, particularly the um, widespread, long lasting and severe. Any of the lawyers around will probably know where that comes from. It's the uh, convention, uh, oh, name escapes me, but the one that's deal with, um, it came, came after the Vietnam War and, and putting, uh, I can't remember, anyway, it's, uh, that's the definition of geoengineering. And the point you need to know particularly is that footnote. This does not just cover climate related mitigation issues. It can cover other things potentially. Hasn't as yet, but it could. And it, uh, you, it covers activities are listed in new annex and it requires issuance of permits and permit conditions to be applied. And you can only have a permit if you go through the assessment framework, which for ocean fertilization had already been adopted. But there is also a generic one in the amendments if you don't have a framework suitable for a particular type of activity. And ocean fertilization at the moment is the only one on the annex, as I've said. And currently, you can only do it for research purposes only. And if you go, still need to go through that assessment process in order to be able to get your permit. So, Design Working Group 41, that I co chair with uh, Philip Boyd from the University of Tasmania, we carried out a uh, high level assessment and we published that report you see there, which I think Suzanne also showed earlier. Uh, we reviewed a wide range of these activities. It was published in 2019. It was the first study to really comprehensive look across the whole set of ocean uh, activities uh, for climate mitigation. But since then, we've now moved on to the second phase of work where we've rather radically changed our working group. Um, we originally were a group of entirely natural scientists. We've now got about 55% natural scientists, 45% social scientists and humanities. And I'm pleased to say we have a 50-50 gender balance on our group currently as well, which I'm sure the president will be <laughs> pleased with. We don't have quite such a good balance in terms of North-South. We've got about, I think, uh, yeah, about 55% from North, North uh, sort of um, Europe and North America and about 45% from the rest of the world. But we're trying and trying to get there in any way, a bit better balance. But Genenda, at least, we've get, got there, which is good. Anyway, the second phase of work, we're particularly looking to understand the environmental and societal impacts of different ocean interventions. We're developing a framework to integrate all of these different aspects. So we've got people on our group now from about six or seven different uh, social sciences, humanities issues. I won't go into them all, but if anyone's interested, I'll, I could spell them out if you need to. And the key thing for this particular presentation is the last point there. We are to provide advice to the London Protocol parties to assist them in identifying those inter ocean intervention techniques for climate change mitigation or other purposes consistent with the London Protocol's definition, that it might be prudent to consider putting in the new annex of the protocol. And that's a major area of work that we have addressed over several years, last couple of years. And we, first time in the April 20, 2021, we um, provided some advice to the protocol parties at their scientific group meeting. We updated that this year, and that covered a number of techniques um, that we reviewed in our original 2019 report, but there was more newer information in there as well. And we suggested that the techniques that are listed below there were the ones that should be uh, considered for listing in the new annex, potentially. So there's seven of them there, as you see. Um, some of them you, you may be familiar with, some of them may be a little bit novel, perhaps. Uh, but they're the initial set that we thought based on the activity out there in the real world. There's a lot of companies, universities, research institutes carrying out projects in these areas. And so 
those ones are the ones that seem to be most active and most likely to actually want to get out there and do field trials, for example, or even go beyond field trials. So therefore, it's more of a concern from a regulatory point of view compared to some other ones where there doesn't seem really to be any activity of any significance going on. So the London Protocol Parties looked at our GAZAMPS advice in April 20, 2022 and they decided to focus on those seven techniques. And they had a correspondence group that looked at these and you see some little symbols down the left, right hand side there, which are just examples of the sort of cartoons of the techniques. And the uh, correspondence group was gonna provide some recommendations uh, to the protocol parties. Then only this year, we had an online meeting of the correspondence group, which I was involved in. And they decided to focus on four of those techniques which they thought were the most relevant and interesting and uh, concerning potentially to uh, the environment for environmental issues. Correspondent considered those techniques, which they thought were optimum candidates to present a suitable test case for identifying gaps in the frameworks of the LCLP guidance, assessment and advice documents. Uh, some of them are carbon dioxide removal techniques. Some of them are um, albedo techniques, either to reflect light. So there's two of each, in fact, on that list. And they submitted a report to the governing bodies meeting, which was held just last week, as some of you will have heard already. And at the meeting last week, they approved a statement on geoengineering, which I haven't reproduced here because it's too long and detailed, but you've got the link on it. You better find uh, the statement that was put out by IMO last week. And they agreed a number of actions. Um, they're establishing a legal intercessional group to consider that those four techniques prioritized by the correspondence group and related issues. And they're re-establishing the scientific groups, intersessional correspondence group to continue its work on reviewing other techniques and also looking at the assessment frameworks that uh, we have uh, under the existing uh, regimes there. And also another, a new piece of work at the bottom there to raise awareness and the broad community of the LCLP's work on the marine geoengineering amendments and the tools that we've developed to look at it. And that's the assessment frameworks and the uh, Gazam's uh, advice as well. And I think that is all I've got to say. And hopefully I'm well ahead of time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for keeping time. I'm sure that uh, this is appreciated as it will later on allow for more discussions and questions. With that, um, I'm hoping to introduce, well, I'm, I will introduce our second speaker, but I'm hoping that the second speaker is also online, which is um, Associate Professor Sarah Sek from uh, the Schoolage Law School at Dalhousie University. She is Yogis and Kelly Chair there. Uh, in human rights uh, law at the, as I said, Schoolage Law School um, and Marine and Environmental Law Institute, Dalhousie University, a long-standing cooperation partner of the World Maritime University. Her research and teaching explore human rights-based approaches to local, transnational, and global environmental challenges, including business and human rights, plastic pollution, and the ocean climate nexus. Recently, uh, she has co-edited books um, together with Meinhard uh, Duell in 2021, the research handbook on climate change, loss and damage, and um, with uh, Sumudu Atapatu and Carmen Gonzalez also in 2021, the Cambridge handbook on environmental justice and sustainable development. In 2019, she received a Legal Specialist Award in Peace, Justice and Governance from the Center for International Sustainable Development Law. And also in 2021, she joined the editorial team of the Ocean Yearbook. With that, I would like to hand over virtually to Dr. Sarah Sek. Thank you very much for the introduction. I will now share my screen, which I hope has been successfully done. And
And with that, I will proceed with the presentation. Um, okay. So thank you again very much for the introduction and to the organizers and for the invitation to share this work on legal systems and loss and damage at the Ocean Climate Nexus. I'm honored to be speaking to you today from Halifax, Nova Scotia in Canada on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. The research that I'll be sharing with you today draws on a collaboration with my late colleague, Meinhard Duell, who's well known at WMU and around the world for his contributions in many areas, including climate law. Specifically, our research handbook on climate change law and loss and damage, which was published in November 2021, seeks to clarify the need for legal systems, both within and beyond the climate regime, to evolve so as to fairly and equitably address climate loss and damage claims. And in my presentation today, I will first briefly introduce the aims of this book project, then provide an overview of key findings drawn from the work of select contributors. These include reflections on the need for careful framing of loss and damage. I will then briefly consider how this topic fits within the conference theme before concluding with reflections on next steps, and specifically the need for further research that delves more deeply into loss and damage at the ocean climate nexus. Oops. There. We define loss and damage broadly as any impact arising from human induced climate change that is not avoided through a combination of mitigation and adaptation efforts. We further define loss as permanent or irrevocable, while damage is repairable or recoverable. The premise of the book is that despite some progress, this prospect for the emergence of a fair and equitable global response to loss and damage within the UN climate regime remains elusive. We asked our contributors to share ideas on how legal systems, whether domestic, regional, international, or transnational, are equipped to deal fairly and effectively with climate loss and damage claims. And if not, how they might evolve to support legitimate claims. In our conclusions, we argue that it is necessary for legal systems to evolve so as to fairly support loss and damage claims, both for their own legitimacy and to support the resilience of people and, and planet. From a legal perspective, we encouraged our contributors as appropriate to consider how to frame the loss and damage harm suffered, as well as who might be potential claimants, what remedies they might seek, who might be potential defendants and available resources, uh, available sources of funding. And finally, the various ways in which actionable wrongs might be framed. After our introductory chapter, we began the book with three foundational framing chapters that center multifaceted understandings of climate justice. And we believe these framings are central to our inquiry. First, while attention to equity in the form of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities underpins the UNFCCC regime as a whole, as Natalie Shalafour eloquently explains in her chapter, equity permeates all legal systems grappling with any meaningful consideration of loss and damage. Yet it is not a simple concept and requires active and deliberate engagement. She suggests in that, that in theorizing climate change as a justice issue, one's attention turns to its equitable dimensions. And fundamentally, climate change aggravates inequality as disadvantaged groups have greater exposure to its adverse effects, are more susceptible to climate-induced damage, and are less able to cope and recover from the damage suffered. Sally Floor explores intergenerational justice, systemic justice, and ecocentric justice perspectives, among others, with specific attention to gender, age, and socioeconomic status. Our next contributor, Carmen Gonzalez, describes climate change as one of the most pressing social issues of our time, as it is caused primarily by the world's most affluent populations and yet inflicts the deadliest consequences on vulnerable states and peoples who contributed the least to the problem. She draws attention to systemic practices of carbon capitalism, 
observing that while everyone is vulnerable to climate change, those who occupy the sacrifice zones of racial capitalism are particularly susceptible to harm. Racialization justifies and naturalizes violence and dispossession. Thus, those most susceptible to climate-related disasters and slow onset events are overwhelmingly persons classified as non-white who reside in geographic locations disproportionately exposed to hurricanes, floods, drought, desertification, and rising sea levels. They have been rendered socially and economically vulnerable to climate change by colonial and past colonial practices that have undermined climate resilience and created mass displacement. And Gonzalez argues that loss and damage should be understood to include the life cycle impacts of carbon capitalism on poor and racialized communities. And a just solution should take into account the need for reparation. Instead, she suggests that commodification of the problem and solutions within the climate regime exacerbate inequalities. And our third framing con contributor, Usha Natarajan, draws attention to assumptions about nature that underpin loss and damage under the climate regime. She's motivated by a concern that international lawyers have so far been unable to effectively tackle climate change due to disciplinary perceptions of nature that are destructive and exploitive. She proposes that there are four assumptions about nature that inform loss and damage, that it is identifiable, that it is calculable, that it is compensable, and that it is attributable, and two further assumptions about loss and damage and justice, that it may deter irresponsible behavior, and that it makes a much needed gesture towards fairness. Ultimately, she concludes that all six reduce nature to its commodification and exchange value, thus reproducing the discipline's harmful relationship with the natural environment. And she suggests that international law under the UNFCCC on climate loss and damage may have unintended consequences, including potentially exacerbating climate change, which should of course be of concern, including given the failure of international lawyers to address other environmental crises, such as biodiversity loss. In the next two chapters written by Linda Siegel, and offer an in-depth consideration of the evolution of loss and damage under the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement. While the idea of loss and damage has been around since the inception of climate negotiations, the Warsaw International Mechanism on Loss and Damage dates only from 1993, while Article 8 of the Paris Agreement recognizes for the first time the need not only to avert, minimize, and address loss and damage, but also to enhance understanding, action, and support for it, including through finance and technology transfer. Yet the COP decision adopting the Paris Agreement states clearly that Article 8 does not provide a basis for liability or compensation. Patricia Galveo Ferraro turns in the next chapter to the late and inequitable integration of finance into the UNFCCC while her second chapter explores innovative ideas on the potential evolution of climate finance, whether within or outside the climate regime. The next seven chapters explore climate loss and damage from the perspective of other sources of public international law. Christina Voigt considers the secondary law of state responsibility with reference to the primary rules from both the climate regime itself and customary international environmental law, including the do no harm principle and due diligence obligation. Simi Payne's chapter explores valuation of climate loss and damage, observing that while it is often the case that what is lost or damaged cannot be monetized in a meaningful way, valuation is important both for policy decisions to evaluate trade-offs and for direct compensation. She surveys domestic and international court approaches to valuing non-economic environmental harm, concluding that recognizing the limitations of existing approaches for loss and damage highlights the need to develop and choose alternatives that lead to a more resilient ecology and a more just society. The chapter by Sebastien Jodoin, Lotz and Parker on human rights-based approach to climate loss and damage identifies key principles, including participation, accountability, and transparency, non-discrimination and equality, empowerment of rights holders and legality. 
and they argue a rice-based approach would enable better climate loss and damage governance by providing an opportunity for those most vulnerable to climate harms to be heard for the assessment of non-economic loss and damage through a human rights impact assessment, um, and would also enable responsibility, remedy, and transnational justice. The authors argue that a rights approach is critical for loss and damage, offering a more transformative basis upon which to conceive the field. Kyle Powell's White's chapter on Indigenous people, climate loss and damage, and the responsibility of settler states explains how part of the vulnerability of Indigenous peoples to climate change arises as a result of the conditions under which communities live in many settler states, under economies that have been at odds with Indigenous values, cultures, and the resources upon which they depend. He distinguishes the concept of impending responsibility, that is climate impacts that are occurring or about to occur, and pending responsibility, a much broader view of the responsibility of settler states to indigenous populations. And he argues that understanding, acknowledging and acting on pending responsibility is critical to an equitable solution to climate adaptation and loss and damage. Samudu Adipati's chapter on climate displacement in international law highlights the slowness of the international community in taking up this issue, the challenge to fit the problem within refugee law and potential linkages with human rights approaches in the climate regime. Anastasia Telesetsky's chapter on disaster law and climate impacts brings to the fore the implications of failing to address mitigation and adaptation. She suggests that while disaster law can perhaps deliver some improved protections of property or an increase in survivors, its real contribution is to force decision makers to acknowledge fears of imminent loss and damage. Neil Kreck's contribution explores what we felt was an important but understudied relationship between carbon dioxide removal technologies and loss and damage. He notes a central debate concerning loss and damage is the degree to which losses will be addressed collectively on the basis of international solidarity or whether they'll be addressed individually on the basis of responsibility and liability. And he suggests that solar radiation management is a response me measure that collectively addresses losses through remedial action is consistent with the Paris Agreement's preference for collective approaches. But there are uncertainties, distributive consequences, and a need to pay attention to risk shifting away from states and private actors that may have responsibilities to address losses under a liability model to collective approaches such as solar radiation management. And equally important, of course, is recognizing the preferences of those most affected by losses and the hegemonic potential of these technologies. The third part of the book moves from public international law to domestic, transnational, and private international law approaches. And while there's much that could be said about each of these chapters, I will focus just on the first by Mary Wood, entitled Atmospheric Recovery Litigation Around the World, Gaining Natural Resource Damages Against Carbon Majors to Fund a Sky Cleanup for Climate Restoration. Wood notes the importance placed by scientists on drawing down and sequestering legacy carbon, in essence, a cleanup of the sky. And she presents this, what she describes as a meta strategy for jumpstarting such a drawdown effort across the globe by creating a funding mechanism achieved through atmospheric natural resource damage litigation. Techniques for drawdown include many natural climate solutions. And she suggests that deploying these projects could engage farmers, foresters, ranchers, indigenous communities, and others in restoration stimulating local economies, boosting community adaptation efforts um, through achieving co-benefits such as enhanced food supply, food flood mitigation, and water filtration. And the ecosystem restoration that lies at the heart of natural climate solution not only stands essential to climate system recovery, but also remains vital in responding to the global biodiversity crisis. She envisions lawsuits brought by sovereign trustees, states, tribes, counties, foreign nations against carbon majors to fund landscape and seascape, we would argue, carbon sequestration projects in their jurisdictions. And that this would be based on the model of cleaning up an oil spill. There are, as I've noted, many other innovative proposals in this section, 
um, tackling fundamental climate litigation challenges. Um, and uh, in short, this section confirms that there are principles in domestic legal systems that may hold promises, tools for ensuring appropriate remedies for loss and damage. Um, depending on the legal system, the principles may be adequate but they will often require progressive interpretations by judges or legislative adjustment to be truly effective. Um, there are cases underway that explore these principles and relate them to international law, um, and remedies can be uh, widespread, including funding efforts at climate restoration, rather than being limited to compensation for, for harm caused. I will very briefly... Um, uh, comment on our last two, two slides. First, just to note that I think this book um, has a lot to offer uh, this conference on the London Convention and Stockholm Declaration at, at 50. Um, my notes on the slide contemplate the continuing importance um, after 50 years of um, various principles, including do no harm and aspirations such as the need for effective liability and compensation. Um, and I also attempt to draw attention here to emerging intersections such as human rights and environment um, and solutions that address triple planetary crisis. And finally, in my, my last slide, um, I claim that my presentation would consider loss and damage at the ocean climate nexus. And of course, our uh, contributors do touch on the ocean climate nexus in passing. But I think much work remains to be done, and this was a task that I had hoped to undertake with my colleague Meinhard Dewell. Um, the notes on this slide suggest that while evidence of loss and damage at the climate ocean nexus for both people and planet is clear, uh, there are many legal regimes that may have much work to do to be ready for these kind of claims that are surely around the corner. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present this work, and I look forward to hearing from our commentators. Thank you very much. Two very interesting presentations. The first one um, focusing on technical measures in relation to CO2 sequestration, seabed uh, geological structures, as well as um, the responsibility for using the ocean in a sustainable way, focusing on ocean fertilization, marine geoengineering, and uh, second presentation focus concept of loss and damage and um, how to integrate this into international law to achieve more climate justice. I'm very happy that we have two commentators who are now able to um, put some perspectives on the two presentations. First one is uh, Christina Vogt from uh, the University of Oslo. If I can introduce the speaker briefly. Uh, professor Vogt is Professor of Law at the University of Oslo, Norway. She's an internationally renowned expert in international environmental law and teaches, speaks, and publishes widely on legal issues of climate change, environmental multilism, and sustainability. From 2009 to 2018, she worked as principal legal advisor for the government of Norway in the United Nations climate uh, change negotiations and negotiated the Paris Agreement and its rule book. Professor Vogt is uh, chair of the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law and co-chair of the Paris Agreement Implementation and Compliance Committee. She also is a mother of two young boys, Victor and Oscar. The second commentator is Mr. Sebastian Unger. He's the director for the Marine Environmental Protection, Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature Conservation, Nuclear Safety and Consumer Protection of Germany. Uh, he's the Ocean Commissioner of the German Federal Government and Director for the Marine Environmental Protection at the Federal Ministry. Previously, from 2011 to 2022, he led a research group on ocean governance at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam. In this role, he initiated numerous international research initiatives, lectured on ocean governance, and advised governments and international organizations on key marine policy processes for achieving ocean health. In 2007, he was appointed to be Deputy Secretary of the OSPA Commission 
for the protection of the marine environment of the Northeast Atlantic. In that role, he supported negotiations for new international legislation for marine conservation and environmental impacts of human activities, including the development of the world's first network of marine protected areas on the high seas. From 2004 to 2007, Sebastian Unger served as the, at the German Federal uh, Foreign Office, where he coordinated the ministry's work on international maritime affairs. He has an academic background in biology with political sciences. I suggest that we start uh, with Professor Folk first and then uh, continue with uh, Mr. Unger. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. Uh, thanks to the IMO and the WMU, and in particular to Professor Ronan Lang for this very kind um, invitation. I'm, I'm very glad to, to be here um, virtually, and, and I've uh, listened with great interest to the, to the previous speakers. Please let me also congratulate, uh, congratulate Sarah for her excellent book, and please, Sarah, accept my condolences for the passing away of our colleague, uh, Meinhardt. Now, I will focus not on carbon capture and storage and not on loss and damage, but to the stage before we actually do get to loss and damage. In my, in my brief intervention, I'll try to look into the legal framework that we currently have, both in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and the Paris Agreement, how they interact and address climate change and the protection of marine biodiversity in the oceans. Now, we do know that the atmosphere and the oceans are intrinsically, intrinsically interlinked. Climate change affects ocean biodiversity, it affects ecosystem, it affects um, migrating routes. We also know, and one of the previous speakers alluded to it, that the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere also leads to an increase of CO2 concentrations in the oceans, and that again leads to acidification. But last but not least, there are also wider implications of climate change effects on the oceans. The list is too long to, to mention, and it was very nicely captured in many of the chapters in Sarah and Minard's book. But for example, it affects spatial issues like maritime boundaries or shipping routes, uh, in addition to um, renewable energy installations or, or other installations in, um, in the oceans. But at the same time, we do know that the oceans are, but maybe not the lungs, but the, the, the gills of the earth. Um, they absorb and store massive amounts of CO2 including 30% of all anthropogenic uh, CO2 emissions, and those that are coming from human activities, and they absorb excess heat. More than 90% of the excess heat so far has been absorbed by the oceans. And these are data, these are numbers provided by the IPCC in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. But this fantastic capacity of the oceans to buffer against human impact comes at a price. And the price are changing uh, conditions of the ocean um, waters, but also changing um, um, uh, melting polar ice shields and changing in the composition of the ocean biosphere. Now I'll move over to the governance issues of the interrelationship between the instruments that we have to protect the oceans and the instruments that we have to protect the climate system. And when we talk about climate change, of course, our first uh, thought goes to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and goes to the Paris Agreement, and I'll go there. But before going there, I would like to say a couple of words about why also the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea is a very, potentially a very, um, uh, uh, important instrument to address climate change. Um, in particular, in Articles 192 and 194, we see obligations of members to protect the marine environment. Article 192 uh, states the obligation that parties have the obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment. And this includes a duty to protect against climate change impacts. There's nothing that says Otherwise, 
Article 194 contains the duty to adopt measures to prevent, reduce and control pollution from any source, both terrestrial sources, atmospheric sources and, and ocean based sources. And we also know that the, pollu the definition of pollution in Article 1, paragraph 1.4 uh, of UNCLOS is wide and potentially contains or includes anthropogene, uh, anthropogene uh, CO2. And the standard of care in these obligations is a uh, standard of due diligence which means that states' parties have to take all appropriate measures and exercise best possible efforts to prevent the um, uh, uh, pollution uh, of the marine environment. This was underlined by the uh, International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea in its 2015 advisory op opinion. So the big question here is how to interpret these provisions in the context of climate change that can be done, it should be done, it isn't yet being done, but we all know that UNCLOS is a living instrument which in its 40 years of existence has been living up to new uh, challenges that have uh, arisen in the context of the law of the sea. And in that interpretation, of course, also the Paris Agreement might play a role. We do know that the parties differ slightly between the Paris Agreement and UNCLOS, but it doesn't mean that the content of the Paris Agreement, especially its goals as contained in Article 2, are irrelevant to interpreting the legal obligations contained in Article 192 and 194 of um, UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. A bit of academic work has been done. Nilofer Oral, I think, spoke earlier uh, um, on this topic. There's a wonderful book coming out, edited by Ala Posnakova and Frauke Platuf with the title Environmental Rule of Law for Oceans. Well, so this um, issue is being addressed. Um, you may also know that there's an initiative by a number of small islands developing states they uh, established a commission on small island developing states on climate change and international law with almost the sole uh, purpose of seeking an advisory opinion by the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea on the interpretation of these provisions and perhaps other provisions in the context of climate change. So the, the law is moving, it is transparent, and it is, of course, something that is not static. And then my final remarks go, of course, to the Paris Agreement, which I already mentioned. And what does the Paris Agreement have to say about climate change? It is not that it's only concerned with um, a territorial approach to climate change. It notes the importance of sinks and reservoirs, including the oceans in the preamble, but also in its operative articles in Article 5, Paragraph 1, where parties are encouraged to take measures to conserve and enhance things referred to in the Framework Convention on Climate Change, and that includes oceans, coastal and marine ecosystems. And many parties have already included uh, ocean-based uh, measures in their nationally determined contributions, and you may know that there is um, expected um, update and progression uh, in these NDCs. And I uh, will almost expect that many parties will also include and enhance their ocean-based climate uh, measures. Um, we also do know, and Rina Lee spoke about it, that the BBNJ negotiations, which hopefully will be finalized early next year, consider oceans in the context uh, and climate change also in the context of uh, marine protected areas and the designation of such. The synergies are there. Uh, many more work has to be done on the governance interlinkages and especially the legal interlinkages in terms of interpreting the rules that we have, using them, implementing them in, um, in governance measures, but most and foremost uh, coherent policies. And I think, again, linking back to Sarah's book, many of the chapters there are a very valuable contribution to that international discourse. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And with this, I would like to hand over to Mr. Sebastian Unger for the second comment. 
Yes, thanks a lot. Uh, I hope you can can hear me. It's a it's a great honor, dear colleagues, for me to speak today at this very prestigious conference on the occasion of the London Convention and Stockholm Declaration's 50th anniversary. And I'm I'm really sad that I cannot join you in person um, as this conference also very nicely links uh, my previous roles being in research and ocean governance with my new role only since 1st of September I'm the newly appointed ocean commissioner of the German federal government. Following my previous speakers um, in my intervention I would like to reflect on some key political challenges and opportunities in global ocean governance and I will very much focus on climate and biodiversity in this. As we meet here, we all know that uh, Russia is waging an aggressive war against uh, the Ukraine and the world is faced with challenges for the economy and the energy security. At the same time, we need to tackle the urgent climate and biodiversity crisis. The world, I think it's fair to say, is struggling to address these often linked multiple crises simultaneously, but we cannot afford to go slow. The IPCC and the IPBES report that human activities have already altered nearly 90% of the ocean's surface. More species are also threatened with extinction in the ocean than at any other time in human history. In addition, climate change is having an increasingly negative effect on the biodiversity and resilience of marine ecosystems and their natural functions. The world's oceans are becoming warmer and more acidic. You all are very aware of that. But we depend on a healthy ocean. Healthy oceans are our allies in the climate crisis. There are important carbon sinks. They regulate the climate. And they have until now absorbed around 90% of the excess heat and about one third of the carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide that we produce. At the same time, adaptation measures must be implemented, especially along the coast, to combat, for example, rising sea levels. And many activities have multiple benefits. Measures like planting mangroves contribute to coastal protection, but at the same time also to protect the marine biodiversity and capturing greenhouse gases. Marine ecosystems such as Greek seagrass, bad salt marshes and algae forests as well as the sediment on the seabed also naturally sequester carbon. Degradation of these ecosystems, for example, through overuse or destructions can release additional greenhouse gas emissions. And we have to really take this into, into account in managing those areas. We are convinced that intact marine ecosystems can play a role in reducing greenhouse gases as a, as a nature-based solution. We will tap this natural potential. The German government's new national action plan for nature-based solutions for climate and biodiversity includes a development program specifically for marine ecosystems, such as those seagrass, seagrass bears, and salt marshes. These measures simultaneously protect biodiversity and protect the climate. And it's important that these efforts do not diminish with the pressure to reduce greenhouse gas emissions on land. That's, that's a given too. In a few weeks, we meet at COP27 under the UNFCCC in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt. And the importance of this event for the ocean can only be stressed. Germany intends to keep the momentum on climate change and ocean protection through the newly mandated annual dialogue on ocean and climate, and we will engage on how the informal report that this um, group has um, published on how to strengthen ocean-based action could be followed up by continued and enhanced actions within the UNFCCC. The follow-up should be a strong signal for other parties to enhance their mitigation and adaptation works, and we will continue capturing the orientations from this informal report to the annual dialogue in the overarching outcome from the COP27. As much as the ocean biodiversity and climate crisis can be tackled only together, and I mentioned this before, I would like to emphasize again the importance of a swift 
and ambitious finalization of the new legal instrument for marine biological diversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction, as we all know shortly BBNJ. And Rina has already reported earlier today about the important progress made at the last meeting at IGC5. However, we were not able to adopt this important agreement at this meeting because important questions still remain. We are advocating for continuing these negotiations as soon as possible. And we hope that an early start, um, an, an early continuation can be ensured, um, for example, in January, in January next, next year. The state of the global oceans is critical and the pressure on ecosystems from human activities such as overfishing and plastic pollution will continue to increase in the future. We therefore need a good and quick implementable agreement with which we can designate marine protected areas and make environmental assessments for human interventions in the high seas. The, de the designation of protected areas through BBNJ will also make an important contribution to at least protecting 30% of the global oceans by 2030, a goal that we all intend to adopt at the upcoming COP in December um, for the Convention on Biological Diversity in Montreal. In the context of high seas biodiversity, I also would like to stress our concern regarding the developments in the International Seabed Authority. And I very much say this also as a, as a governance researcher, thinking a lot about the way how systems, um, governance systems are linked and, and, and how we are able to overcome fragmentation in the current system. In the ongoing negotiations on the future mining code, we really um, are convinced that it's now the crucial time to prevent uncontrolled destruction of marine ecosystems in the deep sea. As there are still large gaps in knowledge in this field, the German government sees no basis for approving deep sea mining projects in the international seabed area. We will remain actively committed in the negotiations on regulations for possible deep seabed mining with a focus on achieving the highest possible environmental status, uh, highest environmental standards, sorry. In light of still ongoing BBNJ negotiations and the fragmentation of ocean governance in general, the application of the precautionary approach towards any deep sea mining activities in the high seas is, is even more essential. We need to avoid any rushed decisions with no clear scientific basis due to the current pressures on the International Seabed Authority. And we are quite happy that more and more major industrial players, such as, for example, big car makers like Tesla or BMW, but also Google, are now taking this line. Finally, please let me stress also the crucial importance, I mentioned this earlier before, of the um, CBD COP15, another major milestone of for the oceans later this year. This global, and I think the term nature summit is perhaps more appropriate, will be held in Montreal. And the major goal at this meeting is to finalize the post-2020 global biodiversity framework that will be applicable from 22 to 20, 2022 to 2030. This is a once decade opportunity to land an ambitious global deal for terrestrial and marine nature. The global biodiversity framework is not only necessary for the protection of biodiversity, both in land and the ocean, but also vital for the climate. There are three priorities for Germany that the global biodiversity framework needs to address. The, oblig the obligation to establish more and above all better managed protected areas, at least 30% of the marine areas should be placed under effective protection by 2030. That's the so-called 30 by 30 goal that you all are aware of. This would correspond to roughly increasing marine protected areas four times. So this is really a major challenge and we have to be very swift with implementing. 
The goal is also to end nature pollution. The second, that's the second major environmental crisis. The ONEA resolution for a global agreement against plastic waste this is an important step in this very direction, but we believe this is not enough. The obligation to restore nature, this is not, does not only help animals and plants, it also works against the third big environmental crisis that we're discussing, the climate crisis. And in Germany, we have just presented the Nature Climate Protection Action Program that I already mentioned, endowed with 4 billion euros until 2026. The idea is to strengthen also marine ecosystems so they, that they are really valuable habitats as well as, as carbon stores. In closing, let me again stress the importance of all these process of all these processes. They are offering a unique opportunity to accelerate progress and to put us on a path towards a healthy ocean. As we are approaching global tipping points, we cannot afford to miss these opportunities to transform the way how we are dealing with the ocean. Thank you very much, and I'm now really looking forward to hopefully a very engaging discussion with you. Thank you very much, Mr. Unger. Um, I think we have uh, four excellent presentations here. If I can try to, to put them in, in, in different perspectives, I believe that Professor Folk started earlier by focusing a little bit on the legal regime, uh, on the legal framework that, that exists in, in terms of uh, focusing specifically also on the effects of climate change, um, the role of, of the oceans absorbing CO2, and by highlighting there specifically also the, um, the role that UNCLOS or the Paris Agreement, for instance, are playing. And I think uh, the presentation that was done by um, Professor Zara Sek focuses on one specific aspect in this uh, relationship, which is when damage and, and losses occurring and uh, the consequences of climate change, so to say. Um, the um, comment from, from Sebastian Unger in this way basically continues to look more from a biological perspective on, on climate change, highlighting issues related to the effects in terms of the biodiversity and, and all the challenges that are related to this and uh, highlighting more or less the importance of mitigation adaptation measures. And I think this is where the presentation that started at the beginning also from Chris Vivian comes in where he's looking at uh, specific aspects in this respect, um, the CO2 sequestration as well as uh, also the, um, the um, the um, marine engineering and um, ge uh, in, in the um, ocean activities in this respect. So the role of guidelines uh, as well as um, um, good practice advice is, is highlighted there. And I think this brings us back also to the London Protocol and uh, the Stockholm Declaration. So with that, I would like to start um, discussions and questions and answers that may be um, here in the um, exactly in the auditorium and Chris if I can invite you to come over then I think we have um, a good starting point the three other panelists are online so the first question that I have is uh, anybody here in the auditorium who would like to add I think we have one question up there thank you very much um, I'd like to address my question to uh, our last speaker but let me thank all the speakers and the commentators for excellent interventions. Um, Mr. Unger, um, I have to introduce myself because I am a negotiator and delegate on the BBNJ, and you specifically called for as soon as possible, hopefully January, resumption of negotiations. Um, however, I, now I don't know if you saw the video from the final day of the last IGC5 session on August 26th, where a lot of the commentary from developing countries was specific that the process had been so rapidly advanced and that there were many questions of small developing states not being able to cover parallel sessions, let alone all the multiple working groups from which we still have not received the reporting. So 
if you could explain to me what is the advantage of having a IGC continuation early in January as soon as possible versus waiting till the normal August period. Because from a developing point of country point of view, the preparation time we need to coordinate and assemble all this information when we didn't have people in every room is critical. So I believe good process leads to good outcomes. And so I'd love to understand why you think it's so important to have it as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Yes, um, thanks for, for this really uh, good question and um, highlighting particularly this question of, of the process. And, and, um, and I'm, I'm personally, I've been really uh, engaged and involved as a, in various functions, both as a researcher, but also as a government representative in, in the BBNJ negotiations and preparatory processes that, um, as you, as I'm sure you, you know, are going on since over the, over 10 years or so. So it's quite, it's quite, quite a long process. And, and I think from that regard, your question is also very, very, um, uh, well, um, um, based, um, I'm, I'm, I'm personally, and also, also my, my, my government is really, um, of the opinion that we have to maintain momentum and we were really seeing that at, at IGC5, there has been really a tremendous progress, but but at the end, um, there was perhaps not enough time, and that might have been really just days from our, our perspective to, to to finalize some of these outstanding questions. I'm <laughs> I'm not so sure if sort of um sort of taking um taking a slower pace will will really help us to 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 solve those questions. Having said that, I'm I'm also really very much aware of the difficulties for many for many um, countries that do not have large delegations to to um, to really engage in these discussions and sometimes only the the representatives from from the um, permanent representat representations can can attend and that, that's a big challenge and that's why for example also Germany has really also uh, in the past invested for example through projects projects like the strong high seas project while we were working with um, countries both in um, Af in Africa and in Latin America to really help um, bring negotiators to um, the uh, meeting in, in New York and to really work with regional organizations, with regional processes to, to help um, forming positions on BBNJ. So, so we are really very much aware, we are really helping and trying to, to bring people uh, as much as uh, possible um, um, to to um, to these meetings, but but also believe that we need to maintain momentum, and that's that's really also looking at the at these tight um, uh, deadlines, and and when we look at 2030, when we look at what I mentioned earlier on the parallel um, process on deep seabed mining, we also believe that we cannot go slow on on this really key issue of of, of BBNJ. Questions from the audience here. Yeah, um, some questions. Thank you very much. I'm Mary Wise. I'm a professor here at uh, World Maritime University, and uh, I uh, have uh, enjoyed this discussion. And I, I'd like to ask the panelists uh, to comment on something I'm concerned about, and that's the uh, the protection of midwater communities. Uh, so midwater uh, environments such as the mesopelagic between around 200 to 1,000 meters below the surface, because they're, they can potentially be vulnerable to activities such as deep sea mining, uh, perhaps uh, also uh, a surface uh, activity such as return of of, uh, of 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 heated waters that are parts of mining practices and so on. Uh, so perhaps that falls under London Convention. I'm not sure, but uh, but it, th these these particular and en and environments are very important because they are their their biological activities uh, can help to uh, uh, to sequester and inject uh, carbon into deeper waters uh, and and 
and if it weren't for the biological activities of these communities, our atmospheric carbon levels are they've been estimated to be as high as almost 50% higher than they are today. So I'm curious about what about the these midwater communities? Thank you. Chris. Thank you. Yes, um, I'll speak a little bit about in relation to marine geoengineering. It certainly is a concern with a number of the techniques. Um, there are, in fact, one or two projects that are looking to try and um, utilize the mesopelagic, uh, particularly the, the dial movement of um, animals up and down by uh, fertilizing the uh, surface water to a greater extent to try and build up that uh, community and therefore sequester more carbon as to whether that will have uh, some uh, undesirable side effects is an open question still, but it is certainly a concern. And it's a concern for some other techniques, such as uh, there are some proposals to sink very large amounts of seaweed from the surface, uh, to kelp and the like, which will also have to sink through the Marisa Pelagic. Um, there are certainly some people who believe that that will happen so quickly that it may be fairly minimal because they think they could, they could, it'll sink in thousands of meters, a thousand meters a day in which case it probably should sink to the mesoplagic in a matter of a day or two, uh, in which case possibly there won't be a significant effect. But uh, effects on the mesoplagic are certainly a concern. They have been raised in the past because of ocean fertilization, where there's some uh, concerns that you will enhance the oxygen minimum zones uh, in those areas and therefore raise concerns there because you'll in probably increase the acidity through the degradation of the organic material. So yes, there are concerns of the, the mesoplagic uh, for from those uh, uh, types of techniques. Um, in terms of the deep sea mining, that's something clearly is the purview of the ISA. Um, but it's fair to say that the London Convention and protocol parties have had some discussions with the ISA about whether some of their experiences with dealing with waste materials might have some utility in helping them develop their guidelines. Uh, I don't think we've gone a long way with that yet, but uh, there's certainly some possibilities there. And there certainly will be concerns clearly in the midwater if you, for example, returned um, some of the water that's brought out from the seabed into the surface to midwater regions, as opposed to taking it all the way down to the seabed, which certainly one or two companies have proposed to take it all the way back to the seabed, which would be probably the ideal. Whether that would happen in all cases, I have no idea, but I suspect it's a, a good ambition to have at least. Thank you, Chris. I can see that um, all three uh, panelists online have also um, expressed that they would like to contribute to the discussion. So I think uh, Sarah was the first one who raised the hands. Uh, Professor Sack, please. Thank you very much. I just want to make a brief intervention, which is um, to, to comment on the importance of precautionary approaches, um, even as we are extremely concerned about climate change and need to respond to it. Uh, we see that there's a tendency um, for, as, as has always been the case, right, a tendency for new technologies and new ideas um, to be uh, a desire for them to be approved and permitted before uh, full studies have been taken into account, um, addressing both ecological and, and social dimensions. Um, and that's one of the real challenges, I think, with um, with the climate and biodiversity uh, uh, intersection um, and, and just with the situation we're in right now. And I think points to overall the importance of reducing emissions and not seeing new technologies and new solutions, even nature-based solutions, um, as ones that can be used to offset continuing emissions, but rather we must reduce now and do the studies that need to need take the time to do the studies that need to happen so that we don't inadvertently implement solutions that um, undermine uh, either what the particular objective is or interrelated problems such as such as biodiversity. So precautionary approach must be there all the time and 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 that's a, a difficult thing to keep in mind given the urgency of climate change as an example. Um, second speaker would be Professor Christina Vogt. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, briefly, on the last question on, on midwater communities. Well, we do know that increased impacts of climate change is also the increased uh, stratification of, of the oceans, the, the uh, and diminishing of mixing of water and water columns because of the changing composition of ocean water. So that, that sinking to the bottom is just not happening or it's happening slowlier due to the impacts of climate change, which would, should deeply worry, worry us. It comes in addition to acidification and other impacts. So that underlines the point that Sarah just made on the importance of reducing greenhouse gas emissions um, primarily and, and not replacing it or offsetting it with, with anything else because the impacts are significant and many of them are not quite well understood. Again, raising also the issue of, of being uh, precautionary. I also wanted to briefly address that first uh, uh, comment or question on the need to finalize the BB&J agreement and adopt it early next year. The IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law, which I chair, is very, very much engaged in the negotiations and we follow it very closely for many, many years. And I think, um, yes, uh, if you look at the final plenary, that there were, of course, uh, many issues, but the main setback was geopolitical. It, it didn't really was, was an issue that concerned the substance. I think it was very clear to many negotiators where the compromises would lie and the landing zone, and it was clearly carved out what, what the problems were. Uh, I think that may have been an issue previously that maybe smaller delegations weren't able to follow everything at the same time, and that's an issue across the whole field of, of international lawmaking. But when it comes to bb and and when it comes to that that last session, it was a, a geopolitical setback um, dealing with with things that are not necessarily related to to the substance. Um, and and I think um, given that the time constraints that were faced, then it, it should be uh, possible to overcome them uh, if if that is reconvened early next year. And the signal of this important agreement cannot be overestimated. It does deal with biodiversity protection in the high seas, we all know which elements are there. And I think coming in conjunction also with the new post-2020 global biodiversity framework under the CBD to which uh, Mr. Unger alluded to, is a very, very important signal to the world about the, the significance of protecting nature in, in addressing uh, global challenges and that it's taken, taken seriously. So I think it's rather important to, to draw this, this uh, new agreement under UNCLOS uh, on, on land, if I can use that metaphor, then, then, uh, then wait even longer. Thank you. Mr. Unger, would you like to add as well? Yes, just very briefly, um, I'm really very much in line with my, my previous um, speakers and, and I I, I also believe that um, for um, the whole discussion on on the um, uh, on the on deep seabed mining and and possible effects, we really have to have to highlight the importance of the of the precautionary principle of our approach and and um, we see this more in line and the stratification has been mentioned and we are starting to now better as a scientist better understand the the whole effects and and uh, also seeing risks um, uh, much more prominent than we have seen them in the past and and we are not able yet to really take them into account fully uh, in in our through our um governance instruments so that really really you have to understand when we when we embark on on, on any new activities uh, be it uh, deep seabed mining be it an, um, new types of fisheries and whatever in 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 those areas um and the, and the other question uh, other point i wanted to mention and saying this more as a as a governance researcher as as i said i only started here in first of september the the 10 years before i was 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 working as an academic and and one one topic I think what is very often I see this again also now more on, on the practical side what what is forgotten is really the the three dimensional scope of of the ocean and and when we when we look at at ocean governance we tend to think still in in a two dimensional way and we perhaps think about the surface and and the and the and the and the bottom but but the fragmentation of ocean governance in this three dimensional space is some something we haven't really captured yet and 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 that's something we have to be really also um be um yeah concerned about and take this into account when we when we talk about the mesopelagic um, systems 
Thank you very much. You want to add? Just like to come back quickly about the cautionary approach. I didn't mention it because I'm so used to the cautionary approach being an integral part of the London Protocol that it's just automatically, I just assume everyone knows that. But it is very much why the uh, London Protocol parties are taking the approach they are, because they know these things are out there potentially going to happen and they will be there with, if we don't do anything, they'll be all happening without any international guidance or regulation at all. And that's why the protocol parties are taking the action they have. So the precautionary approach is very much built into everything we do in the protocol. Thank you, Chris. Um, I would like to give the floor also to two um, online uh, questions which we received here. The first one is from Dina Kasmi. And um, the question or the comment here is, hello, I want to thank you all for your valuable interventions. How can we evaluate the damage caused to nature and determine who's responsible for it in order to be able to talk about nature restoration? Uh, I guess that is maybe a question to Sarah Sek to start with, um, but I'm sure that others may contribute to this as well. In, in the context of um, the Climate Loss and Damage book, uh, Simi Payne has provided an extensive chapter contemplating different ways of thinking about um, evaluation and restoration, drawing upon extensive uh, case lines in terms of how, how this might be done. Um, so I, I think the, the answer would, would be, or the answer that I would give simply would be that um, this is, is uh, it's not a new issue, it's an issue that is still being explored, but there are best practices that are emerging. And so, uh, and we will expect to see more litigation um, that attempts to grapple with this, whether this is in domestic courts or international courts or, or in other, other contexts. Um, and similarly, in terms of um, who is responsible so that we can talk about restoration, um, again, the book explores um, in a, and there are many, and, and since the book has been published, there have been even more um, climate litigation cases um, in which issues of attribution and causation and, and, and so on are, are explored um, at length and unfold at the moment in different ways in different courts ar around the world. Um, so I, I think the, the answer again would be that um, legal systems are being faced with these questions and are answering them at this point in different ways, depending on um, what the rules are within a particular uh, jurisdiction, but also that there's increasing um, engagement and communication across jurisdictions. And this is in part as a result of um, large and increasingly large numbers of um, activists and academics who are trying to think about answers to these questions, um, sharing lessons from different jurisdictions in, in best practice or um, emerging best practice um, studies. And so I think, um, I think there isn't a single answer to that question at, at this point, but the answers are, are coming. And, uh, and um, you know, we, we, I, I remain confident that we will figure this out on some level. Thank you. We have a second question here online, which is from Christina Gierde. Thank you for the very insightful presentations. For Ocean Twilight Zone, what role might EIA, um, SEAs under BBNG agreement play? Um, on BBNG timing, what plans are in place to ensure all delegates receive a full report on outcomes? Who's the right person to address that question? nobody <laughs> i think that would be arena <laughs> at, least for the, at least for the second second part of this question and i i'm i'm much more interested to hear what the panelists have to say but i but also through the research that we've been doing it's uh we're we're also very interested uh and see scope uh for the bbnj agreement to address uh uh, the protection of the mesopelagic through uh, environmental impact assessment and also strategic environmental assessment, marine spatial planning, uh, marine protected areas, and so on. But I'm, I'm much more interested to hear what the panelists might have to think, think about the scope for, for those two 
uh, emerge in upcoming parts of the uh, 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 BBNJ uh, agreement and going forward in the negotiations. Of course, we, we hope they'll be successful and we'll move fast, but, but I'm more curious what, what you have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Um, I understood that uh, Mr. Unger said that he would be happy to comment on the second part of the question about the timing, what plans are in place to ensure all delegates receive a full report on the outcomes? No? Nope. No, the other way around. I think that that's a particular question that I think Rina could actually best or the colleagues at Doalos could best report on. But um, just on, on the EIA and, and SEAs um, uh, briefly, I think that that's really one of the of the big opportunities that this new agreement really um, can offer. And, and um, we all um, are really aware of this fragmented system of ocean governance that we have set up through our, you know, history of, of, of um, development of, of, of the law of the sea. And, 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 and we really have to, to use this opportunity to try to make these linkages between different instruments with spatial um, applications, like for example, um, um, the BBNJ fisheries agreement and and and, and deep seabed mining come, coming up. So, so um, having um, EIAs that that are really uh, working across the board um, is really important. And uh, sort of the step even further is, um, and and that's also I think what Christina asked for is about the um, strategic environmental assessment. So really providing more a strategic and um, more type of planning planning outlook. And um, that's, of course, much more ambitious, but also um, an, a direction that that uh, would be um, really important for this uh, new agreement to 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 support. We know that, and that's I, I perhaps might lead a bit too far. That there's this internal tension between states between this point of uh, not undermining the the competence of existing institutions versus integration of 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 systems. And I think. Um, and an important uh, way for success and finalizing is, uh, this agreement is finding a good way um, through this this internal tension that is that is definitely there. If I might um, add, also in response to the environmental impact assessment question, um, I, I might. Late colleague Meinhard Dewell, of course, was an expert on environmental impact assessment, but a different project of ours um, involved looking at the relationship between human rights impact assessment, including responsible business conduct and business responsibilities for human rights and environmental um, assessment. Uh, there's There are so many different approaches to impact assessment, and some of them very clearly integrate the socio-ecological dimensions, whereas others focus very much on, on, the, um, on the biophysical dimensions. And so I just wanted to make a, a note of that on the table that, you know, sustainability assessments, socio there, there's so many different, different approaches. I don't know the extent to which any of this has been discussed in relation to BBNJ, um, but it seems to me that that is an important um, uh, an important aspect that that should be integrated into that and other initiatives very much so that we understand and, and explore the, the socio-ecological dimensions um, and the human rights, related human rights implications at each stage. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, I was given signs that the session is coming to an end. So I would like to thank all the panelists and of course the audience for the interesting question. And um, I guess the next step in the program is the coffee break. Thank you. Thank you and greetings to all. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, this is the last panel. I, uh, it's really, I'm uh, very delighted to be, uh, to be invited to by my colleague, uh, Ronan, to, to chair and moderate this uh, session which is focusing on future development of course uh, what we are celebrating today is something happened 50 years ago and between 50 years ago and now many things has happened and we all know that uh, you know the, um, the the human activity certainly is responsible for many of the changes of course the solutions will have to come from us as well and uh, just to take one example, I think in 2000, 
in 1972, the world economy was under $4 trillion. And today it's more than 90. So 25 times as big. Together with that, of course, a lot of positive development for human environment. We're talking about, uh, we're talking about Stockholm uh, Declaration. And at the same time, a lot of challenges, a lot of challenges. So we, uh, we have a di discussed these challenges over this last two days, and then now is the last session. And then we have to look into the future. Now, that is the, the whole uh, theme of this last eighth panel. I would like to invite our two panelists or two uh, speakers to come up and uh, join us in front. And uh, I think it's uh, Dr. Sovan Obren. Yes, please. And uh, Dr. Jung Hansen, please. We have also another speaker who is joining us online is uh, Dr. Todd Bridges. And he will be talking first, but he will be talking online. I'll introduce our comment, uh, commentators later uh, when it comes to the time for us to, uh, to discuss the topics. So uh, if I may just introduce to you our uh, three speakers for this session. The first speaker is uh, Dr. Bridges from, uh, who's a senior research scientist Senior Research Scientist for Environmental Science in the United Army Corp for Engineers. Dr. Bridges is the uh, U.S. Army and the U.S. Army Corp of Engineers, a Senior Research Scientist for Environmental Science. He has chaired international working groups and uh, in the IMO, and he has also really been active in publishing and uh, he published the more than 60 peer-reviewed journal articles, uh, several books and the book chapters. So uh, we will uh, uh, see his presentation online. And the second speaker we have is Assistant Professor, Dr. Alec Stoffen O'Brien, sitting in front of the room. He's, she's the Assistant Professor at the uh, uh, GOI Global Ocean Institute at WMU. Her research uh, includes the law of the sea, marine environmental protection, and sustainable ocean governance. Her work focuses in particular on plastic pollution and equity <coughs> questions in ocean governance. Okay. And then we have our third speaker, Dr. Johansson. Uh, Johansson, Dr. Johansson is also working at the World Maritime University at the GOI. And his duty at the GOI include ocean governance and the policy research. He is also involved in teaching and in developing innovative policy models to better assess <coughs> drivers and indicators relevant to ocean research agenda. So we have the three speakers, and then later on, we have the commentators uh, to, uh, to join us. One of the commentators uh, will not be able to join us today because of the uh, personal issues, but otherwise uh, we will uh, hopefully have a lovely session for this eighth panel. So without further ado, I will invite Dr. Bridges to give his uh, speech. <laughs> Okay, um, happy, to, happy to be here today to, to join you and to uh, make this presentation on innovating for a more resilient uh, future. Just want to make sure you can see the slides. Um, can somebody give me an indication. Yeah. 
Yes, we can see it. If you can just uh, play the slideshow. Okay. So innovating for a more <laughs> resilient future uh, using nature-based solutions in engineering with nature. Three years ago, I was traveling in Australia and with, with one of our executives on our organization, James Dalton, and as he took the podium to give the keynote address in Hobart, Tasmania, I received a text message from my wife informing me that our five-year-old granddaughter, Piper, was being wheeled into surgery uh, to have an urgent appendectomy. And I must admit, I had a lot of trouble concentrating on the proceedings during the meeting as my mind roamed over many topics, including the reasons I had to be confident in modern medical technology. And when you reflect upon the innovation that's occurred within medicine uh, over a very relatively short period of time within my lifetime, it's amazing, truly amazing. When you consider that uh, since the 1960s when heart surgery and heart transplant surgery was first performed and introduced, and that surgery and those procedures now almost routine in the modern era, it's fantastic to consider how technology and medical science has advanced to the benefit of humanity. But on the slide, I'm asking us to reflect upon over this same period of time, what would you put on the ledger as outstanding innovations, transformative innovations in the area of civil engineering or environmental management. My point of view is, is that the progress in innovation is not nearly as dramatic or transformational in these fields. And it makes one wonder why that's the case. Especially when you consider the urgencies, uh, the crisis that confronts us now in respect to the hazards uh, that range across the world. There are a whole range of hazards depicted on this slide. It's by no means a complete uh, uh, representation of those hazards, uh, but they range from uh, human-caused disasters, such as uh, industrial accidents, to so-called natural hazards, which are being exacerbated by climate change. If we consider just the climate and weather-related disasters, since 1980, in the United States of America, there have been 338 weather or climate disasters that have produced at least a billion dollars in economic damage. And if you consider the total damages for those 338 events, it's over $2 trillion in economic damage caused by weather. In addition to that, more than 15,000 people in the United States have died in those disaster events. So when we consider what climate change is doing to weather and climate and disaster, how do we address, how do we buy down or make investments that reduce this impact upon society? One of the key ways that we can do that um, is through investment in infrastructure. If you look at how we approached infrastructure investment in the 20th century, we used a lot of concrete and asphalt and rock and steel to build a tremendous amount of infrastructure. These, these data on this slide pertain just to the United States, but this pattern is, is worldwide. And it's a lot of infrastructure got built in 100 years during the 20th century. And we used a lot of these materials uh, to do that. And a paper published two years ago in the journal Nature uh, notes that we achieved a milestone on planet Earth in the year 2020 in which the amount of anthropogenic mass, that the amount of, of mass in the form of these infrastructure construction materials now exceeds the total living biomass on planet Earth. And that's what that graph 
the picks at more than one teraton. That's 10 to the 12th metric tons. And that curve, the doubling rate for anthropogenic mass and these in the form of these materials in the 20th century was 20 years. And the trajectory of this curve really challenges the notion of sustainability. Um, so when we consider the challenges in front of us now for the remainder of the 21st century, how are we going to address and make investments in infrastructure to address the challenges that confront us? This past spring, President Biden issued uh, an executive order in April, uh, and the, the section four of this executive order is titled Deploying Nature-Based Solutions to Tackle Climate Change and Enhance Resilience. And there are several elements within this executive order that I will not discuss here, but to say that the president has issued a directive to the federal government to find ways to accelerate the implementation of what we're calling here nature-based solutions to address climate change. Nature-based solutions uh, come in a variety of forms, and you can see a number of definitions uh, in the literature and, and in uh, international organizations. This is my shorthand definition. We're talking about conserving, restoring, or engineering nature for the benefit of people and nature. And as I indicated, they can serve a variety of purposes, including coastal storm risk management, an island wetland complex that's designed to attenuate storm surge, or the restoration of inland floodplains along river systems to provide space for water, or surface heat reduction through the creation of green space in urban environments, drought and wildfire resistance through a range of interventions, including restoring ecosystems to a more natural state. Water resilience, the use of wetlands to absorb excess nutrients and to recharge groundwater aquifers. And climate change mitigation, uh, restoring native grasslands and plant communities along coastlines to sequester carbon into soils. So nature-based solutions take a variety of forms. And Within the US Army Corps of Engineers, we have had a program, an initiative that we call Engineering with Nature, which we established in 2010, um, to develop the capability to deliver such solutions in the context of engineering. And this initiative has a variety of activities underway, including research and development uh, to full-scale implementation. And one example of the kind of work that's going on in the United States and around the world is illustrated here, that the use of mangroves to help address coastal storm risks. The state of Florida in the United States uh, has 500,000 acres of mangroves around it. And scientists back in 2020, you know, published a study documenting the benefits that that extensive network of mangroves is currently providing to the state of Florida. In fact, in the form of billions of dollars of avoided flood damages. So how can we uh, partner with nature to develop coastal storm risk management infrastructure that leverages and makes use of uh, investments in restoring systems like mangrove systems to reduce risks to people and property? The science of nature-based solutions is growing substantially in real time. And there are multiple lines of evidence that we can draw from to inform practice in using nature-based solutions, whether for flooding or for drought, including physical modeling. You can see one example of that here on this slide where physical representations of mangrove systems have been brought into our wave, one of our wave flumes and we can measure how these structures affect the orbital velocities of waves so that we can incorporate those factors into the design of infrastructure systems. Numerical modeling has advanced substantially in this regard. Studying of natural analogs, natural mangrove forests or wetlands or islands, scale demonstrations, a whole range of experience that we can draw from to support the science necessary to inform implementation of these approaches. We published international guidelines on the use of such approaches, natural and nature-based features for flood risk management. This is a thousand page technical guideline that 
drew experience from more than 70 organizations around the world and more than 170 authors and contributors. And we worked for five years together to assemble this thousand page technical guide, which you can download from our website. In fact, this document has been downloaded more than 6,000 times in the last 12 months. And we're looking forward to developing additional and supporting technical guidance on these kinds of strategies for both coastal as well as river systems. One uh, aspect that is particularly germane to the London Convention is the management of sediment. Sediment in the form of dredge material is by far the largest, if you will, waste category that is dumped in the oceans. How can we beneficially use the sediment that is dredged for a variety of reasons, including navigation infrastructure? How can we use that sediment beneficially? to support natural systems that we need to be able to adapt to climate change. We have a record of beneficial use within the Army Corps of Engineers. We beneficially use about 30% uh, currently, 30 to 40% of the dredge material that, that is produced in the United States annually. Um, and it can support a whole variety of uh, purposes, including climate change adaptation, as I've mentioned, producing habitat, as well as social value. But there are challenges to making more progress on beneficial use, including budget constraints and government policies and regulations, as well as the need to advance technology and to synchronize uh, a partnership between government and the private sector. One example of, of this beneficial use focus in San Francisco Bay and California, there are some great example projects of beneficially using large volumes of, of dredged sediment in San Francisco Bay. And there's an increasing interest in using these kinds of projects to develop climate resilience along the coastline of San Francisco Bay, which over the last hundred years has lost more than 90% of its uh, wetlands. Um, and I'm uh, traveling to California next week to speak to a group about how to make even further progress in beneficially using sediment in San Francisco. There are a whole range of ways in which we can adapt our engineering and operational practices around the world to keep more sediment within the natural system, reducing waste production and the need for dumping in the ocean. And these, I believe, uh, approaches and strategies are increasingly urgent for us as we cha are challenged by uh, climate change and the natural hazards uh, that are presented to us. I think really uh, there is an urgent call, a call for action, an imperative for the 21st century where we work together across the international community to achieve what might be considered by many an audacious goal of 100% beneficial use of dredge sediment. But in order to do that, it's gonna require something of everyone who, who touches this kind of process or has some connection to it. Innovation is going to be required. So government agencies like the Corps of Engineers that actually do dredging, we're gonna to have to figure out how to do business differently. Ports and the navigation sector are gonna to need to find ways in which they can accommodate so-called multi-purpose projects or multi-objective projects. Um, regulatory agencies are gonna need to way, find ways to efficiently pursue win-win opportunities. The dredging industry will need to find innovative engineering and operational practices. And environmental NGOs can perhaps help to facilitate uh, public-private partnerships. All of this um, also needs to give attention to the need for these kinds of approaches and for beneficial use to be affordable. And progress can only be made uh, by making these uh, projects affordable to all who contribute. Um, in order to make progress, we need to continue to invest in sparking productive conversation and thinking and, and new ideas. And we make a number of investments within the Engineering with Nature program, and you can learn more about these from the website, including our podcast series. And I've been travel blogging about this. We need to spark more conversation across the community on ways in which we can innovate together. Um, comprehensive resilience ultimately depends on many things. We need to build smart infrastructure. Our built assets need to be built in smarter ways. And people need to figure out how to work together more to develop such innovation. But we need to understand that all communities across the globe fundamentally 
foundationally reside on landscapes and ecosystems and nature. And we need to be able to support nature so that nature can support us. So with your indulgence, I'm just going to end with reading this paragraph from a paper that was published by the president of the Society of Laparoendoscopic Surgeons. Um, and he was reflecting upon the, the, the journey of, of, of change and innovation in surgery, including laparoscopic surgery. And uh, Dr. Kelly said this, the changes in surgical endoscopy leading up to 1988 were in fact gradual and evolutionary. For any major change or progress to take place, many factors must fall into place. In the case of laparoscopy, dramatic technical innovations were required. Additionally, there is a season for any change requiring a favorable and supportive philosophical environment. Authoritative institutions must be convinced of the safety and efficacy of the changes relative to the comfortable status quo. Momentum always favors inertia. Fears must be overcome, fear of making mistakes, fear of failure, fear of established procedures becoming obsolete, and fear of established authorities losing control. Successful change requires timing and a force more powerful than the status quo. The strongest force for sustainable change is a worthy goal. And with that, I'd like to conclude and I appreciate your attention. Peachy and Malmö, I just cycled down. And we also have a very successful WMU swimming team. So shout out to my ladies here. We are, we are very passionate at WMU. And I was swimming and just minding my swimming business. And what did I see? Something red. Anyone knows what this is? It's very difficult maybe for you guys up there to see. It is a little hat that is put on top of a certain, I call it beverage. Uh, well, I'm not saying, I don't wanna, yeah, okay. So someone said tequila, I didn't say it. Um, and it's placed on top of the bottle. And for me, this is actually the reason why I sh should continue with the work that I'm doing. Who needs a plastic hat on top of a bottle? It is actually a, quite a symbolic for silly goosies gadget that no one needs and that just waste our resources and pollute this beautiful Baltic Sea. So I put this here as a reminder why I'm doing this. So I'm talking today about the plastic treaty. I've been very fortunate enough that um, I've also been delegate to the preparation meetings so far. So I have a bit of an inside knowledge. I worked in the national government before. I worked in the European Commission and as well as the United Nations in a secretariat. So I always try to have idealistic and implementable ideas for a treaty. Uh, I will not come with crazy new ideas that are not implementable. Um, Anna, can you just bring it here? Anna, thank you. Oh, okay, turn it on. <laughs> Anna, this, um, she knows my talent for techno technology. Exactly. Um, Anna, it's possible that I can see it here. Thank you. So I'd like to frame today my talk with four hypotheses. I think it's always quite easy for students to understand what I'm trying to say if I Spell it, uh, spell it out. First of all, the plastic pollution is a reverse tragedy of the commons. And anybody here knows what the tragedy of the commons is? No? Well, we talk about fisheries, yes? Oh. Oh. Mm. Exactly. And that's when you take fish, uh, fish out, for example. And what we do with plastic pollution is the opposite. We throw things in and we continue and we continue. So it's a really also affecting our global commons. And interestingly enough, and I only realized when I prepared for this, IMO has been the absolute role model in adopting legally binding measures on plastic since the 1970s. Um, we have been seeing more and more instruments on the international, regional, national, um, uh, for us, but we still know that we have huge amounts of plastic still entering the sea. And we know that it's significantly increasing up to six to seven, eight in the uh, percent of what we're doing right now. So 
that's why, and there's an increasing idea that we are very harmed by this. We know that plastic is not only affecting the environment, it's very clear that plastic is in our bloodstreams, it's in breast milk, in the placenta, it is everywhere. So the, the, the reason of doubt and risk is beyond us. The precautionary principle is almost not applicable anymore because we have very certain knowledge that we are damaged by this issue. And that is why there are current um, yeah, plans to adopt an international uh, treaty on plastics and marinita. And I will talk today a bit about equity questions in this uh, treaty, potential treaty regime, and also about distribution of responsibilities. And I argue that because everyone is working on plastics, we have so many institutions and actors that it gets really blocked almost. It's paralyzing almost the amount of people that are working with it if you don't coordinate among each other. So this is just my, my framing of the... Am I still screen? And I'd like to frame my thoughts with a very clear understanding that the plastic demand will only significantly increase, particularly in African countries as well as in Asian countries. And the problem is not necessarily that we have more um, demand in plastic. The problem is that 8 to 20% of any plastic produced ends up in the ocean through um, fishery, fisheries, so banned and lost discarding fishing gear, shipping, land-based, atmospheric pollution. So we know that we have a huge issue if you just continue as we're doing it currently. That's very clear. And I would like to just always mention that what we are doing, we are not standing, we are not reinventing the wheel. We are standing on the shoulders of giants who have been working very hard to adopt different instruments. So I have here in red all of the IMO instruments, London Convention, London Protocol, MAPA Annex 5, that is um, the uh, annex um, dealing with garbage from, from ships. Then the Stockholm Declaration, IMO has a marine litter action plan, and you know, you have done an amazing work. It's like Frederick Hawk and the team is, is like a clone walking around in so many different meetings. I've seen Frederick in essentially every meeting that I'm going to, and uh, to be really integrating and to really coordinate with other actors. We have increasingly United Nations Environment Program working on it, the Convention on Biological Diversity. So we are, we are really diversifying the actors that are working in this field. And something that I think is quite interesting is that uh, in increasingly trade blocks have also been working on it. So we cannot say that we don't do anything about it. But yet we know that what we're doing is definitely not enough. It is evidence-based that, that approximately 7% of um, the plastic that's entering the ocean would be reduced if we would implement and comply with all of the different uh, legal instruments. Of course, it's modeled. I'm aware that this is not perfect, but it is a clear evidence that what we're doing is not enough. And that's why, uh, and the, the reason is arguably that the legal landscape, I'm sorry, I'm a lawyer, so you'll hear some more the word fragmentation, that we have a very fragmented international landscape and, the, and of, of instruments that are dealing with plastics. So UNCLOS, first of all, is almost the creation root cause of this, I would respectfully argue, because UNCLOS, even though it has a very broad pollution definition, has these sources of, of uh, pollution, land-based, dumping, shipping, and that creates a sort of fragmented system. And we have the IMO, which is responsible, of course, for dumping and shipping, United Nations Environment Program has a regional seas program. They have been quite active with, with action plans. We have instruments relating with chemicals and waste. We have biological diversity, the CBD, and the Fisheries and Agricultural Organization, and World Trade Agreements. So it's incredibly fragmented. And sometimes, or when I started with this research, uh, when I wrote my PhD on plastic pollution, it was very fragmented. There's the push to create and integrate a bit more but it's very difficult because of different mandates and everyone is pushing, saying, no, no, this is not part of our mandate. And it's clear that through research, we understand that part of the issue is also that we don't have a dialogue, a meaningful dialogue with industry. And I know in the BBNJ discussions, we had an agreement. So who should be engaged in any international um, instruments and treaty making? And I have to disagree a bit with Dr. Vasco, Professor Vasco, because I say the industry needs to be part of that from the beginning in a meaningful way. That cannot be, it cannot be state-driven, as well as the civil society organizations. 
we've been to Busan uh, two weeks ago. Uh, of course, you hear uncomfortable positions from the civil society, but we need to hear every single um, reflection and perspective to have a comprehensive regime, in my opinion. And that is why I was really uh, excited when I saw the preambular par paragraph seven of the Stockholm Declaration, which says that to achieve this environmental goal, we demand the acceptance of responsibility by citizens and communities and by enterprises and institutions at every level, all sharing equitably in common efforts, individuals in all walks of life, as well as organizations in many fields, by their values and the sum of the actions will shape the world environment of the future. And it's a, like Crystal Ambrose, one of our PhD student met her yesterday, said it's always a fine line between this depression and motivation. I was a bit upset that this text was 50 years ago and it, I could say it here and you wouldn't even be surprised that I'm saying this. And I totally agree with this statement that everyone has a role to play. We cannot just exclude people or organizations in all of our um, normative uh, lawmaking. And that is why we have now um, the preparation. We are, we are preparing to go to Uruguay in six weeks to uh, adopt an inter no, to start negotiations on an international plastic treaty. And something that is really remarkable, it is that these negotiations are hosted under the United Nations Environment Program, which was established under or after the Stockholm Declaration. And I have also outlined here the three countries where the preparatory work has been conducted. And I'm so proud to see not New York, no Copenhagen, no Geneva, but Kenya, Senegal, and Uruguay. It's really important to have the negotiations in other parts of the world to allow civil society and local communities to have maybe a shorter way to travel from Argentina, for example, to Uruguay. And I think working WMU has really made me aware of these kind of important location um, aspects. So we are meeting in six weeks for the first meeting of the International Negotiation Committee. It will be very much about procedural issues. What are we talking about? Are we talking about Merlita or plastic pollution? So it's gonna be really exciting. And I have now outlined three different aspects I'd like to highlight in the work that we're preparing now. First is actors. There's an incredibly strong focus for a multi-stakeholder dialogue that goes beyond the state-centric nature of international law. It goes really into the hearts of communities, industry, waste pickers as well. And I call it, and I know uh, that I might not be very popular, but I call them feel-good character of certain aspects, like equity, capacity building, and scientific needs. They are just thrown around as buzzwords at the moment. And because we are really not at all far what we want to do with this treaty, they're just used as a buzzword. Yes, we're gonna have capacity building. Yes, we're gonna think about scientific needs. So I'm really, really um, keen to further work and substantiate what do we mean by capacity building? And it was really enlightening to hear the discussions today. Then we need to uh, have a very strong focus with the coordination of uh, uh, sectoral actors, so shipping, fisheries, waste management. And I think that's Professor Kanahara talked about this horizontal regime is to include maybe non-traditional plastic institutions. And in my world, we don't ever talk to human rights people. We don't do this somehow, but we know that waste pickers are very important informal sector in a lot of G77 countries that need to be somehow integrated into a treaty regime. And something that will be definitely controversial coming up is that the plastic itself is not so dangerous but the chemicals contained therein. There are lots of uh, intellectual property rights associated with it, and we need to somehow find a way to have access to these kind of information if we want to effectively address plastic pollution. And world of climate change is incredibly, so this horizontal thinking, the fossil fuel industry is a, uh, and that is used for plastic is a huge driver for climate change. And I'm incredibly proud of the work of the uh, small island developing states in the in the negotiations preparations so far because small island developing states are incredibly central in the current mandate. They have just pushed really hard and said we are vulnerable, we need to have a place and there are several dedicated paragraphs in this um, UNEA resolution dedicated to developing um, states and small island developing states. We need to keep this up in my opinion. And funding is a central theme, I don't have to tell anyone. Uh, there have been already fights if there should be funding for waste management or only innovative plastic 
solution. So there is already a lot of uh, tension and um, there present, and I'm really excited that I listen to the BBNJ work because we need to learn from each other and not stand in isolation, in my opinion. Um, yes, and just to um, to conclude, the recommendation 41 says that new concepts of sovereignty based not on the surrender of national sovereignties, but on better means of exercising them collectively and with a greater sense of responsibility for the common good. And I really believe that we need to be thinking about the global, the common good, and not only our own national interests, in my opinion. And um, yeah, this is to conclude. I have a lot of other ideas. I work a lot on plastics. These are just my most recent publications. There are more coming. And I really um, thank you again for your attention. Thank you very much. The in, very interesting uh, uh, presentation. I think plastic is a very close to every one of us. I think that as she, uh, the message is very clear. Mm, just to, to solve this problem, it needs everybody's effort. We all have to be involved. And uh, I think this is a, a quite, quite uh, interesting. Otherwise, uh, you know, uh, uh, the situation can only uh, get worse and worse. Uh, as the is show you see the graph, you know, this is really uh, kind of a worrying. Now, thank you so much. That is a very, very good, interesting presentation. Now we come to the uh, third uh, speaker for uh, this uh, this afternoon's session, uh, Dr. Johansson. And uh, his topic is the reconnoitering, uh, reconnoitering uh, te techno regulatory dimensions of the human environment in maritime robotic, robotics and autonomous system. You have the floor. Last but not least. Uh, so the topic encapsulated in this title, Reconnoitering uh, Techno-Regulatory Dimensions of the Human Environment in Maritime Robotics and Autonomous Systems, it, I believe, to the best of my knowledge, touches upon a very timely initiative. Uh, derived from the European Union Horizon 2020 project uh, titled Bug Right 2, this presentation will touch upon a number of points, including the human environment, the environment, and the techno-regulatory environment. Um, and all from the context of uh, maritime robotics and autonomous systems. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we imagine a future where uh, teams of robots would be inspecting and cleaning the hull of a ship that is anchored and moored while loading its new cargo. And in that very future, uh, we believe that verifying ship structural soundness would cost minimal downtime, if any, leading to safer ships and improved competitiveness. And in short, robotic technologies uh, would seamlessly integrate into the current manual classification and statutory surveys um, that have been traditionally considered as dull, dirty, onerous, risky, dangerous, add as many objectives as you want. Um, so integration being the key word, and what are these technologies? Let me give you a visual. So, um, our journey begins with three specific technologies known as remote inspection techniques. Why is it called techniques? I'm not sure. Um, have to ask another professional, but so three specific techniques or technologies, uh, drones, magnetic crawlers, and remotely operated vehicles. I'm sure you've seen them or, or heard of, about them. Um, they operate in their own designated environment, air, steel surface, and underwater respectively. And as you can see in this third row, you, we use monitors to capture them in the visuals in real time uh, and trying to detect corrosion, buckling, cracking, significant deterioration uh, for maintenance purposes. Um, so the problem is, is rather big. I, I think you, you, you're all already familiar with the, with the word biofouling and what it entails. So the quickest formula is that 
biofouling is equal to increased water resistance, is equal to corrosion attacking steel, is equal to increased fuel energy power, is equal to increased air emission. Um, so this is pretty much uh, the story in short, but integration and the keyword maritime robotics and autonomous systems or remote inspection techniques, how do we integrate them? So to give you a quick insight, um, I have to firstly talk a little bit about the environment. So let's talk about the environment and the numbers. 53,793 is the total number of merchant ships. 9,734 is the total number of large vessels. 4,759 is the total number of very large vessels. And the 9,734 large vessels and 4,759 very large vessels are within the age range of 0 and 25. 0 0.5 millimeter is a thin layer of slime. If covered um, on, on the surface of a hull, has the potential to increase GHG emission in the range of 20 to 25%. And 50% is uh, increased amount of GHG emission if you have uh, a light layer of small calcareous growth on an average length container ship. Those are the numbers. In this discussion about environment, one thing that is very clear that the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea remains at the heart of all discussions. Safety at sea, pursuant to Article 94 uh, in, relation to, in relation to design, construction, and seaworthy ship, and Article uh, uh, and uh, envir Joint Environmental Protection, pursuant to Article 194, uh, are, are, are matters of uh, 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 great importance. Uh, so safety of life at sea and joint environmental protection, as we know today, requires a harmonized approach, and UNCLOS has, in a befitting manner, left that at the enabling hands of its member states. Harmonization is extremely important, um, and one could perceive that that is achievable through communication, collaboration, negotiation in international fora, uh, case in point, the International Maritime Organization. Uh, difficult task, but achievable. Uh, and this comes with reference to articles 197 and article 211. So this is where the environment ends, and that is where the techno-regulatory environment in relation to the topic at hand begins. So uh, regulation governing technology or techno-regulatory uh, governance makes its entrance with the Code for Recognized Organizations and the RO Code uh, allows organizations to publish rules and requirements with regards to uh, design, construction, or certifica uh, certification. Um, and in the maintenance regime, the RO organization, they also, uh, they, they are instruments that contain minimum criteria against which organizations are assessed towards recognition. So the IMO recognized organization, they have diametric personalities or, or uh, diametric features. So one is uh, the pri in their uh, private capacity where they facilitate uh, survey and inspection. So UNCLOS has by rule of reference um, kind of um, uh, created us, I'm looking for words, a synergistic uh, gateway of integration, right? And so it is through the rule of reference that acts as a conduit to talk about the work of popular international organizations, such as the International Organization for Standardization and the International Association of Classification Societies. Um, so this is the start of the techno-regulatory environment. But if we move for, uh, forward, we have the ISO standards that are considered as technical standards. And this is from a remote inspection technique perspective. Um, and, and then you have the regulatory standards developed by IX, what's the difference? ISO Technical Committee provides design specifications in relation to the uh, te technology at hand, and then in terms of why, where, when, how, and when to stop the remote inspection technology, you have the procedural requirements for IX. So combined, they are, or they comprise the techno-regulatory environment. Um, so The three elements, we, we, we talk about a lot of dimensions, the three important elements, just to give you a, a quick introduction here uh, for the next slide. We have actors, 
tools and mechanisms. Tools are pretty much the remote inspection techniques. Mechanisms is what promotes the regulatory objective. And then you have actors. Actors, a number of stakeholders come into play. Because in that techno-regulatory domain, there resides the human element. So you call it supervised autonomy, you can call it semi-autonomy, you can call it progressive autonomy, you can use human in the loop, borrow that from Mars. But it, the current system is not fully autonomous. Um, so to add credence to my claim, we uh, apply, I applied um, dynamic governance. The theory of dynamic governance, in short, is used by policymakers that seek to design regulatory structures for effective governance. Then I use a qualified methodology. The vertical axis of this matrix represents the familiar distinction between peer research predominantly taken from an academic constituency and uh, you have applied uh, research that uh, is used by professionals and practitioners. And then in the horizontal axis, you have the familiar distinction between doctrinal uh, and uh, you have uh, the interdisciplinary methods. So altogether, uh, so you apply dynamic governance, you apply methodology, and then you get the same conclusion. You get actors, mechanisms, and tools, and actors refer to the human element. You have supervisor, operator, and personnel. These are uh, a part of the report. It's available on our website or bugright2.eu. You can read the full uh, research report. So might be that the students pick up something from here. Here's hoping. Um, so I know my previous speakers have talked a little bit about drawing reference to their personal experience. So talking about autonomy, full autonomy, the closest I've come to autonomy is, is my grass cutting machine, the robot I have in my backyard. But unfortunately, it's been missing for two years. So I feel that I have to intervene. So human intervention is extremely important. Not that I plan on going to the garden and doing the gardening, but uh, maybe I buy a new one, but that is autonomous for you. You have a platform, you have a fixed platform, you have algorithms deciding everything, predetermination, and then it comes back. It should come back to its platform. If it doesn't, then there's a glitch in the system, right? So we have actors, tools, and mechanisms. Those are our external barriers. So um, in terms of actors, I'm referring to the Triple Helix University government and academia and business. And uh, this is where we require meaningful participation for the development of a common language program. The language isn't the same. Uh, we, ha we have tools uh, looking at um, the work that is currently being done by IMO member states, especially in relation to submissions uh, for a new guideline or a common methodology. And our research has brought us to a juncture where we believe that a top-down approach or a soft law or a guideline uh, would really uh, be beneficial to the industry. And then the single mechanism is synchronization. Synchronization, because I'm talking about technology synchronization between the global south and the global north, the bridge needs to be you know, taken away or the bridge needs to be made. What? So, but I, I'll leave that with you to decide. Uh, that will always be there, that difference, but we, we, we need to try uh, to harmonize and synchronize the current system because a lot of important work has gone into it. And this is all the unique provisions that you see. All, a lot of the classification societies have developed over time and the landscape is uneven. And that uneven landscape begs a number of questions, including how we can harmonize these various strands, starting with definition, remote inspection technique. It's not the same as remote survey, two very different things. One is using the technology, the other one is information and communication technology. Uh, close up survey, now you get a sensorial experience through the technology itself, which means definitions need to change. We are looking at a number of varieties, a lot of varieties um, are, 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 are coming in, into the market uh, and is it preserving the human element in its right way? Can we divide that according to the degree of autonomy uh, in a fashion similar to what has been done by uh, IMO's MOS uh, regulatory scoping exercise? Talking about safety, how safe is this, right? 
talking about data protection and data preservation, very important topic. And of course, liability, a very important issue. Robots are products. At the end of the day, there is no ontological ground to call them human being or any other entity, similar to what we what we call companies. Companies have a, have a fictitious personality. Robots can have a fictitious personality, but they're not able to do what we can do. Uh, then you have time. How quickly can they do the work? Otherwise, why take out the manual driven system in the first place? And all of this, all of the points above, they refer to a trustworthy ecosystem, which I'll talk about a little bit in the next slide. These are the internal barriers and combined internal barriers plus external barriers. It's a big hindrance uh, against future development. So when I talk about future development, I refer to five important strands, the human environment, the ecosystem synchronization, harmonization and partnership. And by human environment, I refer to environing technology, which means in short, that technology creates or helps create the environment we desire. You can agree or you can disagree, but this is a theory that, that, that we applied. And this is also germane to um, the Stockholm Declaration, paragraph one preamble, where uh, they talk about um, that man has the power to uh, create its own environment. Talking about ecosystem and trustworthy ecosystem. So we have human, we have environment. Is it a good marriage? Is it a bad marriage? Is there trust in that system? Uh, similar uh, uh, reflection is made in Stockholm Declaration in, in relation to environment of quality. Then synchronization, umbrella regulation, or do we need self-regulation? Because quite often self-regulation has the potential to maintain the status quo fragmentation um, and of course, coordinated uh, uh, if efforts uh, for, at the international organization level is also uh, something that is reflected uh, in the Stockholm Declaration. Harmonization, global north versus global south. I think we are aware that the Stockholm Declaration uh, in, in, in many places, it, it has explicit reference to developing countries. Uh, and finally, partnerships. So we, I talked about triple helix, but now moving forward, looking into how other organizations can play a role other than ISO and IX. Uh, we're moving to quintuple helix in this phase of our research. And of course, integrated and coordinated approach is, is a matter, is, 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 is an important critical uh, matter in, in, in the Stockholm Declaration. In conclusion, we are in a paradigm shift. Technology is there, maybe not fully autonomous. But if someone developed an autonomous drone and that struck someone or that injured someone, call it casualty, call it fatality, call it an incident, the judge cannot bend his arms and say that there are no rules on autonomy, on autonomous drones. I cannot adjudicate on this matter. You have to use what exists, what exists today. And robots, they, they need to be regulated. Uh, because at, again, at the end of the day, they are products. We need to try to identify the profound differences that differentiate different classes of information because uh, no two products are the same. But in the future, you never know. There are hybrid drones. I heard it goes underwater. Um, there will be uh, uh, remotely operated vehicles that go underwater and also collect debris. Uh, so we need to also try to see how these can be transferred to the global south. Uh, te technology know-how, technolo uh, technology availability, application of the technology, technological readiness, these need to be communicated. If we communicate anything, these need to go uh, in advance because we are just about to see the full potential of, of, of the, those byproducts and many more to come. And of course, these needs to also, when I talk about regulation, these needs to also adhere to IMO provisions. And, and uh, we, we should fully explore the capacities of emerging technologies. And those words are paraphrased pretty much and reflect uh, IMO strategic direction one and two. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Johansson. Uh, many people believe that uh, the solution or part of the solution uh, for the future is uh, technology. But uh, I think that uh, his presentation just showed us the, uh, the complexity aspect of this. It's not only a technical issue, it's certainly a regulatory issue, as he mentioned. It's very interesting. Thank you so much.
So we just uh, have three speakers finish the, their presentations. I would like to thank all of three, uh, thank them, and now you come to the discussion part. And um, I would like very much to invite our commentator, uh, Mr. Thomas Clannon, to come and join us, please. And uh, <clears throat> Mr. Clannon is the <clears throat> executive vice president for the Liberian Registry and uh, with a career of uh, over 30 years in Navy architect and the principal surveyor to um, managing director with extensive technical managerial and leadership experience. And he worked previously with, a, with the AP Muller Mask Shipyard and also with Lloyd's Register. So uh, with a lot of uh, shipping related experience. And uh, today uh, we have three uh, speakers talking uh, on the different topics all concerning the future development. Uh, for example, engineering with uh, nature and uh, issues on plastics and also techno uh, kind of a regulatory dimension of uh, really technologies like uh, robotics and autonomous systems. And I would like to uh, first uh, invite uh, Mr. Lanom to comment on those topics. If you can, please. Yeah, you can come over here. Thank you very much for the kind presentation, uh, introduction of me. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the World Maritime University, uh, Madam President and Professor Long for uh, inviting me as commentator to this great conference here. It's a real pleasure to be here and to be inspired by all the excellent presentations, all the comments and questions, and also by the enthusiastic uh, participation by the students. It's very much encouraging to see young people, you are so in, yeah, enthusiastic and uh, contributing to the future here. And then I would like to congratulate uh, each of the three speakers, uh, Dr. Bridges, uh, Dr. Stephen O'Brien and uh, Dr. Johansson for three excellent and insightful uh, presentations uh, on this panel with the future developments. And I will do it in reverse order. Um, First, I have a comment or an observation uh, to Mr. Johansson or Dr. Johansson's presentation. On slide three, you presented some very interesting numbers in respect to uh, underwater marine growth or biofouling uh, on ship's hull. And you mentioned there by removing a half millimeter biofouling would reduce the fuel consumption and greenhouse gas emission by 25%. Ship types, for example, you mentioned container ships with higher service speed compared to other ship types, they actually have the potential to um, reduce the emission by up to 55%. So in this context, one of the short-term measures in the, uh, that originated out of the IMO greenhouse gas emission reduction strategy that was adopted in 2018 by IMO, um, that will come in, and that will come into effect, effect 1st of January next year, that is the carbon intensity indicator the CII and the CII rating. So the CII rating, that is an operational measure that is mainly based on the distance traveled within a calendar year and then the corresponding fuel consumption. So therefore applying underwater magnetic crawlers, the example you illustrated, um, to regularly, uh, regularly clean the ship's underwater hull, that can actually contribute to improve the ship's um, performance by 25% um, and that will be, be a 
also a 25% reduction in the fuel consumption. So that could actually result in many ships improving their rating from a perhaps a D rating to a C rating that in turn that will result in full compliance with the CRI requirements. And also in addition to that with the 25% uh, cost reduction that gives a very good return on investment for the using the underwater magnetic crawler to clean the hull. So I'd like to illustrate this because that is a great example how new technologies that can offer a true win-win situation by contributing to environmental regulatory compliance and then at the same time reduce costs. Um, and furthermore, this example also reinforced the importance um, of the IMO 2022 World Maritime Day, the theme there, new technologies for a greener shipping. And then another comment that will lead to the first question to Dr. Johansson, that is on the uh, slide five and six, you uh, mentioned, IM, uh, you mentioned IMO, IACS, uh, and the recognized organization in respect of the relationship between classification and statutory services, uh, standards, regulations, and also in the context of uh, actors, tools, and mechanisms. So you have focused on the human element, and you rightly referred to supervisors, operators, surveyors. And looking back at your presentation, I was then thinking, um, you mean, what is the basis for dissecting rules and requirements promulgated by IAX? And the follow-up question will then be, how did you apply your findings in the human autonomy context? I'm sure many stakeholders will be interested to hear your um, insight into this. Right. Thank you so much for for um, the the setting the scene uh, in 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 a, in a manner better than I I did. Uh, so the first question I believe is uh, dissecting what was the basis for dissecting IX rules and requirements. So we go back a bit uh, the the terms common methodology that I also used in in during the presentation. So this is MSC one hundred four slash three slash fourteen. Page 12, paragraph three, where the Republic of Korea seeks for a common methodology um, for uh, remote survey, and they also acknowledge uh, remote inspection technique. So those documents are not available online, all these submissions. we It's very hard to reverse engineer or backtrack uh, how they did their research. So our objective was to create a regulatory blueprint and quite often to often academics such as myself want to throw in everything but the kitchen sink to quote my boss um so but i think what we try to do is base everything on a sound methodology and what we did was uh dissect every rule and requirement we can get our hands on label them as we went forward and these are the IX rules and requirements. Then we move to individual class society rules and requirements, dissected them, labeled them as we move forward. And then we compared uh, between the first set of rules and the second set of rules. And that's when you want to try, get an insight, a deeper insight into how they structure all these different uh, provisions, these requirements. So that is, that is the primary basis. Um, I, I, I think I will leave it at that. The human... The second question, please, um, is human. Yeah, I mean, that was a follow up question that, that how, how did you apply the, your findings in the human autonomy context? So, right, yes. So, the um, so last year uh, during COVID, uh, we conducted 60 interviews. Uh, with, I see five minutes, oh, uh, 60 interviews uh, with uh, stakeholders from China, uh, China, uh, Singapore, uh, US, she's helping me, she did a lot of the work, Singapore, US, Canada, Netherlands, and Norway, and we, 60 interviews were conducted, and uh, we, our idea, what we wanted to do is look at the acceptance level, why some societies and some uh, service suppliers prefer 
remote inspection techniques as opposed to others. And so we, our results were 18% confirmed with a strong yes that we like to use it or we will give it a try. 3% said nope. Uh, for 39% confirmed with a yes or no, and 40% confirmed with yes and no. So, and as we move forward with a regulatory blueprint, we try to make reference looking at how we can kind of strike a balance between the two, because at the end of the day, we're talking about environmental protection, creating a level playing field, and also doing that from a horizontal policy perspective. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Johansson, and for your insight into this. I had a few more questions for you, but I just got the message. We had four, five minutes left here, so I will move on to the um, Dr. Stoffen O'Brien. You, your presentation again, excellent presentation. And on your second slide, uh, it was mentioned here also the um, your state of the art hypothesis uh, as presented there, where that sort of revealed the reality, and especially the first statement on that second slide with the plastic pollution is a reversed uh, strategy of commons. So that was indeed very captive, uh, sort of interesting comments there. But then the, the question to you is, what are the best ways through which one can ensure collective and pragmatic actions from all stakeholders? I mean, collectively being that uh, key word. So maybe in other way, what are the key messages you want the audience here to take away? Thank you, that's, but you could write a PhD on this. Um, first of all, I think listening to everyone, when we were in Busan, there were a lot of conflicts um, between NGOs and industry, and it, it, we had some fierce discussions. And I think it's important to allow these discussion, actually. Some people were a bit afraid and were very nervous, but I think we need to lean in a bit and be open and acknowledge that we have different opinions along a broad spectrum. And what I would suggest, I know there are lots of master students here, if you're working on plastics, make sure you talk to your governments and share um, that uh, the things you learn here. So we had a master student last year that um, was Trisha, Trisha and I supervised, and she uh, looked into uh, Ghana and looked at abandoned losses garden fishing gear. And she didn't even look whether there is scientific information for Ghana on this topic because she assumed there was none. But guess what there was? So much research on plastic in Ghana. So the idea is that belief in the capacities in your countries, even though you think there is nothing, there is still evidence. And it most likely will be enough to really have a grounding in your national position towards this plastic treaty. So just believe in yourself and in your country. And there's a lot of different available information and access to data um, in the uh, International United Nations Environment Program. So just have access to that and always maybe consult and talk to people you do not talk to usually, like industry and different sectors. Excellent replies. Thanks for that advice. Um, I had a few more for you as well, but again, now it's one minute. So the so Dr. Bridges that is online here, uh, him, his presentation was also extremely interesting. Um, but I will try and cut this question short because he mentioned about uh, investment in infrastructure in this uh, 20th century, the century of infrastructure, nature-based solution to address climate change. So then the question is, for, navi for navigation sector, because he also mentioned port and navigation sector, multi-purpose projects. I mean, we're working hard on the sort of navigation side to decarbonize international shipping and environmental management. But how do you see the port infrastructure can support environmental management and especially with the focus on the interface with the navigation sector? So could you please provide your insight into this? Yes, uh, uh, thank you for the, the question. I think there are many ways, um, and perhaps the navigation sector has the greatest capacity, I believe, uh, to influence uh, climate adaptation because it reaches so far across our landscapes. For example, in the United States, we have a navigation channel network that's 25,000 miles long, um, where we dredge more than 200 million cubic meters of sediment every year. So that's a lot of shoreline along rivers and along coastlines um, where we need to uh, create 
resilience with respect to extreme floods um, as well as drought. So I, I think the navigation sector has one of the greatest potentials to influence on a landscape scale, uh, climate change adaptation by adapting its practices, being sustainable and using uh, the, the resources that it generates, including uh, sediment and beneficially using that to create and restore natural habitats that will create resilience for all communities. Thanks for the question. Thank you very much, uh, uh, our commentator. Now the floor is open and uh, let me see if there are questions. I think one over there. Okay, here also, uh, here also, okay. Please go ahead. Uh, my question goes to the, the last speaker. Okay. That Do spoke about speak? autonomous vessel. Mm -hmm. Uh, in an event, if a, a fully automated vessel that is sailing, if the system is compromised, maybe there is a glitch, a hack a hack into the system, what is the fate of that vessel? Then what can you do to rescue the vessel? Well, thank you for the question. My my presentation was on 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 the on technologies, not vessel per se. But there is only so little you can do. But what is it that you can do to prevent that situation? That that is where the focus should be. Looking at cybersecurity, IMO has a has a very uh, minutely done guidelines. There's always space for improvement, but. I think if it has been hacked, the only thing you can do is try to mitigate the impact, how you can control it, S send in those autonomous drones. <laughs> uh, if there are no autonomous drones, then this would actually fall in the lap laps of the Coast Guard and those authorities looking at what protocols they would maintain when it comes to piracy. Um, when there's an external force attacking the vessel, what protocol do you maintain there? Again, you remember I talked about existing, applying existing regulations. Autonomous vessels is way into the future. But I like your question. It's very Star Trek-y. Um, but I think prevention is better than cure. So uh, talk to the experts. But at the same time, I think there, there should be a good... This is a very exciting question. I, I need to communicate this to my PhD student. So... There you go. Thank you. Yeah, no, it is indeed a very good question, but uh, just to sort of give the IMO perspective on this, we have just completed a regulatory scoping exercise where with existing IMO instruments, we have identified the gaps. But also when we talk autonomy, we need to be very aware that there are different levels of autonomy in a vessel. And in IMO, we have four different levels of autonomy. So at the moment, we are now moving on to developing and uh, goal-based uh, standard code for mass shipping. And that will address all the four different levels of autonomy. And a goal-based mass code, that will also involve risk assessment. So as Dr. Johansson mentioned there, there will be risk mitigating measures in the case you, you talk about there with a vessel being hacked in unmanned vessel. But it is a very valid question and it is something that will be addressed, but that is work in progress in IMO at the moment. We have a question in the middle. Yes, that female student, I think. Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Uh, uh, I can say that I will leave this uh, this little program with a lot of knowledge. How do you <laughs> it's always ask what we learn? Uh, my question, my name is Artemisa from uh, Cabo Verde. I'm doing MSCA. My question is for Professor O'Brien. Um, Professor Teokaridi said that we look for this uh, event in the maritime governance and ocean governance perspective. Um, I have to say that, that I'm a little bit confused about something. I will try to be short. Um, you said that the preamble in the London Convention and London Protocol, the paragraph seven, it's still at all, or is you still see that uh, 
it's uh, useful in our days. You have the Marpol in Annex 5 that uh, trade all the pollution in all the, uh, the plastic and the marine litter. And you are created a new plastic treaty. So, or, or, or a new protocol. I don't know if I understand well, so you can explain this. So, uh, shouldn't we, the future has your all repeated focus in London Convention and the Marpol number five in the, say, our country to ratify this convention, make things work like it is here, and, and instead of each of us create a new other thing? Because uh, uh, in the in the in the beginning they said that the, it, we have a, a lack of knowledge, but in your presentation I saw that we have a lot of knowledge. So this is uh, my question. I'm sorry if I didn't understand the number this before, but uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. I'm loving this question. <laughs> I've been waiting for this. So that's normal that people and I agree that people are so sick of new treaties of new instruments. Why do we need it if the current system does not work? And I forgot to say that plastic is not everything, but we have a huge pressure and it's a really on vogue to work on plastics right now. We have a lot of money on it. And I would say that it might be a glimpse of hope to work towards plastic pollution. And that also includes working with IMO very, like I think Frederick and the team has to think really well how the new plastic treaty is thinking about the entire uh, logistic and supply chain, including the port reception facilities, MAPA Annex 5, and so forth. So I agree with you that we need to be very critical if we always shout for a new treaty. But if we do it well, and if we do it in a very integrated manner, we can really uh, create one more stepping stone to prevent this pollution. But of course, I am... Um, there are so many works still to be done with regard to port reception facilities around the world in relation to MAPA Annex 5 that deals with garbage from, from, from vessels. And I know that IMO has done incredible work, has teamed up with the Food and Agricultural Organization on this topic. So there's a lot of coordination going on already. And I am mindful of your work, uh, of your concerns. And Professor Theokaris is, is correct that we should not always call for that. But if it's done in the correct manner and we have coordination, we have funding in place and we have a practicable um, approach that supports countries rather than having two, maybe two ambitious goals that no one can ever reach, including developed countries, then that might be an important stone or the like puzzle piece in our environmental protection regime. But that would be also a great master thesis, I'm just saying. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I have a comment on the first presentation. Mm -hmm. um, okay. first name is Craig Vogt from the USA. Uh, Dr. Bridges, um, I must say that was an excellent presentation and very informative. Um, the uh, I got to say that you're doing very well with uh, moving forward and fairly rapidly with the concepts of engineering with nature and nature-based solutions. And I really, really like your goal, and I think we will achieve it one day, of 100% beneficial use to work toward resilient resiliency along our shorelines. Um, the key point, I think, that you came bottom line was affordability is the issue. Beneficial use, um, and sometimes working with nature, costs more. And the, my my question to you, my, could you comment on um, raising awareness um, and convincing communities and port authorities and others that you pay me now a little bit or pay me a lot more later due to storm damage? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the question, Craig. It's nice to hear your voice. It would be nice to see you too, <laughs> but I, you've, you've asked a very good question. I think that there is a twofold uh, response I would give. Uh, first is to not focus on costs, but to give more attention to benefits. And 
we we all have an opportunity, I think, in our various capacities to to do a better job at capturing the full array of benefits, economic, environmental, and social benefits that can be generated from nature-based solutions. And in particular, uh, for uh, beneficially using sediment to create those. And in fact, the Congress of the United States uh, just this year, uh, in the last year, gave specific direction to the Corps of Engineers to establish it, it, that establishes U.S. policy to, to require more explicit, more comprehensive consideration of benefits uh, uh, that can be produced from beneficial use as a part of our federal decision making. So that will definitely move it forward as well, because nobody wants to pay more for anything if they don't get anything in return. So we need to understand what the returns are. Back on the costs, um, I, I think there are, in fact, beneficial, many beneficial use options that will cost no more than current practice. And in case, and in fact, in many cases, if we'll just grant ourselves more flexibility and how we we do our business, could even cost less than traditional management practices for beneficial use. So I, I understand your point that in some cases it may cost more, but I don't uh, ascribe to the idea that it will always cost more. In fact, in some cases, and I can show show you examples where it actually costs less to beneficially use sediment than than a disposal operation would cost. Um, but but we but I think government across uh, infrastructure agencies and regulatory agencies we need to work together to figure out ways where we can be more efficient in decision making and more efficient with respect to operational flexibilities to give ourselves maneuvering room to create efficiencies. Um, and, and we also need to work with the private sector and with the port industry um, to find ways in which we can lower uh, the cost through advancing technology like, like those presented by um, the last speaker. I, if you look at the way dredging has been done for the last 150 years, <laughs> it pretty much looks the same. Um, great big ships that move around. Why can't we do dredging via Roomba? Um, the last speaker talked about mowing his grass with a with a robot. I, I see no reason why we can't have autonomous dredges uh, working uh, uh, in infrastructure and thereby reduce the costs and footprints of those practices. So that's a long, long answer to your question, Craig, but it was good to hear your voice. Thanks. More questions? A little bit more. Yeah, please. <clears throat> Uh, thank you to all the speakers for very thought-provoking and stimulating uh, presentations. Um, I was particularly struck with Dr. Johansson's um, uh, presentation on autonomous technology in the um, in the maritime domain, which is something that I, I knew very little about until until today. So I've certainly learned something today. Um, I, it 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 drew a lot of parallels with a, a process that I am involved in when I'm not working on law of the sea issues. Another area I'm involved in is um, is uh, disarmament, non proliferation, and international humanitarian law, and, and um, something that's very much been on the agenda um, at the UN in, in Geneva in, in recent years is uh, autonomous weapon systems, and. Um, uh, that there's been a group of government experts on the topic um, meeting over the last few years. Uh, the ICRC published a very a very good paper. Um, I think it was earlier this year, possibly last year. Um, and there are moves towards uh, regulation of of these of these technologies. And and it struck me that a lot of the issues that you mentioned are the same kind of things that we've been grappling with, uh, such as you know outlawing outright uh, dangerous technology, just inherently dangerous technology, um, uh, you know, trying to ensure some element of human control, um, traceability and, and accountability. Um, it was just, I was just wondering if that was a, a process you were familiar with and if there's anything we can we, we can learn from from that process by, by way of analogy, even if the context is is very different. No, you're absolutely bang on. So Yes, I, me and my team, we are aware um, about the context and 
how this evolved. Uh, so drones, I think pretty much they were deployed as military uh, weapons of, of whatever. Um, and in this was early 1960s. In the early 1980s, you can see a more soft approach using drones for surveillance. And here I am in 2022 talking about apl applying drones and, and uh, the likes in vessel survey and inspection. So yes, I think we've come very far and, and we've found ways to use them constructively. Ingenuity was the name of the drone that was deployed in uh, by the National Aeronautic Space Administration in 2020 uh, to do technological demonstration in Jezero Crater on Mars, right? But that is an environment that we cannot control. We, it's, we only know a, a little bit, so little. We're just beginning to explore and discover. But here on Earth, it's an environment that we can control, how best we can control and I, okay, let's not use the word control, delete that if you're machines. Uh, we, can, we can try to maneuver, we can, we can try to um, mold the environment. And, and of course, I'm again referring to this, the, the, the Stockholm Declaration, man is the creator of his own environment. But in that creation process, we, we are dealing with a product, a product that might have inherent vices, might have problems, and we, we will need to, like humanitarian perspective, maritime perspective, whatever perspective you bring in um, and, and, and table them, we, we will need to regulate them to a great extent. Why? Because there will be parties that are injured. There will be a lot of other complaints. There are a lot of liability issues. And the ship owner or whoever is the end user will require a form of safety net or protection. And of course, now we have the manufacturer using the economies of scale uh, for insurance purposes. So a lot of good things have, have, have happened over the last several years, but is it good regulation or is it bad regulation? I'll, I'll leave that question as a food for thought. Thank you. Thank you. We have time probably for one question, if there are any. Here on the floor, we have one minute, so I've been reminded. And uh, yeah, we just uh, try to keep in mind, we have one minute. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Islam Gad from Egypt, North Africa. Uh, my question is uh, for Dr. Uh, Stoffer O'Brien. You have mentioned in your presentation that within the next eight years, the demand on plastic on Africa and Middle East will be much more higher. Uh, while in Europe, for example, uh, the demand is, will, will remain the same. What are the instruments that we can apply in order, I mean, not to remain the same, but at least to reduce this uh, major difference? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and Europe it will stay pretty much the same because there are already circular economy uh, technology in place. So reusing the plastic and not throwing, not don't have a linear waste management. Uh, produce, use, and throw away, but to actually reuse it again. In Europe, we also have energy recovery. We burn our waste, which is another controversial topic that needs to be addressed. And I think that in the EU, we have reduction. We we have already reduction targets, and we have banned certain plastics. So I, I summarize: circular economy, circular economy approaches, ban on certain plastics, smarter production and maybe energy recovery, but I put brackets around it. So energy recovery is burning ways to get energy out of it. Yeah, okay. But you can have a long discussion on this. Thank you very much. Yes, we can have a longer discussion later. Now time is up. I would like to thank all our three speakers and one commentator for this uh, lovely session. And uh, I would like to thank those who have also put up their questions. It is uh, very, very interesting, thought provoking. And uh, so now uh, panel is finished and then I hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so we're very close to the end.
Oops. And I will very shortly invite the last uh, session to, um, sorry, the last, I was about this formal session, but the last session on, on content, um, on the people we need and the ocean we want, uh, women's empowerment. And then there will be a reporting session on the two days. And then lastly, we'll have closing remarks uh, of the day. I will hand over the floor to my colleagues, um, Maria Malia, Rodriguez Chavez, Ellen Johansson, and Renes Alma Joala to take on the next panel. Please, you can come to the floor and you'll drive the presentation for Maria Malia. You need the water. One second, I'll pull up Maria Malia. Perfect. Thank you very much, Elnes. And uh, well, good afternoon. Thank you for joining this almost last session. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, I'm Maria Maria Rodriguez, a postdoctoral researcher in the Empowering Women program. And I'll be sharing some uh, key aspects, which uh, jointly with my colleagues, Ellen and Renis over there, um, have identified in our respective uh, research projects. So maybe, um, I don't know if the presentation is, sh is shown. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Elnes. Uh, so maybe we can go to the next slide. There, thanks, uh, thanks a million. So uh, in this first slide, we, we wanted to share with uh, the audience the overall objective of, uh, of our women Empowering Women program, which is to propose a strategy and an action plan to help deliver equal uh, opportunities and full participation and leadership by women in ocean science and in science-dependent uh, governance systems. So as you will see, that program has two building blocks. The first strand focuses on the role of gender equality and the empowerment of women in the conduct of ocean science, and where Ellen and Renis have been uh, focusing their research projects, and they will share some key highlights in the next slides. And um, the project strand that I am focusing on it's the second one referring to gender equality in the regulatory and ocean science governance systems that coordinate, manage, and mediate ocean science. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide, please. Perfect, thank you. I'm sorry, and I, I forgot uh, to mention that, yeah, the lovely picture in the last slide was the, the team that uh, is part of the program and yeah, been a, a, a real pleasure to be working with such talented professionals. So on, as I was mentioning before, my research focuses, focuses in exploring gender equality and the role of women in governance bodies that mediate the delivery of ocean science into policy action. The scope of this project strand comprehends five intergovernmental organizations, including the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO, IOC, the, FA, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, the Joint Group of Experts of the Scientific Aspects of Marine Environmental Protection, GSAP, the Division of Ocean Affairs and Law of the Sea, DUALOS, and the International Seabed Authority. And we also have within this uh, group of organizations, non-governmental organizations, uh, specifically the International Union for Conservation uh, of Nature, IUCN, and the High Seas Alliance. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So at the starting point of, of data collection in this, my specific project strand, I, I was looking into some key topics within these uh, intergovernmental organizations and non-governmental organizations, uh, their structures and practices to identify if such uh, institutions had, for example, gender policies or strategies or action plans in place, if they had a designated focal point or capacity development programs supporting uh, women in ocean science, among other topics. However, uh, after a round of interviews, other uh, relevant items were included also to, to be considered uh, as part of the research, 
such as a uh, gender disaggregated data, uh, which are some good practices that uh, institutions have been doing, and also challenges and barriers, uh, which will we um, hear a bit more in detail from uh, Ellen and Rennie's uh, project, uh, research projects. And uh, if we go to the next slide, Oh, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> I forgot we have some uh, animations there. Uh, yeah, if we can go to the next slide. There, um, and, and I also wanted to highlight other critical elements that should be in place to ensure effective implementation of gender equality action lines, which are strong leadership within the organizations having minimum standards for gender, gender mainstreaming, for example, having statistical databases with sex disaggregated data, gender balance assessments, performance indicators, also to have dedicated time and allocated resources, it's very important, including funds for gender equality actions within projects or programs. Uh, likewise, having support structures or networks for women and uh, frequent trainings. And then if we go to the last slide, thank you, on next steps. Uh, so the three of us, we will uh, keep working on our research projects. The team is also doing uh, advocacy in multilateral processes, for example, in the BBNJ Treaty, and trying to get uh, some, well, it's there already, some uh, gender responsive language, for example, in the capacity building uh, chapter, and also having some considerations on gender balance in, in the confirmation of the capacity building committee, and also in the uh, scientific and technical body. And uh, we are developing, the strategy and action plan uh, that it's part of the objective of the program. And finally, uh, we're also um, raising awareness about the, the importance of joining the stakeholder uh, consultative forum. So you're more than welcome to, to join uh, the forum. And with this, I will pass the floor to uh, my colleague, uh, Renz. Thank you very much. can hear me yes yeah just shout if i'm not shouting <laughs> okay yeah i'm reni sauma ojuala and thank you for giving me this opportunity to share with you my phd findings preliminary finding is not everything so my title is on gender equality in ocean science for sustainable development analysis of ocean science institutions in kenya so um Okay, yeah. So the study was done in Kenya, and I'm glad to say today that uh, around 27 ocean science institutions participated in this study by providing gender ratios of their staff and also students for the universities. And the category of the institutions were uh, in four that is, the public universities, government agencies, NGOs, and IGOs. So starting with the universities, I just want to highlight why it is this need to collect gender ratios in uh, different institutions. Starting with the high, higher education, the enrollment of women were very low in all the seven uni eight universities that participated in this uh, study. As you can see, we only had 20, uh, 35 percent women in uh, BSc, and the number decreased even in MSc degree. And then looking at okay, looking at uh, the trends over ten years, that is before COVID nineteen, that from twenty ten to twenty nineteen, I notice actually there is a decline. There is no change in uh, enrollment of women, which means we need to. There was. Um, there was no records in this university to be able to keep track on whether they are doing better or not. So I really urge my universities back home that they should keep records, take daily records of the enrollment of staff and students and uh, to ensure that uh, we don't go backward. Instead, we should be moving forward. As you can see, 
women are very interested in this topic, ocean science in, uh, in general, although it is known or perceived to be a male domain. So I also looked at the staff representation that is academic staff in universities in the department that is offering ocean science uh, courses. And I noticed out of the seven universities that responded to me, uh, all women were representation was low, as you can see from this one. Uh, the one that with the red shows um, the red one is the only one that tried to uh, do better by having 40% women instead. Then looking further to the positions, academic, academic uh, career positions, I noticed the majority of women that were in those universities were actually non-tenured uh, uh, staff, that is support staff, um, part-time lecturers, and so on. And this is very uh, demeaning to women. We are under we are under utilizing their potential by giving them uh, types of jobs that actually don't add up to their um, qualifications. So we should do better. Then I did uh, uh, I did gender comparison uh, with other institutions, that is the government agencies, uh, NGOs, and IGOs. And uh, also noticed that uh, not only universities were not doing well, the other institutions were not also doing well, except the NGOs. So from, from the graph, you can see the one that is not, um, oh, sorry. It's not showing now, but the one that is not highlighted in red is the NGO performance and it had better representation compared to the rest of the organizations, which seem to be only complying to the um, constitution of Kenya, which says that uh, uh, the institutions should make sure that uh, the gender representations of the staff should not go beyond two thirds gender rule. And to my surprise, the two third gender rule is actually Two thirds is for men and a third is for women in all the institutions, as you can see highlighted there. And it seems that after the institutions reach the 30, whether the women are sweeping or they are in, I don't know which position, they don't care. And they just want to kick that box that women are actually 30%. And that is currently, has currently been um, uh, uh, seen in our current um, government, we just did election a uh, few months ago, and uh, the list for the CS is out. And out of the 21 uh, cabinet secretaries, uh, uh, seven of them are women. That means it's, it's the norm in my country and we need prayers, please. Um, so uh, good practice which I identified, okay, I only have five minutes, so I will summarize what I have. Good practices that I identified during my research. One was that women were actually in leadership position, but they were underrepresented. Some organizations were doing better. Yeah, that is the NGOs, as I said from the other time, uh, the, the previous uh, uh, slide, and also the IGOs were also doing better. They had more women in management positions, like directors and also managers. But when it comes to my government, it's different. The women were only 20% in university's chancellor position and also uh, only 20% in director positions in the seven government agencies that I sampled. Another good practice that I identified is that most universities had um, gender institutional gender policies, which is good. And you can see um, the percentage like uh, in red, the percentage, sorry, the percentages in red shows the gender ratios that were having some of the transformative provisions. Transformative provisions, I mean, gender specific um, provisions that are specific to women that we are going to do this to increase the participation of women, but still they were not uh, having the same balance 
or the same, um, whatever they talked about was not translating to the number of women that they had in these institutions. So they, it was a good practice. Yes, they had them, the good policies, but they were not functioning or they were maybe they were not implementing these policies. Why? Because most of them were gender neutral. They were just saying, oh, we will train the staff, not that we will train women and uh, women staff or so. So they were, they were just talking, but um, not specific to women, most of them, I mean. And most of them, like all of them, were outdated. The policies were indicated, were developed in 2010, yeah? And in the policy document, they outlined that uh, the policy should be reviewed after five years. But when I went, I found the policies are still in place, yeah? So they were not actually, meaning they were not actually evaluating whether their policies in, in place are working or not. So that was also um, something that should be looked at. So as I said, they were inconsistent. The policy, what the policy was saying was not translating to what they had in terms of numbers of students and in terms of numbers of staff, both in academic and both in um, higher level uh, positions. So way forward, there are so many things that should be done, but uh, just to mention a few, uh, we should need, we need to involve uh, women role models, especially to high school students so that they can understand what ocean science is actually is because myself, I found myself also in ocean science. I'm not a gender specialist, by the way. I'm actually advocating for women in science. I'm a woman in science, but doing gender. So we need to understand or to um, talk to the, the women or the upcoming scientists in high school so as to be able to understand what ocean science is so that they can be attracted to these ocean science related fields or maybe have mentorship programs that involve young women uh, so that they cannot, uh, I mean, change their uh, career again after doing the, the, like me, I did. <laughs> so also, also to urge my government and any other government that is uh, trying to see uh, gender, I mean, two thirds as the, the, the minor, my, I mean, women to be the minority in this two thirds gender rule so that we have both uh, maybe 50-50 if possible. And then force the existing uh, gender transformative policies that we have, we have to use affirmative action where we, the, there's completely no woman woman in, uh, in the position and have equitable uh, selection and uh, recruitment committee, because I believe when we have equal balance or equal chances, then there will be no bias. And lastly, to make sure that we collect data uh, to be able to know whether we are doing better or we are going backwards. Uh, just to leave you with two questions. One, how are you incorporating gender in your um, instruments that you've been talking about right now? Maybe that's why they are failing, and that's why you're continuing to. <laughs> that's why you are continuing to to record the threats, which are continue to every day. You continue saying, "Oh, the climate change, whatever." Maybe half of the population, which is, which is women, are left out. So please make sure that you include women in whatever you are doing. And the next thing is just you as a person. What are you doing to include or what are you doing to improve gender equality in your organization? Thank you. Thanks everyone. I'll try and blast through my slides real fast here now, but it's a real pleasure um, to have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the research that I'm doing. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at the World Maritime University, oh, you can hear me now, but I'm also um, the coordinating officer at the International Council for the Exploration, Exploration of the Sea, ICES, um, and that's also the focus of my research, um, which is called Understanding the Role of Gender in the Practice of International Marine Science. And when I talk about my research, I often show this slide, which shows pictures of the council meeting in 1904, 1948, uh, 1988, and 2018. And for those of you who are not familiar with ICES, we're an intergovernmental organization that coordinates marine science in the North Atlantic, 20 member countries, 150 expert groups, around 5,000 experts, and we're currently gender blind. 
we're working on um, putting the infrastructure in place to collect the gender disaggregated data that we need in a systematic best practice way so that people self-identify, but it'll take us a while to get there. So um, seeing this kind of lack of progress on diversity, um, especially visible types of diversity in our um, latest strategic plan from 2019 is the first time that you see this uh, language related to creating a diverse, inclusive, and gender balanced organization. It's this um, platform that allowed us to, to start uh, working on on this plan. So similar to the uh, information that you got from Renis about the value of collecting gender data, that's been really important and has been um, the focus of my work the last, especially in 2021. And what you see here in my pyramid is that the further up the organizational hierarchy you go, the fewer women that you find. So it's not, a, you have to collect gender disaggregated data, but also at different levels. And I want to, um, my message to also be that it's really important to not only collect um, quantitative data, but to also have qualitative data, because it's not just about how many women there are, but it's also about um, what's the culture of your organization. So we did a, a, a survey and we found that um, a third of respondents had um, witnessed or experienced gender-based harassment, things like subtle exclusions, not being heard, being left off of emails, even though you're the clear expert, um, unconscious bias and everyday sexism. Um, yeah, and I won't take you through the bottom pie charts there, but what they're really showing is how it is important also to count and to see where you may have bias in the system and to be able to change the policies and procedures. There we go, thank you. So based on all of this information, what I've been doing this last year is uh, developing the gender equality plan in um, co cooperation with all of the people in the um, in the organization. So a participatory process. Uh, and then we've created this plan, which is based on qualitative targets and quantitative indicators. Uh, I won't read through them, but I'll just come to the important part. What is really important to um, effectively implement a gender equality plan, uh, as you heard before as well, is that you need to commit resources. You need money, but you also need time. So it can't just be something that somebody does in the margin of their, of their work. You need dedicated people to do this. You need executive level commitment, but also community level engagement. <coughs> Otherwise, if you don't have a participatory process, um, this is, there's no buy-in from your community and, and that's what you really need. And we shouldn't aim for tokenism. We need not just women represented at different levels, but we want an inclusive working culture where everyone feels welcome to come um, to work. And this is really important, not just as a matter of social justice, but also for even better science. We need to have a whole lot of different perspectives represented in our, in our marine science. Thank you. First, thank you. The, the, the co-presenters of the reporting session to come in. So for the first day, this is Professor Clive Schofield and Dr. Rian Derry. Please, you have the floor. Well, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, students, friends, congratulations. You made it, almost, but not quite. We're not quite there, but we're almost there. We're on the, on the final straight now. The task I have in front of me is to, for Rian and myself, is to summarize day one uh, in approximately minus 10 minutes. Minus five minutes, very good, easy. Now, the president launched us on this voyage yesterday morning. My first observation is that, crikey, that feels a long time ago. I'm not going to do a, one, a scale of one to one and walk you through all of the panels. We had four panels, retrospective, science and technology, impacts uh, on international institutions and actors and regional approaches. I'm not going to mention all of our valued presenters and moderators and, and rapporteurs uh, and commentators. We very much value all of those inputs, but what I, we wanted to do was instead to try and pick out some commonalities, some key themes, 
uh, that came out of uh, those discussions, some cross-cutting themes, if you will. Uh, and I think the first word that, that struck us was that the word landmark, uh, a landmark um, uh, Stockholm Pro Proclamation, a landmark declaration, a land landmark convention. I think there's little argument about uh, the way in which these 50-year-old uh, institutions, if you will, are, are landmark in their way, but what also came through is that they're not static. There's evolutions over time. On the one hand, we have the, the Stockholm Declaration and the London Convention having predated, but to a certain extent inspired, subsequent uh, uh, developments which are of particular significance. The formation of UNEP, for example, was mentioned, uh, the drafting of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Another key theme that came out of yesterday was the degree to which these, uh, these two landmark instruments are complementary to uh, existing and subsequent uh, developments in international law and ocean governance particularly uh, and I think one of the one of the uh, comments that really struck me on day one uh, was uh, I think from one of our IMO colleagues uh, was uh, just get on and ratify I'd actually add to that get on and, on and ratify yes but get on and implement more uh, we need both uh, and that's an ongoing process. So ratification, implementation, but also monitoring was mentioned by multiple presenters, but also there was a critique within that that you can only monitor what, what is actually reported. And uh, whilst quite a, quite a lot of the, the presentations were reflecting on where we were where we are now and where we're going into the future. Um, but there were a couple of presentations which I think were appropriately critiquing where we are. Um, and I think one presentation in particular was gently critiquing in the sense that acknowledging the growth in scope of the London uh, Convention, but also uh, looking at it in a quite positive way about how the focus is around overcoming barriers to compliance. There is ambition and energy to improve. So I think we can, my, my glasses tends to be half full, um, uh, certainly later on in this evening, I hope. Um, but drawing this together from day one, I was particularly struck by the, the regional uh, session, session four. Uh, where we're looking at OSPAR and uh, the Sargasso Sea in particular. I, don't, I hate to highlight though that session over others, uh, but the way in which OSPAR was admitted to be a constant work in progress, there's no monopoly on knowledge or solutions, and that there's this conundrum that we're dealing with of long timescales, but an urgent crisis at one and the same time, and how to communicate that uh, to a wider community but also the example, the magnificent example from David Freestone of the Sargasso Sea Commission uh, as a collaborative agreement on steroids, which is where we perhaps need to be going next. And I will wrap it up at that point in time, but I know that Rian has a couple of insights that he'd like to share with you in 30 seconds. That was a fair distribution of no, time. I'm, yeah. I can do that. No, no, thank you very much. Yeah, exactly. No, no, it's great to have the chance to speak with you and to have spent these days with you. I've, I've learned a lot. Um, so, so like Clive said, one of the themes that came across to us very strongly yesterday was a refrain, especially from our friends at the IMO, that of the importance of ratification and of implementation. And at the same time in the discussion, as it played out, it became clear that um, one of the answers that is frequently proposed as an explanation for why we are not where we are in that regard, relates to capacity building. And I thought it was interesting that as our discussion played out further throughout the day, we got a sense that 
perhaps to really understand why certain states don't ratify and you know maybe don't implement to the extent that we would like some of these legal instruments, we end up looking at quite local stories. This was um, raised um, by Professor Lee in particular in a response to the floor. And I think a lot of our questions from, from students spoke to this point, that some of the reasons that these instruments perhaps um, are, not, are not ratified or implemented to the extent that we would like relate to contextually specific stories, perhaps often relating to economic forces. And I wonder whether at the end of yesterday, we might reflect that some of our discussion about capacity building um, might, might, might obscure some of those particular local factors. Um, and that if we were to examine them, in some cases, we might um, reach conclusions about far reaching changes that might need to take place in a particular context to achieve the aims we seek with these instruments, including social and economic changes, and no doubt some of those changes may be outside the specific scope of these legal instruments. But I think um, the discussion yesterday showed us the importance of not allowing them to idle outside the scope of our attention. I'll leave you with that reflection. Um, it's been a pleasure. And I will hand the floor to our... Uh, I think it's now uh, time to pass over to my good colleagues, um, uh, Eikert, Professor Eikert, and uh, Aspasia. Eikert, please. Okay, my, uh, minus 15, right? And us? Okay. A lot, a lot to say, okay, but I will do my best. First of all, before summarizing what we discussed in four panels of today, and of course, to a certain extent of also covering the day one, uh, actually my, yeah, let's say, broad takeaways from the two days discussion is very simple. It's not very much from, uh, it's not very much different from the, all the other things we discussed, like the carbonization of international shipping. It is complex, and this complexity can be managed uh, through a system approach in the form of a holistic approach. Uh, please don't get me wrong, but for the last two days, I, I saw a kind of a very single dimensional approach with more legal aspects. Technology was touched upon, human ele element was touched upon, but at the, at the end of the day, really all about the holistic and transdisciplinary approach to be able to address and to find solution to this London Convention, London Protocol and the Stockholm Declaration related challenges. By the way, I'm an able architect and credit goes to my colleague because she did all the work. Uh, I learned a lot in this respect. So it was for me as a kind of a fantastic lecture. So in this respect, very quickly. Yeah, this one. Okay, I will not read all these things. Definitely, it was highlighted that um, it was highlighted that the international regulatory landscape plays a key role in the jurisdiction and name the uh, power of states to prescribe and enforce the law. And the uh, liability regime is, is a big challenge we are facing today. And also we were discussed uh, the liability and responsibility with regards to the taxonomy. And there is a challenge and the issue with regards to low rates when it comes to the dumping. Uh, we also discussed about ship recycling, but we didn't touch upon much ship recycling relevance to the, the conference topic. But there is one, one takeaway for me. Uh, at the end of the day, many speakers or most of the speakers highlighted one aspect, a synergy uh, between the like regional approaches and then to extrap extrapolate this to London Convention and the protocol. But also, I can tell you that what we discuss in, uh, like, for example, maritime decarbonization, there are lots of takeaways from what we do, and then we can also translate into this, uh, what we discuss in this two days conference. Uh, capacity building panel six. Uh, again, I will not read all these things. Capacity building is important. Uh, educate uh, future generations is important. Uh, so BBNG uh, has four pillars, and also I really like the Fuad uh, presentation. He highlighted the importance of uh, private funding, which is also very important. But for me, 
I mean, I will highlight something very important this time for the audience, not for us. Basically, uh, you need to have a takeaway from this panel in a way that almost after each conference, WMU is always forgotten. So basically, WMU is an institution to build capacity uh, for the future maritime and ocean leaders. So basically, when you go back to your home countries, uh, you need to, uh, your takeaway should be the one you need to talk to your administration and the government to support us more uh, to, to, for us to educate more future maritime and ocean leaders. Uh, yeah, panel seven, uh, guess I'm doing is a great job. And guess I'm uh, working group 41 definitely advises uh, the parties of the London Protocol and the Convention. Uh, it was also highlighted that GESAMP is also looking to now ocean intervention for climate change. And also Dr. Sara uh, highlighted the, the, the need for the loss and damage, uh, loss and damage and its relation to the, uh, again, existing regulatory landscape. Dr. Aspasio also will continue, so I'm really uh, skim skimming through all these slides. Okay, the panel eight was very much uh, linked to my background. And Dr. Bridges highlighted nature or partnering, partnering with nature, uh, which is definitely something I appreciate. But in addition, what he said, and also nature mimic solution, we discuss in decarbonization, like uh, friction resistance related shark skin coating and so on and so forth. So that's why there are lots of solutions in the nature we have to learn. And then if possible, we have to mimic them to find solutions. My distinguished colleague Aleki highlighted uh, marine plastic. Yeah, but my, co my colleague continue, you know, just. So, I mean. <laughs> okay, and also my other distinguished colleague talk about the technology. Okay, one more thing, you know. The technology is key, technology and innovation key to find solution uh, for all the negative externalities we discussed today. But they didn't know today it needs to be supported by the human element, regulatory landscape, uh, society perception, and many other elements. So basically we have to really see it in a holistic manner. I'll give the floor to my colleague, Dr. Pa uh, Pastra. Thank you, I, I will try to be very fast. So, the way forward, we had to do some reflections about the future developments, and we did it in the form of questions. So, what's next? What about the absence of a liability regime? And what type of liability regime in dumping we want? What about the ship recycling regulation and the role of the flag state in relation to ship recycling? How we can improve monitoring and reporting for dumping? Can we achieve the target with 100% by 2030? how we will enable marine geoengineering and carbon capture technologies to operate in ways that do not put the health of the ocean at risk. Should the discharge of treaty water be in the agenda? We need formal legal position or a cooperative approach. How can we achieve more cooperation in achieving BBNJ agreement objectives through CBTMT? And how we can achieve CBTMT funding? What should be the role of the private sector and what about the legal system and involvement for loss and damage claims? How we can beneficially use the sentiment from dredge activity to support natural systems to allow for adaptation for climate change? How we achieve a multi-stakeholder approach in this plastic treaty, which is very important, and how we achieve harmonization in the maritime robotics and autonomy systems to add value to the safety of ships and life at sea. And I bombardize you with many questions, so things always become simpler with the diagram. And this is the building blocks that we can, all the experts can take them and think what is next, what is coming. And the recommendations, of course, we continue to have technical cooperation and assistance programs to assist with capacity building for waste assessment and management between the developed and developing states and in developing the national regulations to comply with and implement the London Protocol. We have the, to improve the obligatory requirements for reporting. There is a clear obligation to develop rules of liability and compensation come, coming out from the existing 
re regulations we have, IMO should continue to engage stakeholders in the development of an effective recycling regime. It's something that will take years, but we believe that IMO will have a successful outcome. Uh, we have to cooperate in achieving BBJ and J agreement objectives through CBTMT and take into account the role of the least developing countries and the funding, how the funding will be and what is the role of the private sector. That we need the designation of marine protected areas in the high seas under the BBNJ agreement. And we have to incorporate legal system of locks and damage into existing regulatory landscape. And there should be coherence between UNCLOS, Paris Agreement, London Convention within the context of the marine protection regime. Plastic, a very thorny issue, strong focus on the multi-stakeholder dialogue and coordination among all se sectoral actors. I like all the best, we wish you with the development of the treaty. And we have to achieve harmonization in the technical regulatory regime to add value to the safety of ship, life at sea, and human element parameters. And this is an element that here at WMU and the Ocean Institute, we try to have projects relevant to this harmonization. So as a conclusion, thanks to the London Convention and Protocol, it is a flexible regime and it's responsive to the new forms of dumping. And this is very evident from all the latest developments in marine geoengineering, carbon capture, uh, sewage sludge and plastics. And the London Convention regime would be the appropriate one under which a regime of liability should be created because it is global, flexible, and can accommodate new forms of dumping. And of course, capacity building and global cooperation, there is an urgent need to promote the protocol to address climate change, as we also underlined the day one. We need synergies and broader participation to improve the effectiveness. Thank you, all the speakers and all the participants. Thank you. Absolute uh, tour de force, uh, extraordinary uh, summary of the uh, highly technical and very incisive conference. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we just have to formally close the conference now. And uh, uh, the order of proceedings is as follows. Uh, uh, Madam President will make a, a closing address and um, there will be a reply from Director Dominguez. Madam President, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Renat. I must say that you are uh, real stalwarts. Well done. Thank you so much to see so many of you still here. Students, you make me proud. Distinguished moderators and speakers, faculty, staff, and students, audience who have been looking at us from afar and online. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank everyone, each and every one of you, and all of those who have been with us online, who have taken the time to be with us today in person, as well as virtually, and to witness this truly important event. With more than 500 participants online and in person, we have experienced presentations from 21 stalwart contributions who have bestowed us with many interdisciplinary and state-of-the-art insights, as well as interventions from 16 expert commentators and state-of-the-art insights, as well as interventions from 16 expert commentators in the course of the last two days. The World Maritime University has facilitated this conference 
and a significant number of participants, including our wonderful students and our, of course, staff, have attended what I would call a celebration. We have done so with our very best endeavors, hoping to accommodate our experts and incredible speakers from diverse backgrounds. I would like to thank all the participants who have come from far and wide. I would also like to thank the representatives, our friends from IMO, our mother institution, who have graced us with their very kind presence. And Mr. Dominguez, as the most senior person from the IMO here, we want to say thank you through you to all IMO staff. I believe that we had an excellent opportunity, an opportunity to engage on a range of issues that cut across all timely and topical matters that connect with the London Convention and the Stockholm Declaration. The presentations mirrored the extraordinary depth as well as the breadth with which the presenters covered a myriad, I would call it, a myriad of major issues with a sense of interconnectivity. We have also witnessed proactive discussions and engagements and how much of a vibrant and interactive audience we have had in the course of this timely conference. We now have to take all of the messages, all of the ideas, all of the suggestions, all of the incredible, I mean, outside of the toolbox, ideas that you have put on the table. We now have to take on these messages and all the conclusions that have been drawn and endeavor to sustain a healthy ocean for us and for future generations. I want to pay a special tribute to the Nippon Foundation, the city of Malmo and the Swedish government. Without their assistance, this university would not be able to continue. It would not be able to grow as we have grown and to be the institution that WMU is today. Our mother institution should be proud. Of course, without the generous participation of folks from across the globe, the conference would not have been complete. It gives us hope. Hope because this is an exciting time for all of us. The university has friends in all parts of the world. And I know we just, uh, as I was coming in, I saw that our Nippon Foundation support and supporters, important supporters, had just left. But I know that he needed to do other business at this time. But he was with us for most of the day. I am really pleased because of the momentum that has gathered from this two-day event. I believe that my colleagues have also arranged for a cultural excursion scheduled for tomorrow. Let's hope the weather is clement. So please do stay and enjoy. As the president of the university, I would like to table my heartfelt gratitude to all of you at this hour still there and that you have made this event an incredible success. Congratulations, well done. Let's give ourselves a big applause. A special thanks to our speakers, to our moderators, 
and to our commenters, commentators, as well as to all of those who joined us online. I wish to make a special mention of Mr. Senor Dominguez. And everybody knows him by now. Mr. Frederick Hag and Dr. Andrew. I don't quite sure I can pronounce his surname. Beach off. Did I do it? Good. At the office of the IMO in London, IMO headquarters, for the London Convention Protocol and Ocean Affairs. This was an entire university effort. And I want to thank, not just, I want to thank all of my colleagues, including those at the Ocean Institute who took the lead in this respect. Professor Long, let us give him, on behalf of all his staff, a round of applause. So as I said, this is an entire university effort, including our class of 2023. That's when they graduate. So don't worry about the 23 because they're going to be graduating in 2023. Those who are with us already now. And I wish to acknowledge, of course, our staff and our faculty members of the WMU Sazakawa Global Ocean Institute for all of the work in making this possible and the outcomes that we have achieved. Professor Roland Long is the director of the Institute. And I believe that this event has gained momentum thanks to your strategic leadership. Based on what I have witnessed over the last couple of days, I can assert that the World Maritime University, including our Global Ocean Institute, are building very important bridges across the globe. As a higher education institution, belonging to the IMO, our mother institution, I have to remind them all the time, that they are, we are their child and they have to be good parents who also help support their children. That we continue to support the United Nations, the IMO strategic directions through quality maritime and ocean education, research and capacity building, in support of the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and all its related goals. We all know that we are not alone, but we need all of you with us on this important journey. I want to make in my closing remarks, a very special mention to our organization team, to Maya. Where is our wow, splendid photographer? Can you come down? Let's, let's let them, everybody know who you are. Thank you. So you're going to wait there for the photo. Somebody else will have to take the photo. <laughs> So special mention to Maya, Elnaz, Linda, Flavia, Flora, Mercedes, Dorothy, and many others who helped you behind the scenes. I want to express my deep depth of gratitude for all of that work that you have been doing and for the success that this conference has been. Without you, it would not have been possible and without all of those who have come and our students who've been able to take advantage of this incredible opportunity to have had those few days where we have been able to talk about so many things. Ladies and gentlemen, until our paths cross again, I wish to say it is not an au revoir. It is not a goodbye. We hope to see you soon again for another such incredible conference. Stay safe and thank you for a good evening.
But before we do that, we need a big photo of everybody. Can you do that? Okay. Okay. I don't know about the rest, you see. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but would you be able to say something before we leave? I'm holding you back now. I'm sorry. And I'm not going to repeat everything that has been said already. Um, it's been an incredible two days. We learned many things. One of those that I'm not the fastest speaker here. Uh, that nobody really wants to win the Nobel Prize. And that when we talk about liability, some of the underlying issues, or things that we need to consider is that two of the panelists were also turning 50 this year. But in all seriousness, we have to thank the president of the university and Roland and the whole team for organizing this event, for being so hospitable. Even though it hasn't finished, you still have an event tomorrow. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to join you, but I hope that everybody does. Um, it's been a great event. You even put on here an example of negotiations of pv and j how two delegations cannot agree. But trust me, this is for the students. We always find way forward in the United Nations when we're actually discussing all these agreements. You have a lot of information of the things that can be done. And one of the best things that actually you provide with this is this opportunity to speak to the students. I hope that everybody had that chance because I did. And it's fantastic to hear how interested they are in learning what else they can do back at home when they return to their administrations. They're interested in deep sea mining, in some of the activities of the organization when it comes to exploration, gas and oil, oil spills, etc. So there is a lot that can be done. And not everything is negative. You've, you've heard that everything is, is, is quite fragmented, but the good thing is, uh, and I always look for a positive spin, is that it, the information is there. Some of the instruments are already there. We just need to find a way to put the puzzle together. But this is all thanks to this institution and to the, um, the Global Oceans Institute as well. Everything they do for the students under the tremendous leadership of Cleo um, and Ronan as well. And I hope that you can continue to support WMU the way that we look forward to continue to supporting many new issues, biofouling, noise, pollution, etc. We're going to need a lot more research and support at IMO when these topics continue to be developed. So I just want to say thank you to all of you. Thank you to the university. Thank you to the whole team because everybody has been absolutely fantastic. And I think that they are the ones that deserve a big round of applause.